Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello everyone, my name is Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the WordPress video course. This course is for anyone new to WordPress or who is self-taught on the product. Each category would make a good candidate for this course. No prior WordPress knowledge is needed. No prior web development or programming skills are required. This course is designed for non-technical users who are more interested in content management and search engine optimization than the technical aspects of website creation. The first module will spend some time introducing you to WordPress by understanding the common terms used and why you should choose WordPress. You'll learn about the WordPress family and about WordPress features. You'll also learn how to tap into online WordPress resources for further learning and how to stay updated with WordPress news. We'll also cover how to access the WordPress Codex, which is its official online manual for the software. We'll end the first module by learning how to get support from other users and how to use theme and plugin directories. We'll get started in WordPress in module two by getting and installing WordPress and move on to exploring the difference between wordpress.com and wordpress.org. We'll then learn how to navigate the dashboard panel, also known as WP-admin panel, and how to get a gravatar before building a website. In the third module, you learn about WordPress admin conventions and posting on your blog. We'll cover discussion on your blog and how to add and manage categories in this module. You should know that I do have files in the video description that we will be using during this course. So you may want to pause the video, download those files and put them in the same folder somewhere on your computer for easy access. Looking to support our channel and get a great deal? Become a member today to unlock ad-free videos. That's right, your favorite courses without a single ad. Interested in a specific video? Purchase one of our ad-free courses individually. Looking for even more? Gain access to exams, certificates, and exclusive content at learnitanytime.com. More information can be found in the video description below. So in this module, you will be introduced to WordPress via several lessons. The first of which is understanding the common terms that are used in the software. We'll then discuss why you should consider choosing WordPress and move on to getting to know the WordPress family. We'll continue by reviewing the rich feature set in WordPress before you'll learn how to access online WordPress resources for further learning. You'll also learn how to stay updated with WordPress news. And then we'll move on to understanding the codex and how to get support from other users. And then I'll show you how you would be using theme and plugin directories in the software. And we'll be hands-on in the software starting in module two. So the first thing we're gonna tackle is understanding the common terms used while you'll be working with WordPress. One of the major challenges of working with a new software is learning what things are called. If you have to ask a question about something, it would be helpful if you could reference it by its correct terms. So I've included this slide with a link to a Word document that's in the same directory. And so again, you'll have this for your future reference, but I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the document. There are a few developer terms in here as well, but, and I'm not gonna go over all of these definitions with you, I'll point out the things that I think are most pertinent right here. And that would be, the first one would be core. 
And that references WordPress's default features and functionality without any user customization. So WordPress out of the box is generally referenced as its core. The dashboard is also known as WP slash admin. It's the place you would go to when managing your site. And you'll see when we get in that along the top, you'll have a toolbar of quick options and you'll have a sidebar on the left that contains the different panels relating to your site's functionality. Domain name is important in this list. That's the address of your website on the internet. And you'll have to have a domain in order to get into WordPress. Um, depending on your hosting site, you can get a free domain for like a year. Hosting is the next one I'll cover. It's where your website is stored. So it's a high powered server stored in a, so in a safe location. Pages and posts. They both let you display content on your site. Pages are more permanent. And I just noticed the typo there, so I will fix that. And posts are transient. Pages don't change very much and are considered static. In contrast, posts, also known as articles, blogs, blog posts, are dated and archived for future reading but are designed to be replaced with similar yet fresher content on a regular basis. Permalinks, you'll hear them referred to as slugs. Those are the readable URL you'll navigate to on the web. WordPress lets you choose a number of different formats for permalinks, although it defaults to the post or page title. It's readable and is simple to remember for a visitor. Then we have plugins. Plugins handle the functionality of your site. So for example, there's a plugin called Really Simple SSL, which helps you transition to more secure site connections. And there's one called WordFence, and that's a top-notch security plugin. So the core, WordPress out of the box, does not really have much functionality. You add functionality to your site via plugins. SEO, you'll hear this term a lot, stands for search engine optimization. And it's the process of improving your website to increase visibility in Google, Microsoft Bing, and other search engines whenever people search for products you sell services you provide, or information on topics in which you have deep expertise and or experience. The better visibility your pages have in search results, the more likely you are to be found and clicked on. Ultimately, the goal of SEO is to help attract website visitors who will become customers, clients, or an audience that keeps coming back. So if you're watching this video, it's because you're either already using WordPress or you're interested in using WordPress. So let's discuss the reasons why people choose to use WordPress. It is free and it can be used to create any type of website. The software itself is free, but you do need a, dona a domain name and web hosting to install it. It is easy to use. It is completely customizable and out of the box, it is SEO friendly. There are plugins that can help with that as well. It is safe and secure and it is here to stay. And that's because it's open source software, which means it's not maintained by one person or company. So it's open source, it's not going anywhere it's really used widely across a multitude of audiences. When you hear about the WordPress family, it's referring to three different components of WordPress. So the family role head of household is occupied by the WordPress core, WordPress out of the box. 
The core of functionality has remained relatively unchanged with the exception of a new editor. There is one part that is continuously being updated on the core and that is security. The spouse role in a family is occupied by the theme you use in WordPress. Like any relationship, compatibility is a large factor in the success of the union. A theme controls the visual elements of your site, what layout you can use, and core parts of how your site can function as well. So the theme is the spouse. And then you have the children of the family. So I mentioned earlier that the WordPress core by itself does not have much functionality. A massive number of plugins can cover almost any functionality you are looking for. Plugins, therefore, are like the children. They need to be watched to make sure they don't misbehave and they don't always play well with one another. I guess the same could be said um, outside of the child age years. So the head of the household is the WordPress core. The spouse would be your theme, which controls the visual elements of your site. And the children would be the plugins. So let's get into some of the features in WordPress. I have a few slides just on the features here. So you have exchangeable designs using themes, the spouse. Um, you can extend functionality through plugins to children. You have access to unlimited posts and pages, categories and subcategories and tags. Responsive design, so it will work and read well and be accessible easily from mobile devices. Um, it is very flexible. It supports multiple types of websites from blogs to e-commerce. Um, it's scalable, which means it can handle any size of website. And it gives you the ability to post on your site via email and mobile devices. It's also in compliance with W3C standards, depending on the theme you're using. You can import data from other blogs and it's easy to administer in blog without any experience. In addition, WordPress has a convenient, fully functional built-in search feature. Um, it is multilingual with good internationalization, provides secure code, you have the ability to password protect content. You have comments manager and spam protection built in. What's really nice and lends to its ease of use is its built in workflow where it's simple. You write, you draft, review, and publish. You have intelligent text and content editing via a visual editor multi-user and multi-author support for user accounts, and a feature-rich media library for managing photos and other non-text content. It also has social media integration capabilities. As a matter of fact, later on in module five, um, in my must-have pack of plugins, there's one that can kind of fill that social media need for you. WordPress also provides you with dynamic and scalable revision functionality. So if you have to roll back changes, it's relatively easy to do in WordPress. You have built-in embed functionality through short codes. So it's compatible with YouTube, Vimeo, so on and so forth. Your admin panel is accessible via all modern devices, operating systems, and browsers. It has full accessibility for front end elements of the website, which is what your visitors see. User-friendly image editing, plus it has a drag and drop image importing feature. 
There's advanced SEO features available through plugins and themes. And it also has an integrated REST API infrastructure. So that's an interface that two computer systems use to exchange information securely over the internet. Very rich feature set at the core, but then also through plugins and themes, you can get more features and functionality. So at this point, we're going to go to different websites in reference to lessons five through eight. So I have a Word document named Useful Links in the files from the video descriptions, and it would be helpful if you open that document. Or if you've already opened a slideshow, you can just click like it is on my screen to view that Useful Links document. Either way, we want to go ahead and access it. So in module two, in the first lesson, we'll learn about the two different worlds of WordPress, which is the difference between WordPress.com and WordPress.org. But each of those entities has online WordPress resources, and they're listed there, learning more with online WordPress resources for module one, lesson five. The first one is a link to WordPress.org, and I'm going to go ahead and control click to follow that link. This learn.wordpress.org site, it gives you the ability. If you look, you can see you can learn WordPress, right? Whether you're seasoned or first timer, there's resources from community members all over the world that you will learn about on this site. You can search for a learning resource. And as you scroll down, you can browse tutorials. You can access lesson plans. There's recent courses and you have the ability to view all courses, right? And they range the gamut over everything. And then you can view all tutorials um, that are out here on the site as well. There are also always online workshops that are going on. So you have the ability to view all of them and join the ones that are of interest. And then if you want to get involved in creating the content for learning WordPress, you can learn how to contribute. And so it runs the gamut. It's an excellent resource for you to have at your fingertips. You might want to save this page to your favorites if you're going to be using it to extend your learning. By the way, you can also get news here. You can download themes, plugins, all kinds of things here. Under the Learn tab, we're on Learn WordPress, but you have documentation, there's forums, there's WordPress TV, and then you have a community there as well. So that is one of the sites. And the second one that we're going to look at is from wordpress.com. And so I'm back to my useful links document and I'm going to access that second link. So this is a, another site where you can experience more learning about WordPress, right? This one is the wordpress.com learn site. So it has over here getting the most from WordPress. And as you scroll down, you could go to, you could get help, right? Um, you can attend webinars, courses, and then you have a community where people share their knowledge on building um, websites. You can go by wordpress.com, browse those articles. And there is also a YouTube channel. And then down at the bottom under I need help with, you can get support documentation, support forums. You can get access to those. And if you'd like to upgrade your plans and stuff like that. So if you just scroll that site, it's organized a little bit differently. It offers similar content to the .org site. And across the top, 
you have products, you have features, right? And then there's a resources um, drop down that you can access to get support and news and things of that nature as well. So for future learning, you can either go to wordpress.org, wordpress.com. People use both. A lot of times in WordPress itself, you'll get splashes in there of news, but you can use either .org or .com to get news about WordPress. And I added a third link there. The WordPress Tavern is a community that has a lot of information as well. So I'm going to just go ahead and access the wordpress.org slash news link first. So you'll get a feel for what this looks like. So this is the same site we were on for learn, but it's on the news tab at the top, same site, just a different tab. So it's giving information about the latest release and you can see all releases, right? And so you get previews. You have this month in WordPress out there for February, 2023. So all kinds of news, it highlights different people, the people of WordPress. You can even subscribe to the news so you don't have to go to the site. If you put your email address in, you'll get the news automatically. And then there is also a podcast and it's historical, so you can go back and listen to all episodes. The second link there under module six takes you back to wordpress.com. And again, this one here, this is, you know, definitely the news site here, right? And what's new on wordpress.com. So they're giving you stuff about the sites a new home for wordpress.com courses, just information, um, some learning things, ideas, what's new on this site, various information. Um, it's like saying here are the new WordPress themes for January, 2023. You can get to all posts from this year as well from this site. Last but not least, we'll visit the WordPress Tavern site. And so this has a news tab at the top. You're on news, right? But the drop down opinion, plugins, themes, events. And so if I go down and I'm just like looking at recent posts, right? There's a post WordPress 6.2 RC1 was released and ready for testing, right? And so you can read that information. There's some advertisements on here or recommendations, right? Is a free WordPress block theme with 30 patterns, 30 plus patterns. WordPress engine pattern manager plugin is now in beta. So various news information related to the software. And this is called the WordPress Tavern. So out of these three sites, the .org is the one that you can subscribe so you can get the news delivered to your email. Now we're ready to access the WordPress Codex. The Codex is the official online manual for WordPress software. Um, it holds documentation, tips, and advice for users. So I'm going to go ahead and access that link. You might want to save that to your favorites on your browser so that you have instant access to it as well. Now this is also from wordpress.org, right? So 
what you need most need to know about WordPress. If you want to learn about the features, you can click here, installing it, the current version. You can get to news and support forums from here as well as troubleshooting and a glossary of terms. Um, they have a section, learn how to use WordPress, working with themes, writing a plugin. Um, if you want to write a plugin or you can just use the plugins that are already available to you. Um, you can contribute to the development or give back, um, which is about, you know, volunteerism. So this is the codex. I'm going to go back up to the top. Um, I can over here, go down and get to the lessons, getting started, all of the things, right? I can access the community portal under codex resources, current events, recent changes, and there is a help link. So I would really recommend that you just save this page to favorites at some point, um, as you may want to access it on and off throughout your WordPress journey. There is a host of information out there that is from other WordPress users that you can use to get support. And it's via the wordpress.com forum. So for lesson eight, that's what we're going to go to that link to get to the forums. You can search questions, keywords, and topics, right? It, you can add a new topic. There's a drop down. You're looking at all forums. There's an education community, translations, and support are your choices there. Um, we're looking at all topics. You have the ability to look at open topics with no replies, most popular topics. And there is a more drop down, non support topics, resolved topics, and unresolved topics. So you can filter your list here. Um, the, the first topic on the list, new to wordpress.com resources to get started. If you've just created your wordpress.com site and not sure where to start, here's a handy list of some resources that will help you with it. And I can click on that. And it takes me in to that topic, right? So it gives me all of these different links to getting to webinars, uh, courses, tips for using the full site editor, so on and so forth. It talks about other tutorials that are out there and there's a link to them and then video tutorials, um, about making money with your site blogging and getting started with WooCommerce there as well. Now, I can always here use what I call the bread from come trail to go back. So I'm back at my original list. There is the best practices and community standards post, so on and so forth. Sometimes when I can't figure out something, I'll come in here and be able to find someone that had the same issue and was able to figure it out. So I would suggest that you get plugged in to the forums. So just to give you a little bit of an inkling of the directory structure from within WordPress, and you'll see this in the next module, specifically theme and plugin directories. So there is a WP dash content directory, which has a themes folder in it. And inside that themes folder, you'll see all of the theme files in their separate folders. And then it does the same thing for plugin files. They're under a file, a folder called plugins. So these directories are stored on your web hosting server. And most of the WordPress hosting control panels allow access to file manager where you can see all of the different directories and gain access to the things that you have in WordPress. So just a little structure for you to understand that everything is stored on your web hosting server, but you'll have access to it typically 
from the hosting control panel. So in module one, you got an introduction to WordPress. We started by going over some common terms and there's a lot more that you'll run across. Um, we talked about the reasons why people choose WordPress. You got to know the WordPress family. The WordPress core is the head of the household. Themes are the spouse and plugins are the children. We reviewed many of the rich features of WordPress. And then we started learning, we started going into our common links file. So you can go to either wordpress.org or wordpress.com for additional learning resources to further your education in the application. You also learned how to stay updated with WordPress news. Um, you can subscribe to news from the .org link. We went into the WordPress codex, the codex, the official manual for the software. And you learned how to get to the forum so that you could get support from other users. We ended by talking about where things are stored and the directory structure. And when we get into the next module, and once you get into WordPress and everything, I'll show you how to access those directories. In module two, we'll be getting started with WordPress. Um, the first lesson, you'll learn the difference between wordpress.com and wordpress.org. And then we'll start getting and installing WordPress. And we will be installing through an auto installer script. You'll learn more about that and why that's going to happen in a bit. And then we're going to review what's known as the WP admin panel, commonly called the dashboard. And you'll get a comprehensive tour of WordPress interface so that you'll know how to navigate within it. And we'll end up by getting a Gravatar, you'll learn what that is. And as a part of that lesson, you'll learn about the user roles and capabilities in WordPress. There are two worlds to WordPress. There is wordpress.com and wordpress.org. Both are backed by the same people. There's a ton of collaboration between the two. They each cater to a different market segment. They each have their own personality, community, and culture. .com provides hosting and a platform in which to build your site using WordPress software. .org does not provide hosting, and it's not even a platform as it's often referred to. It is a website hub that houses information, downloads, resources, and a community. So again, we've been on both of these sites. They both have areas that overlap where you can learn more about WordPress, the software. They both have some sort of news about the application, but they're both backed by the same people and there's a ton of collaboration but wordpress.com is what you're using for your website. So let's go ahead and work on getting and installing WordPress. As mentioned, you need both web hosting and a domain name to use WordPress. There are a host of web hosting providers to choose from. The one I am using is Bluehost. It is officially recommended by wordpress.org and has an easy to use dashboard. So I do have a list of like 11 of the best WordPress hosting companies um, as of March, 2023 from themeisle.com that I'll bring up on the screen for you. And you'll see that it has the list of 11, right? Um, Bluehost is on the list. Hostinger is on the list. I've used both of those. I'm currently using Bluehost. Um, and it tells you the pricing, the uptime, load time, traffic rating. 
And then if I scroll down on the screen, it gives you the details for every hosting provider. So like I mentioned, I'm using um, Bluehost, but if you're using a different provider, that is fine. This is really your choice. I can't help you um, make it. You know, I can just tell you I'm currently using Bluehost. That's not an endorsement or anything like that. Um, you need to be comfortable with the choice you make. Although the installation instructions I'm going to give you are based off of Bluehost. Should be similar to any other hosting site. So if you want to use Bluehost, you can just go to bluehost.com. Um, it's also in the theme aisle article, a link to get to it. But you can go to bluehost.com if that is what you're going to choose for your web hosting. And then I'll walk you through the installation steps. And so on the bluehost.com webpage, you wanna click on the hosting and websites dropdown where my arrow is pointing. And you have the opportunity, I think there's three different types of hosting that are listed there. And I chose shared hosting. So if you choose shared hosting, the next screen you see will look like this and it actually says shared hosting on it, which is good for people like me. Sometimes I work so fast, I select the wrong thing. So this lets me know that I select the right type of hosting that I want, which is shared. And so when you click on get started, then you're gonna see your plan choices and select the plan, I'm bringing up the page now, select the plan that you want. So you have a 12 month tab at the top and then you have a 36 month tab. I'm gonna leave it on 12 months. But you have four different plans, Basic, Choice Plus, Online Store Pro. It gives you the pricing, um, lets you know what it's for, right? Um, for one blog or site. Choice Plus is for adding privacy and security features. Online store is great to start selling online and Pro gives you more power with optimized web resources. Um, they all let you know that they will auto renew at the regular rate. And then your hosting, and I believe you're charged annually for these. So, your hosting um, capabilities are listed underneath each plan, as well as website, security, marketing, and e-commerce, depending on the plan. So once you select your plan, then you're gonna have to address your domain. And so you can create a new domain or you can use one that you already own, or you can make one later, right? So if you're gonna create a new domain, you can put in what you'd like it to be called, um, what extension that you're using on it, .com, for example. Um, .com actually drives more SEO than any other dot. So just so you know that. Or if you use a domain that you own um, that's not currently being hosted, by Bluehost, um, it will walk you through the steps a little bit later in the process of how to transfer that domain from one hosting provider to this one. So once you set up your domain information on this screen, then you'll be filling out your personal information to create your account on the website. You can also sign in with Google to speed up the process. Next, you'll have to confirm your plan details. So you wanna be careful when you get to that screen. Bluehost has several premium add-ons by default, so make sure you go through them carefully and remove ones you don't need. And I believe that they vary which ones they have there as default ones, but they can include like domain privacy and protection, site lock security essentials, code guard basic, Bluehost SEO tools, that kind of thing. So 
If you don't want to include them, you need to exclude them by unchecking them. Otherwise they'll be included. And when you get to how much it's going to cost you, you're going to be like, what in the heck is going on? So this is the screen I'm talking about here. And you, this is just a screenshot from the internet. It's not mine. This is a screen and it, you notice it has that domain privacy code guard, basic and site lock security checked. So the total at the bottom is reflecting that information as well. You'll also be prompted for a phone number and email address to send your receipt to. It may recommend that you have it sent to an email that's not affiliated with your domain. Um, and you have the option of choosing the number of years you want the plan for, which you saw to 12 or 36 months. After confirming your choices, you'll be able to enter your payment information and process the transaction. And then you'll be able to log into Bluehost and you'll see that screenshot there. So, it, you know, depending on what you want to do when you get there, this is showing you logging in on the left, going to my sites, and then on the right, going to create site. When you create a site, you give it a name and a tagline, which is optional, or you can change it later, right? And then you'll do next. And then... Before you get to the WordPress installation, you'll have to choose your domain name. It might pop up automatically there since you chose it earlier. Otherwise, you just select it from that domain drop down. And then you will click next, which is not showing on the screen. And it will automatically start installing WordPress for you. And so you'll automatically, after it's done installing WordPress, you'll automatically get your brand new WordPress website along with login credentials, right? Which that information has been emailed to you. And then you could simply click on login to WordPress to get into WordPress. Now, if you chose another hosting provider, the process might be a little bit different, but each provider should be able to provide you with step-by-step -step installation instructions. Because we're using a hosting provider, it installed WordPress for us using an auto installer script. If you are self-hosting via a direct download of free WordPress software, you would have to go through the installation steps to install the software. And another thing, if you're already, if you're using an already established domain, normally the domain DNS takes zero to eight hours to propagate, and it's known to take up to 48 hours maximum to completely propagate. The propagation time varies depending on the geographic location. In the meantime, you will be assigned a temporary URL and some functionality will be limited. So your screen should look similar to mine if you logged into WordPress. Um, at the top of the screen, of course, you're seeing the hosting provider, Bluehost. And be above that, you see the WordPress interface. So along the top, we have some quick options on a toolbar and over on the left side, we have different panels that contain your site's functionality. And we'll go over those shortly. So earlier we talked a little bit about the directory structure where you could find, for example, your plugins and your themes. And your database, which contains all of the information from your site, is stored on your provider side, not in WordPress. So just to show you where to go to see your directory structure, at the top of your screen, you're in the white area. You're going to hover over Bluehost and you'll see that it says, go to your Bluehost control panel. And that's what we want to do. On the left side, you're seeing this is all Bluehost things. It is not anything to do with WordPress other than you can log into WordPress from here. So we're going to go on the left side, we're going to click on advanced. 
And I put a privacy blocker on the right side of my screen, but under advanced, you're going to select file manager, and that's where you'll see your directory structure. It stores all of your website info in the public HTML folder. So I'm going to expand that folder and then it's stored in the WP dash content subfolder. And you can see that you have plugins, themes, uploads. So by default, you know, out of the box, the core comes with some themes and we can do the plus sign in front of themes and each theme has its own folder. So if we expand, say the Sinatra folder, you'll see a different bunch of subfolders, one of which is template parts. And when you expand that, you'll see that it has different folders for the content, the entry, footer, header, so on and so forth for templates. So these are core themes that are in there and they're based on templates and those are the different parts of the templates. And I'm gonna collapse the themes folder and expand the plugins folder. And these are all the plugins that come out of the box with WordPress core. So we'll be revisiting plugins in detail when we get to module five, but I just wanted to let you know, since I referenced it earlier, that it's from your hosting provider that your website information is stored. It's not stored in WordPress. To get back to WordPress from here, um, I have my address bar hidden. So I'm gonna just hover over here and you can see that it opened this in new windows. So I'm gonna close both of those C panel tabs And I have the blue host portal tab there and you can log back into WordPress if it didn't keep you logged in. Now, in my case, it did keep me logged in, but just wanted to show you how to get out of there. So you can um, make your way back to your WordPress site. And we're going to take a tour of the WordPress interface. And I'm going to start at the top with the quick options bar that runs along the very top of the screen. And the first thing you'll see up there is the WordPress logo. And when you hover over that, it gives you information about WordPress. You can get to wordpress.org from there, documentation, support, and offer feedback. The next icon is the house and it says the name of your site. And when you hover over that, you can actually visit your site, which we haven't built yet. This next icon is indicating that there are some kind of updates available and I'm gonna click on it, it has a one next to it. And so, yeah, it's taking me to WordPress updates. Now, some of these um, pop-ups kind of take up space. So anything that I don't need, I'm gonna use the X to its right to close. If there's anything that has an X, you can go ahead and close it. So these are WordPress updates, right? you have several different plugins that come with WordPress core. And this message, please set up website analytics to see audience insights is based on monster insights plugin. So it comes out of the core, but it needs to be set up. It says your site is currently displaying a coming soon page because we haven't built anything and you'll learn how to launch your site a little bit later. It gives you the current version that you have the latest version. If you need to reinstall it, you can do it there. And then it lets you know if any of the plugins that come with the core have updates available and they do, one of them does. So you'll notice on the left now, it took you to dashboard and we're looking at updates and we got there by doing this circular arrow with the one on the quick options toolbar. 
The next one is if you have any notifications or comments. So I click on that one. When you create a WordPress site, it gives you a placeholder comment, so to speak. So if you want to view that post, right? If you, this is where you could comment on that post. It puts a post in here and it gives you a default comment. But if you wanted to view that post, you could click this link here. So this is just a default post that you get when you get to your site, your very new site that you haven't done anything on. And I just used the back arrow on my browser to get back to the comments page. And because we went there from the quick options, if you notice on the left, it now has you on comments. So if you were navigating the, the left bar, that's where you would go to get to where we are. Back to the top bar, the new button, you can start a new post, you can add new media, new page, new user, new form, new pop-up from that drop down, And then you have an icon that looks like the letter Y. And when you hover over it, it says SEO settings. So remember that search engine optimization. And there is a plugin that comes with the core named Yoast. And that is actually the Yoast icon that we're hovering on. And so you get its default free version included in WordPress, but it can be upgraded to a premium version. The next area is caching where you can purge all and get to your cache settings. And then you have insights. So this insights is that monster insights plugin where it's telling you that you need to set it up, right? So if we click on insights at the top, it's going to give us the same message that it needs to be set up. The next one is WP forms, another plugin that comes automatically with the core. It's really cool tool to build forms with, and it does have a pro version that can, you can upgrade to. Then you have your need help. To the right of that, you have your site status, which is coming soon. We don't have anything. And then you have, I think these are notifications. Yeah, these are every notification I got that's read, unread in those categories. And then you have your account information. So that is the tour of the top bar. So now we're on the comments page. And we were able to view that hello world default post that the comment is in response to from the comments page. Well, let's start on the left again. So on the left, let's click on Jetpack. Jetpack is another plugin that comes out of the core with WordPress. And you'll notice when we select Jetpack, it expands. So this is the Jetpack options, dashboard, settings, stats, search, and my Jetpack. Then we get to post on the left side. So when I click on post, it's automatically showing me all posts. Now I will warn you because of the resolution I need to use for creating this video, and it only seems to happen on my post page here. The left side looks really compressed, but I'll show you a screenshot of what this should look like and what it probably looks like on your screen. So because of my resolution, mine turned vertical. So underneath that hello world post, it says edit, quick edit, trash view, and there's an updated one, fairly new. I believe this is as of January, 2023, that mine also has that says blaze. So mine just happened to be vertically oriented and I can read them, but this is what it should look like on your screen. So this is where your posts will be in WordPress, the comments are in a different section, which we just saw. So if I wanted to view this post, I can just click on my vertical view word here. 
And there it is. And I can use my back arrow to go to the previous screen. We will talk more in depth about these options when we get to module three, our next module. Um, we'll go into detail about what you can and cannot do in here. So if you notice on the left, we're still on post, right? We're seeing all of them. You can go to add new, you can go to categories and we'll be doing that in our next module. And then you get to media and we will be addressing media in module four. All right. Um, and then we'll go back to our posts and add media to some of our posts and page that we're going to create. Next thing you have is your pages. So when you start a new WordPress site, it gives you a sample page and a draft privacy policy page. And we'll revisit pages again. Um, we'll touch on them briefly in module three and then really dig in in module four. We already looked at comments. OptiMonster is that it's a plugin, so we're going to skip that. So is Creative Mail. Feedback will be where you will find any form responses that you get should you create a form using WP Forms and have it on your site. Then you get to appearance, and this is where you can pick your theme for your site. We will be revisiting in the next module. You have, and I have a number one next to my plugins. And so when I click on plugins, this is where I can see a full list of all of the plugins that come out of the box. And also it's letting me know that there's a new version. That's why I have that number one next to plugins. And we saw that from our notification screen earlier. Then we get to users and we're going to revisit users. I'm going to skip it for now. We're going to, our next topic in this module is users and we'll hover over tools and you'll see that you have, uh, available tools, import, export, several other options there. We will be learning about importing and exporting co content when we get to module four. So we'll come back here then. And then you get to settings and we're going to click on settings. This is the general settings page and it has some information about at the top, you know, uh, it's really pushing you to set up your website analytics. It lets you know that your site is currently displaying a coming soon page. And when, once you're ready, you would launch your site. Um, it has the site title and the tagline. So when I created this site, I put in a tagline and in here, I just changed it to say, learn it WordPress video course. It gives you the WordPress address and the site address. I have a privacy blocker at the bottom of the screen for the administration email address. And then there's a membership checkbox for anyone can register. You notice I'm leaving mine unchecked. Um, again, we're going to talk about users, uh, in the next part of this module. So, um, that is the default user role for a new user would be subscriber. And you'll learn what that means in just a few. You'll get your site language here, the time zone that you're using. And you can do the drop down there, if you know, your UTC time, or you can put in a city name, something like that to get the right time for yourself. You can choose the date format and time format for your site. And there's a link there for documentation on date and time formatting. You can say when your week starts. Say my week starts on Sunday and your cash level. We're not going to deal with this in this course. Once you make changes on this page at the bottom, you have to click save changes. So if you've made changes, go ahead and click that. 
you also, so these are the general settings. You also have writing settings. And so I'm going to click on writing. So here your default post category, and we're going to really zoom in on post in our next module, but it comes, your default would be uncategorized, right? We haven't even built any categories yet. So that is the built-in category. And when we start the next module, you'll learn about the different default post formats. Gives you information about what you need to do to post to WordPress by email. And then it lets you know the update services um, that are notified by WordPress automatically. You also have reading settings. So you can say your homepage displays your latest post or a specific page. Um, blog pages show at most 10 posts. You can change all of these items. And you may want to come back and change these once we set up our blog and our post in the next module, revisit your reading settings. You have discussion settings. So other options about your post and your comments. And once we, you know, work on our site a little bit, we will come back and revisit some of these settings, especially reading and discussion. You have media settings where you can change, you know, default image sizes. Um, and then permalinks, I think when we went over common terms, we talked about permalinks, right? Also known as slugs. So this is where you can change the structure and they're giving you examples here, right? So on mine, I have it set for the, the slug would be the name of the post at the end of the URL. And you also have last but not least privacy settings. So again, when we looked at pages, it gives you a default um, privacy settings page, which is not enabled. You can enable it if you want to use it, or you could come here to create a new privacy policy page or change your pro privacy policy page. So if you need to have a privacy policy, you know, as a website owner, it says here, you may need to follow national or international privacy laws. So this is what that is referencing in terms of your settings. And the last two items are two more plugins, Yoast SEO and that Monster Insight. So, um, and you can also collapse that sidebar to get more working space if you'd like. And so that concludes the main tour. And now we're going to talk about Gravatars. So a Gravatar is a specific type of avatar. Um, it stands for globally recognized avatar. And that's what WordPress uses. They follow you around the web and automatically appear when you post a comment on a WordPress site. So you can register with Gravatar. The service matches your WordPress profile information to the email address registered with Gravatar and displays your custom Gravatar image next to comments and optionally elsewhere on the site. If you choose not to sign up with Gravatar, the default icon set by the administrator will appear next to your name. So you can do this for free if you want to get a Gravatar. And all you'd need is an image of yourself. By the way, if you have a, if you have two different images, we can use two different images for two different users. And so if you look in the upper right hand corner where my profile information is, you will see that little picture there is my Gravatar. And so how did I get it? 
If you go to gravatar.com, you can click, if you don't already have an account, you can click on create your gravatar. And this is all you need to fill in to sign up for the gravatar with a WordPress account. So you would fill this out, create your account. And once you do that, so I've already have mine set up, but it should give you the ability to add an email address or pick an email to modify. It may have your primary address in there. And that is your WordPress email that you used. And then you can add images. So you can see my two images. I have two different emails that I have privacy blocked. And these are two users that I am using in my WordPress account. So when you, if you set up your gravatars, they'll instantly show up in the user section in WordPress. Another way, or if you choose not to use gravatars, under settings on the left, let's go back to discussion and scroll almost all the way to the bottom till you get to the avatar section. So if you want to use gravatars, you have to make sure that show avatars is checked. You can give a maximum rating for your avatars, right? Um, for users without a gravatar, you can give them any of these icons to represent them within WordPress. When we were reviewing settings, we saw the default user role of subscriber. And so what I've done is I've added a slide in here that shows you all of the possible user roles that are available in WordPress, also known as capabilities. So the two on the top, SEO editor and SEO manager, are only if you have will only be there if you have a plugin for SEO. So the core comes with the Yoast SEO plugin, and we should be able to see SEO editor and manager on our list of user roles. So the editor can only access the SEO content box in posts and pages and other areas where they might need to adjust. And the manager has the ability to edit the Yoast SEO settings and its metadata information. The editor cannot do that. Our default role of subscriber is the one with the least amount of permissions or capabilities. The only part of a site that a subscriber can modify is their profile page. That's it. We have contributor can write posts, but has no control over publication. Once written, the post will be submitted for proofreading by a user with more rights who will decide whether or not it can be published. Contributor can add categories and tags via the post editing interface. The contributor will not be able to modify the post online and can only read comments under the post that they've created if they are published, but they cannot moderate the comments. Then we have author can publish posts, send files, and add images. The author can also modify and delete their own publications. They can moderate comments on their articles. They cannot intervene on the publications of other users, which is what an editor can do. Editors have control over all editorial matters. They can publish pages, also edit and delete them, even if they're created by other users. They can add, modify, and delete categories and tags and they can completely manage comments and validate, moderate, and delete them. And then the administrator, which is the role we're in now when you sign up and log into your WordPress site, that's the administrator, can do everything on your site. So the SEO editor and SEO manager roles, um, sometimes people hire people you know, outside people, contractors to fulfill those roles. And instead of having to give them full access via administrator, we now have the capability of giving them SEO editor 
or SEO manager, depending on what they need to do. So I left my default avatar as the mystery person here. On the left, we're gonna go over to users. And so here on the users, I'm seeing all users. And I, of course, have my privacy block on for the email address. But you're seeing the Gravatars that I assigned to those email addresses in Gravatar.com. So if I add another user, and I only have the two Gravatars in there. So I'm going to click on the left. I'm going to click on Add New under Users. And if you have another email address that you'd like to use, if you put like another picture in your Gravatar, you can do it here. But I wanna direct your attention down to the bottom where we saw that default user role is subscriber. So you wanna keep your eye on that and give them the proper assignment. If we do the drop down there, we'll see all of the ones that I just covered with you on the slide. So I'm not going to add another user. I just wanted to show you how you would do it so you could see your second Gravatar if you set that up. In this module, we focused on getting started with WordPress. And we learned the difference between WordPress.com and WordPress.org before we moved on to getting and installing WordPress. And again, my instructions were based on using Bluehost as a hosting provider. Because we used a hosting provider, it installed WordPress through an auto installer script, as opposed to us going to wordpress.com, downloading the software and having to go through the installation steps on our own with a self-hosted site. We spent some time going over the WP-admin panel, known as the dashboard, its interface, so that you will know how to navigate around WordPress. And then we went into how to get a Gravatar and spent some time learning about user roles and capabilities. And I showed you my users so you could see the Gravatars. And again, they will follow the user with that email around the internet, it will, if I post a comment on someone's WordPress site, my Gravatar would show for my comment. In module three, we're gonna start creating blog content and really starting to build up our website. So we'll start by going over some WordPress admin conventions. And then we, and like I said, we're gonna really do a deep dive on pages in module four, but we wanna set up our home page, And we'll do that in lesson two here. And then we'll start posting, we're gonna be doing a blog site. So we'll start posting on our blog. Um, we'll have several posts that we put up. You'll learn about discussion on your blog, meaning the comments. And we'll also learn how to add and manage categories and then we'll be able to go back to our post and apply the categories that we get to in lesson five here. So in WordPress, admin conventions are being described on this slide. And you've already seen this when we were doing our tour of the WordPress interface. So you have the ability to manage a number of different types of content and content sorting types, including posts, categories, pages, links, media uploads, and more. And the beauty of it is WordPress uses a similar format for various screens, like posts and pages, and even comments. For every piece of content in WordPress that you might wanna manage, there will be a screen listing them. And as mentioned, some of them are very similar. So you've seen this slide before, um, because my post, because of my resolution, um, the actions for a post are showing vertically. So, you know, this looks very similar to the pages screen and very similar to comment screen. So you have that comfortability level within the application when you're working in it. So we left off on the new user screen when we were in here before. And a couple of things before we move on. 
Um, it automatically generates strong passwords for you. You can have it generate another one, or you can put in the password that you want for that user. And you do want to make sure you leave this check to send the new user an email about their account, and it will give them their login information and how to access the site. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to general settings for a moment. And we've been here before when we, I showed you how you could change the tagline. You can even change the site title. And now that we're getting ready to create our blog site, I want to make the title and the tagline specific to that. I will be using this domain for multiple purposes. So I'm going to change the site title here. And it's going to be because my blog is going to be about gardening. I'm going to call it gardening is my peace blog. And you'll notice it updates in the upper left-hand corner where you have the house, right? That's where the title is sh showing. And then I'm going to change the tagline here to the enthusiastic gardener. And I'm going to scroll down to the bottom and save those changes. And now we're ready to select a theme for our site. And remember, the theme is the spouse in the WordPress family. We're going to, on the left side, we're going to hover over appearance and click on themes. So underneath the messages, you'll see the themes that come with WordPress core. And the active theme is 2023. You can see that it can be customized. When you hover over it, you can click and see the theme details. All right, so it gives you all the information about the theme. It gives you a look at how it looks on a site. And we're going to go ahead in the upper right hand corner and close that detail window. And we can see what it looks like on that sample page on our site. So we can go up to where it says gardening is my peace blog where the house is on the options toolbar, and we can go to visit the site. And there's that hello world sample page. And to get back, you can just simply use the back button on your browser. If I hover over the Sinatra theme, this one, in addition to showing, being able to see the theme details, you can either activate it and you can also get a live preview of it. So I'm going to go ahead and click on live preview. And so it kind of shows me what that theme would look like with my limited content at this point. If I liked it and I wanted to keep it, I could activate and publish, but I'm going to do the X in the upper left-hand corner. And if you'd like, you can take a look at the other two themes that are included. The 2021 theme has a live preview. 2022 does not. And then you have the option to add a new theme. Now, there are other themes that are available to you that you don't have to pay extra for. And so it shows you in this list the ones that are already installed, right? So I have 2023 and 2022 installed, and that's why they that's why 2022 won't let you have the preview. When I'm looking at it here, it says details and preview. 
And then these are just generically speaking, all of the other themes that are available. Now at the top, it lets you know that there's 243 themes and there's a gear and it says feature filter. Let's limit our list. So let's select feature filter and under subject, we'll select blog. For features, we'll do accessibility ready and featured image header, featured images. And we will leave the layout unselected. So we have, oh, actually in um, features, let's also select post formats. So any theme related ones will be there. And we'll go to apply filters at the bottom. And so now we're seeing a limited list of themes that meet that criteria. I'm going to hover over a gamma blue and click on details and preview. And so it shows you a preview. It's not a live preview, meaning your data, but it's showing you a preview of what that blog would look like. You has a home page, which has the blog entries on it and about page. And then there's a parent page there, which is a sub page in this example. And if you want it to get this theme, you can install it at the top. We're going to go ahead and close and I'm going to go back to the feature filter gear and clear the filter. And I just, um, click themes on the left again to get back to the main themes page. So I think that what I'm going to do is. I am going to activate the Sinatra theme and I'm going to go back up to the house and visit my site. So you can see that it has the name, the site title. It has that hello world post. It has, we're on the home tab. And then there's a sample page. And so that's a sample page that's in the pages category in WordPress has a search box. Recent posts would show here. Recent comments would show here. And at the bottom, you have the ability to use widgets for footers. And so to get back from here, I can just hover over where it now looks like a clock and it says gardening is my peace blog. And I can go back to themes from there. And I decide that I want to go back to my 2023 theme. So I'm going to activate it. And then take a look at that theme on your site on your own. We can always customize our theme later or switch to a different theme later. But right now we're going to go ahead and create two pages for our site. So on the left side, we're going to go ahead and go over to pages. And so when you click directly on pages, it takes you to all pages. And so we, we were here before and we can see the admin convention. Th this screen is set up very much like the post screen, like the comment screen. Um, some of the things on here, it shows you how many pages, how many are published, how many are draft. Um, I had one from earlier that's in trash. It also has bulk actions, right? Which you can edit and move to trash. You can apply from here pages from all dates or just from a particular date range. 
all SEO scores, all readability scores, you can filter, so on and so forth. And over on the right, it shows two items, right? That title page does not count. You, If you notice, if you hover over it, you don't get the edit, quick edit, trash options. And so what we're gonna do, the first page we're gonna do is we're gonna just edit the sample page. So I'm hovering over it and I'm gonna choose edit. And the only thing we're gonna change for right now is its title. So I'm gonna click where and select sample page and I'm gonna type about me. And in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a blue update button going to go ahead and click that. It lets me know in the bottom left that the page was updated. I could view the page from there. We'll talk more about this interface in just a little while. And I used my back navigation to get back to the all pages screen. And you can see that it just updated the title of that page to about me. You may need to refresh your browser to get that update. And now we're going to add another page to this. Now I'm going to click on add new from the left sidebar. And the only thing we're going to do with this page right now, we're going to um, add content to the about me page as well as this page in just a little bit. We just want to give it a title and the title is blog. Now we don't have the update button in the upper right hand corner because this is a new page. So we're going to publish it. It asks if we're ready to publish, right? Now, if it wasn't for the next thing that we were going to do, I might suggest that we keep this private for now, but we want to be able to tell it which page to show when users go to the site. So we're going to leave it on public. If no one has your URL, nobody will be seeing it if you haven't finished building out your site yet. So it's fine. You can leave it on public. And we are going to choose the blue publish button. I can use the X to close that panel on the right side. And now it's an existing page. So if I make changes, you'll notice that the update button is there. It's a published page. And I'm going to just use my browser's back button to get back to the pages screen and I may have to refresh in order to see the blog page there. So about me and blog. Now, again, we're going to be adding content to those pages, but first what I want us to do is go to settings on the left and go to reading settings. So we covered this page earlier, right? And now we're saying, we're seeing where your home page displays your latest posts or a static page. We're going to do the option button for a static page. And for the home page, we're going to select about me. So when people visit your site, that will be their landing page. And then we're going to say for the post page, we're going to select blog. And in order to do that, you have to have publicly posted pages to make these changes here. That's why we didn't make it private. We'll leave these default settings that the blog pages show, you know, at most 10 posts. And for each post in the feed, we can see the full text for now. Um, but again, some of this is theme dependent because we didn't select a blog specific theme. Each theme has its own blog kind of format for the post. So 
when we're going to go to the bottom and we're going to save our changes for those settings. Let's visit our site again and see that our about me page is the landing page. And then in the upper right, you have the link to the blog page, which has that sample post on it. And I'm going to go back to the clock and just go back to dashboard here. And then I can navigate back to all pages. Notice since we changed the reading setting, it says about me is the front page and blog is the post page. And we're going to modify the about me page. So I'm going to hover over it and I'm going to select edit. We are going to add our own content, get rid of the sample content on this page. But before we do so, let's talk a little bit about this interface. The first thing I want to point out in the lower left corner, it says page. So you know that you're modifying a page. You also have some icons going across the top, right? Um, the first one, the WordPress icon, you can view your pages. We don't need to do that in this moment. The next one is to toggle the block inserter. And just go ahead and click it. And notice now on the left side, you have all of these different, what are called blocks. They're divided into categories. So your text blocks include paragraphs, headings, lists, quotes, so on and so forth. You have media blocks there, design blocks, widgets, theme blocks, so on and on. There's also a patterns tab there. So you can look at, we're looking at featured patterns, right? But you can have three columns of text is what's showing three columns with images and text, open spaces. So these are kind of like things that you can use to build up your page. Now, since we use that button to toggle the blocks, the plus sign is now an X. And when we click it, it gets rid of that block area, but it doesn't bring up the panel that was on the right when we first came in. To bring that panel back up, we're going to go to the gear, which is settings. And that's what brings that right panel up. The next icon going across the top is tools, the pencil icon. So edit and select are your tools. You also have undo and redo. You have details. And you can look at items in a list view by clicking that line button. So you're looking at a paragraph is selected right now, right? When you hover over paragraph, it shows you the paragraph. If there's any quotes. When you click on these items, it's showing you in list view. And we can go back to the three lines to get rid of that view. You can switch to draft, you can preview from the right, you can update after you make changes. Um, this is, you know, the Yoast SEO plugin and Jetpack is another plugin that shows up there. And then you have an options ellipsis where you can view different things and get into different editors and tools from here. So that right panel is showing information by default about the page. So it's showing the visibility of the page. If I click on public, it shows you how you can change the visibility, right? So when it was last published, the URL, it's using a page template from the theme that we're using the author. I can move the page to trash from here, or I can do it from the all pages screen. 
And then it gives OptiMonster is another plugin. It has those settings. All the plugin settings are over there. The template we're using allows for a featured image. And we will come back in the next module and add an image to this page. You have a discussion section there. So this is the about me page. I'm not going to allow comments on my about me page. And then you have page attributes and we don't have to worry about this right now. So up at the top, we're going to go to the block tab and it says no block selected. So if I select this first paragraph, if I click anywhere within the first paragraph, that block panel fills in. So on that right panel, it has a color section. So I can change the text color for that paragraph, give it a background color. If I had any links within it, those links could have a specific color. I can change the size of the type and then it has a plus sign next to dimensions where it talks about padding and margin, which we're not going to worry about. And there are more advanced settings there as well. So, but what we want to do is we want to change all of this text. And I'm going to show you two different ways of doing this. So the first way is I'm going to triple click and select that first paragraph. And I'm going to just type hello and welcome everyone. And I'm going to put an exclamation point at the end. So that's what I want the first paragraph on my about me page to say. Now I want to get rid of all these other blocks. And so I'm going to just select everything to the bottom. And you'll notice that I have on the right, it now says that I have four blocks selected and cumulatively there is a hundred, there are 106 words. And so that little toolbar that's above the selection, right? I'm going to go to the options ellipsis and I'm going to choose remove blocks. And now I'm going to press enter after hello and welcome everyone. And I want to collapse all of this Yoast SEO information. So I'm going to use this arrow. It has the blue square around it, the up arrow there to collapse that. And now that I pressed enter, it says type slash to choose a block. So if I click there and I type a slash, it lets me choose certain types of blocks, right? If I want it to add columns here or an image or a heading or a quote, things of that nature, even audio. I'm going to just backspace and get rid of that slash. And to the right, you'll see a plus sign to add a block. So we're going to add a block and we want to add a paragraph, another paragraph. And I will type in and show you my content. Now my blog is about gardening, um, but this about me page is a great way for you to introduce yourself to your potential audience when they visit your site. So you can view the content that I put on, I put on more paragraph blocks and paragraph is the default block. So when I showed you how to do the plus sign and select paragraph, you don't really have to do that. You just have to press enter after each paragraph. And the next thing you do will be another block. So when I select everything over here, except for the page title about me, and I look over on the right, it lets me know that I have four blocks and 160 words. And 
again, once we get into using the media library, I'm going to come back to this about me page and add an image or two. For right now, I'm going to go up to the upper right and update this page. Other than using your browser's back arrow, we can go to the WordPress icon. When you hover over it, it says view pages. And when you click it, it takes you back to the WordPress interface on the all pages screen. So now we're ready to create our first post. So we're going to go to post. Well, first, before I do that, I'm going to get rid of this. I want to delete this hello world post. So I'm going to just send it to trash. And so we have no posts found on the left. I'm going to select add new under post. We're going to create four very short posts and um, we will come back and add pictures to them once we get to our next module. So for right now, you're kind of familiar with this interface. I will tell you this H over here is the headline analyzer and we don't have a headline or a title so it's not analyzing anything we're going to ignore the yoast seo and the jetpack information that may come up for this first post if we look over on the right side panel and it's on post we want to stick this to the top of the blog we want this first post to always be at the top of the blog and I'm going to scroll down in that panel and you'll see at the bottom, it de defaults, it allows comments. So we would like discussion on our post. And now we're ready to create the first post. So the first one, the title is going to be about my garden, just sticking with my theme. And I've used my down arrow to get to the line where it says type slash to choose a block. And this is where I'm going to just put my first paragraph here. So my first paragraph is just going to be about the location of my garden. So my garden is in Northern California. And again, whatever your blog is about, you can be creating your first post using your own words if you like. And the temperatures, the temperature can get to below freezing in winter. And in the summer, it is very hot. Here's the rest of my post. And you'll notice that the editor has a built in spell check. Just like in most text programs, you can just right click on the underlined word and get to the suggestion, add it to the dictionary, ignore it, typical settings. And again, feel free to copy my post if you would like to. And I'm going to go up to the upper right and go ahead and publish this post. And I don't have to change any of my settings. So I'm going to click publish again. And you can see in the panel about my garden is now live and it gives information about it over on the right. I am going to close that panel and I'm going to use the WordPress icon to get back to view post. Now that we have our first post, let's go take a look at our page. So I'm going up to the house, the upper left corner, and we can see the about me page. And on the upper right, we have our navigation menu so we can go to the blog page from there. And when we get here, it's interesting because there's nothing on our blog page that says mind blown, a blog about philosophy. So 
that is part of the theme that I'm using. I think I'm on the 2023 theme and that's part of the theme. And when I go to the blog page to try to edit it away, it just simply doesn't show on that page. And there's an editor under appearance in beta mode that lets you get to the about me page, but it won't let you go to the blog page to edit that out. So in situations like that, and they're really, usually it's not this clunky. Usually they don't have something like that come through in the theme, but in this case, it, it's happening. So what we're going to do is we're going to change to a different theme. So let's go up to the clock and click on themes. So the one I'm thinking about using has a little bit of color in the background and it can be modified if necessary. And that's the 2021 theme. I'm going to hover over it and go to live preview. So now that we have some of our own content, we can see at the top, it has the site title and tagline. And on the left side, you have a panel where you can customize this theme. And so if you expand site identity, you can change the title and the tagline from here, or you can set, tell it not to display that, right? I'm going to do this left pointing arrow next to site identity to get back to the full panel. You'll notice there's no navigation at the top to get to the blog page. If I scroll down, I see the search box. It's a link to my recent post. There's no comments yet, archives, no categories yet. And so right now, that's the only way I can get to that post, right? Without having a menu. So we can create a menu for this theme. So a user doesn't have to go all the way to bottom. And then that recent post is going to end up being a limited list. So on the left side, we're going to expand menus. And you can have menus in two locations on your page. You can have one in the upper location, and you can have another one at the bottom. They can be the same or different. So what we're going to do is we're going to, under menus, we're going to go to view all locations, expand that, and we're going to create a new primary menu first, which shows at the top of the page. So I'm going to just name the menu primary. And so because of the way we went in through locations, primary is already selected here. And we're going to click next to start adding our locations. So now we're going to add items. And so we have our pages here. And I'm going to add about me and the blog page. And that's all I'm going to add to that primary menu. So now what I can do is I can do the back arrow at the top to get back to your customizing menus. And you can see the primary menu is there. So I can go from about me to my blog page. Now we're going to set up our secondary menu. So we're going to go back to view all locations and under secondary, we're going to click the create new menu link. We're going to name it secondary and choose next and then add items. And I'm just going to select post here. And notice when the about my garden post comes up, it says sticky next to it. So sticky means it will stay at the top of the list until another post through this interface um, is marked sticky until you add another post sticky. So then that one will take the dominant position. And that's all we're going to add to this secondary menu is the post. So we can do the back arrow at the top left again. 
and click on primary to expand it. And for this one, at the bottom under menu options, we want to check automatically add new top level pages to this menu. So if we create any other pages, they will automatically be added to the menu. And let's do the back arrow again and again. So you could change the colors here um, if you wanted to. And you can have dark mode support on your site, which you can read about there. If you wanted to change the background color of the site, you can change it. I'm going to leave it the way it is. I'm going to do the back arrow. And at the top, I'm going to go ahead and activate and publish. Once it's published, I can close that panel. And now I can go back up and visit my site. When we created the about me page, we had the title about me at the top before hello and welcome everyone. Now, if we were to go back and edit the page and look at it, it has that title there, but this template has removed it. The template for that part of this theme has removed it. Now I could go and add it back in by editing the theme again, but I've decided it doesn't really need to be there on the page. Just having that about me underlined lets them know what page you're on and that it is the about me page. So I'm going to just use the clock to get back to my WordPress interface. So I'm back on my post page. I wanted to have a total of four posts, but what we're going to do is we're going to add one more post and we're going to put headings in it. And so let's go over to add new. And for this one, the title is going to be what grows in my garden. And this is where it says type slash to choose, choose a block on the right side. We're going to do the plus sign and we're going to choose heading and it defaults to heading two. And if you click on that H2, we're going to switch it to heading three, which is a little bit smaller. And then for the heading here, it's going to be vegetables. And I'm going to enter. So now it'll give me a default paragraph block. So there's my first paragraph. I'm going to press enter, hover over it, go back to the plus sign and choose heading again and switch it to H3. And my second heading is herbs. So there's my paragraph about herbs and I'm going to add one more heading three and it's going to be fruit. And you can now see my fruit paragraph. I'm going to go ahead and publish this post. And once it's published, I'm just going to go close that panel and go back to WordPress. So again, my post page is the one that's really strange looking. It's doing the vertical thing, but you can see that I have my about my garden post and I have my what grows in my garden post. And I can go back to the site and go to my blog page to see my post. and then back to WordPress. Now that we've created a few posts, our next topic is discussion on your blog. In other words, comments on your blog. 
So I have two browser windows side by side. On the left side, the one that's blue, that's my admin account that I've been working in um, where I've created the pages and the blog posts. And you can see my Gravatar there, it has a hat. And on the right side is my training user account and that Gravatar is different. They're both pictures of me. Um, it feels weird, but anyway, I'm playing the role of two different people right now. So on my training user account, I'm already in my blog and I'm looking at the what grows in my garden post. And down at the bottom of it, it tells me when it was published, who published it and that it's uncategorized. And then it lets me know that I'm logged in as training user and I can leave a comment. So I'm gonna put in a brief comment so my comment is about, have you considered growing cherries? They work out well for me and I'm also in Northern California. And then underneath that, I'm gonna click post comment. So my training user does not have capabilities to post directly on the blog. So it, it notifies them that your comment is awaiting moderation. This is a preview. Your comment will be visible after it has been approved. So now on my admin screen, in, on the comments page, you'll see that training user comment and I can approve it, I can reply, I can edit because I'm the admin. I can send it to trash, I can say that it's spam, I can view the post if I want to. And what I am going to do is I am going to select approve. And once I do that, it now gives me the option to unapprove it. So now as my admin user, I've gone to the site and I, since I approved it, I can now see the training user comment on that post. And so I'm going to go back to um, the clock to get back to WordPress. And what I like to do here is go back to pages and I want to check something on that blog post page. I want to edit it. And since we have the commenting feature enabled on the post, I'm going to scroll down on the right panel and I'm going to uncheck allow comments on this blog page. We're just going to have them available for the post. And now I'm going to update that page. And I'm going to go back to my WordPress interface. Our last lesson in this module is using categories or adding and managing categories. We're not going to be using tags in here, but it's worth it to know what categories and tags are. So there are two primary ways to group content on a WordPress site, and both are used in conjunction with SEO. Categories are general labels. It's recommended that you use no more than two to three categories per post. So for example, vegetables, herbs, fruits, Tags are more specific and indicate the individual things the post talks about. You're expected to use multiple tags per post. So for example, garden, gardening, cherry tomatoes, tomatoes, plants. And again, our focus will be on categories, but these are used in conjunction with SEO. If someone is searching on the internet, it helps, and when you learn more about SEO, you'll learn more about tags and categories. So I'm gonna go back over to WordPress now. So we're gonna hover over post in the left sidebar and choose categories. So we have a default category, it's called uncategorized. We're gonna leave that alone. And it's already set up to add a new category. 
Our first category is going to be vegetables. And the slug, remember, that's the permalink. I'm just going to have it say vegetables in all lowercase. It's not going to have a parent category, and you'll see what that is in just a little bit. Um, it creates a hierarchy of sorts. We don't have to put in a description. Um, it says underneath that some themes may show it, others not. We're going to just go to the bottom and click on add new category. So now we see our vegetables category over there. Now, before we add another one, let's go and look at vegetables. We can edit it. So just like a lot of the screens, you have those edit components and quick edit components. And when you edit a category, it allows you to add media. So pictures, video, audio, all of that stuff. You can also add forms, contact forms, or, you know, this is the description area. So instead of putting in a description, you could potentially use a picture. So that's what happens when you go to edit category, has a bunch of SEO stuff at the bottom. So I'm going to go back over to categories on the left. And now we're going to add another category. And this one is going to be tomatoes. And the slug is going to be tomatoes. Same thing in all lowercase. For this one, we're going to assign it a parent category. And it's going to be vegetables. And we're going to go to the bottom and just add. Our next one is going to be cherry tomatoes. And the slug is going to be lowercase cherry hyphen tomatoes. Notice the parent category is still on vegetables, and that's great if that's what you want. And we're going to leave that there. And we're going to add another new category. So now we have bell peppers. Oops. And the slug is going to be lowercase bell hyphen peppers. Leave the same parent and add. Now we're going to have a, another category and it's going to be called herbs. And the slug is going to be herbs. We're not giving this one a parent, so change that to none and add. So now we're going to add basil with the same slug, lowercase. We're going to give this a parent category of herbs and add. And since it retained that, the next few that we're going to add are going to use that same parent category. So we have cilantro. And then we have mint. Next up is oregano. Then rosemary. And the last herb is thyme. And we have one more category we're going to do, and it's going to be fruits or fruit, just fruit. And no parent.
As you look at your list of categories, you'll notice the ones that either that don't have a parent are not indented or in any way as you scroll through the list. And the ones that are child children to the parent are indented under their parents. So under herbs, you're seeing thyme, rosemary, oregano, mint, cilantro, and basil. And under vegetables, you're seeing your bell peppers, cherry tomatoes, and tomatoes. Now I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to add categories to your post. Let's go to all posts. And you know, again, I apologize because of my resolution that my post screen is so weird, but I'm scrolling down to, I see my about my garden post and I'm going to go in to edit. So once your categories are built and you're creating a post on that right panel, if you scroll down on that right panel, you will see categories and you can expand it and you'll see all of your categories. So by default, every post is being given uncategorized, right? So this one, I'm going to uncheck uncategorized. It's about my garden and I'm going to select fruit herbs and scroll down and select vegetables. And you have the opportunity to select a primary category. I would make it, uh, what do I, I'll do vegetables as my primary one. And then I'm going to go ahead and update. And those categories are now assigned to that post. I'm going to go back to view post and my what grows in my garden post. I'm going to show you another way of doing this one. And that way is the quick edit feature. So if you don't do your, if I don't do my categories, when I create my posts, normally I create my categories before I start creating posts and then I assign them while I'm creating the post. But if I forget to do that, I typically go into quick edit instead of edit. And the quick edit screen looks a little bit different, but you can see that the, the categories are there as well. So what grows in my garden for this one, I'm going to select fruit, herbs, uncheck uncategorize, and select vegetables. I'm not going to be specific here. And so I've quickly, I've done a quick edit on that post, and I'm going to use the update button to update it. And you can see on the post screen, it shows any categories, and if you were using tags, it would show them that have been assigned to the post. So in module three, we focused on creating some blog content. We went over the WordPress admin conventions, which many, which means that many of the screens are very similar in their look and functionality, like pages, posts, comments. We started building our site by creating our about me page. And then we started creating blog pages and we started posting on our blog. We did a couple of posts, um, one of which we used headings in it to differentiate different topics. Went on to talking about commenting on your blog. We made sure that the blog page itself has comments disabled, but each post defaults to enabling comments and we want the comments just to be allowed on our post. So you saw me post a comment from one of my other users on a post and you saw my admin user approve that comment so that it shows on the site. And then we moved on to learning the difference between categories and tags. And then we started adding categories and I showed you two different ways 
of applying categories to your posts. So I'd like to thank everyone for viewing this WordPress course. Again, my name is Trish Connor Cato, and it's been my pleasure to present this video to you. So in this course, we started by getting an introduction to WordPress. You learned about common terms, a variety of reasons why people choose WordPress to build their sites. You learned about the WordPress family and WordPress features. And then in that first module, we also moved into getting online WordPress resources staying updated with WordPress news, and understanding the codex, the official online manual for WordPress, as well as how to access it. You also learned how to get support from other users via the forums, and you got a little bit about the directory structure of where your things are stored at the level of your hosting provider in that wp-content directory. In the second module, we got started with WordPress. You learned the difference between wordpress.org and wordpress.com. We went through the steps of installing WordPress via a hosting provider. And just a reminder, the PowerPoint presentation with all the information is part of your files in the video description as well. So we went through all of those steps. You then learned how to get a Gravatar from Gravatar.com, which follows you around the web. In the third module, we started creating blog content. We added a theme. We went over some admin conventions, like the similarities between a lot of the screens in WordPress like they're structured in the same way for ease of use, like pages screen, post screen. We created a page and added some content to it. And we also created a page that we were gonna use as our blog page. And we created a few posts. We made sure that comments stayed enabled on our blog post. And then we went into adding and managing categories so that we could add categories to our post. Hello everyone. My name is Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the WordPress video course. This course is for anyone new to WordPress or who is self-taught on the product. Each category would make a good candidate for this course. No prior WordPress knowledge is needed. No prior web development or programming skills are required. This course is designed for non-technical users who are more interested in content management and search engine optimization than the technical aspects of website creation. Module four will see us learning about pages, using the media library, and how to import and export content. Our fifth module will focus on plugins. We'll learn what they are, how to install them, and we'll cover the must have pack of plugins. You should know that I do have files in the video description that we will be using during this course. So you may want to pause the video, download those files and put them in the same folder somewhere on your computer for easy access. In our fourth module, we're going to be learning a little bit more about pages, media, and how to import and export content to and from your WordPress sites. We have three lessons in this module. We're gonna start with pages, then you'll learn how to add items to the media library, and then we'll move on to importing and exporting content. Now there is a file in the video description called useful links. It's a word document. You want to have that open while we're going through this module. And also in the video description, there's a folder named images for website. 
and you should go ahead and have that folder opened as well. And now we're going to add a, another page. So I'm on the pages screen and I'm going to use the add new link at the top of the screen this time. And I should mention if that right pane is not expanded when you come in here or open, you can always click the gear to show or hide it. The title of this page is going to be articles. And then I'm going to just use my down arrow to get underneath that title. And I'm going to type Northern California dash inspiring garden ideas for all gardeners. And then I'm going to just select that text. And that little toolbar pops up and on it, it has the link icon, or you could do control K just like you can in like word or, you know, the office programs to get to a hyperlink. So I'm going to click the link icon. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up that useful links document so I can show you how to get the actual URL. So in that word document, that first link, I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to choose edit hyperlink. And at the bottom, the actual address, the URL is selected. The text to display is at the top. And since that's already selected, I'm going to do control C to copy that URL. I can cancel out of here. And then I'm going to paste that URL in that search box on the page. And once you paste it, you press enter. And now it changed that text into the actual link. Now that is a placeholder right there. If you click on that placeholder, that looks like a hyperlink. It opens that screen again, and you want to select, you want to toggle open in new tab so that if a user on the page accesses that link, it opens that link in a new tab on their browser. And now I've clicked at the end of that link placeholder and I'm going to press enter. And the next thing we're going to type is a winter vegetable garden in Northern California. Same process. We're going to select it, the text. We're going to go ahead and click on link or control K. Go to your word document and right click on that link and edit it. You're going to copy the URL and you can cancel that edit hyperlink box. Paste it in, press enter, click on it and toggle open a new tab. So the third one I'm going to have you do on your own and you have what you're going to type in the link in the word document, and then you can get to the actual URL and copy and paste it in here. And when you're done, your screen should look like mine. When I click on that last link, I went ahead and toggled open in new tab. And we're going to go ahead and publish this page. I went ahead and accessed the view page link. You'll notice since we added another page, when we created our menu for this theme, we told it to add new pages to the menu. So it did that automatically for that primary menu. It has articles up there now. And these are actual links on this page that I can select and go to the articles. And I can get this to show, you can see that it opened on a new tab. 
So I'm going to just go ahead and close that article. And I'm going to just use the clock to get back to my WordPress interface. And I'm going to go back to pages for a moment. So we can see our articles page is there listed with all of our other pages. And the one thing is, you know, you have those options, edit, quick edit, trash, view, and blaze. Blaze is an advertising plugin, I guess. And so it comes out of the box and I've had some blaze messages on the screen before that I closed. And it allows you to advertise on wordpress.com and Tumblr in just a few clicks. It turns your site content into clean, compelling ads that run across their network of blogs. Now, something else I want to show you since we're here on pages, you'll notice that it says we have four pages, three published, one draft, no cornerstone content. Cornerstone content ties in with your SEO plugin if you were using it. In this case, the one that comes out of the box is Yoast. And so what does that mean? Cornerstone content consists of the best, most important articles on your site. The pages or posts you want to rank highest in the search engines. So it correlates with your SEO and you can actually mark things as cornerstone content when you're using an SEO plugin. The other thing I want to talk about on this screen are these icons over on the right. So when I hover over the first icon, it kind of looks like a traffic light, that would be your SEO score. And so we haven't done anything with SEO. When I hover over that red circle, it says focus key phrase, not set. So that also has to do with your search engine optimization. The next one that looks like a feather, or it's like a quill of a pen, right? That's your readability score. And so when you hover over any of the green circles there, you'll see good. That blog post, it's not available. The blog post page, it says not available, as well as that draft privacy policy page. And then you have two icons. One has an upward pointing arrow on the left. And if you hover over that one, it says number of outgoing internal links in this post. And it says, see Yoast columns text in the help tab for more, more info. So again, deals with SEO, right? We don't have any outgoing internal links in the post. And because we don't have Yoast enabled, we're not showing any outgoing number. So this first one is number of outgoing internal links. And the second one is the number of internal links. And so just some SEO information that you can see right there from this screen. So now we're gonna start adding some files to our media library. And I have this slide here and it shows you what types of image, audio, video files that you can add in WordPress. You can also add PDFs and Adobe Photoshop documents, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint files. And at the bottom of the slide, um, the images that we have in the files for the video description in that images for website folder, I got all of those from openverse.org. So I put a link to that website there. Um, you can also access openverse from within wordpress.org, but it's an extensive library of free stock photos images and audio. It's all part of creative content and which means it's free and legal for you to use. Now we're ready to upload images to our media library. 
So on the left sidebar, I'm simply going to hover over media and choose add new. And you can see that you can select the files it'll take you to your file explorer, or you can drop files to upload, which I prefer to do. So all of these files are in that images for website folder in the files for the video description. So as you can see, I've selected all of the files in that folder. And I've moved that folder to my other screen and I'm just clicking and holding and notice it tells me how many files I have selected, which is 14 and it's copying them in here. So they'll still be in that images for website folder. And I'm going to just let go and it starts uploading them. It lets you know the maximum upload file size right above where it's uploading those files. And now when you go to your library, you will see the 14 images and they show up in the library in the order that you uploaded them with the last one being the first one. So whichever order they were uploaded and you notice it went through the uploading process and then it crunched the image and then it went to the next image and uploaded it and kept repeating that process until they were all uploaded. So one of the things I like to do when we first have our images upload is I like to assign captions to them and I do it out of the gate. Now I can do it as I use them but I'm in the habit of doing them as soon as I upload them. So I don't have to worry about it later when I do utilize them on pages or posts or even on categories. The other thing is in your media library, it defaults to showing all media items. As you can see, that's a drop down. So if you just wanted to see images, if you had a mix of items, you can filter by just those items and also by date here. You can also search for items in here. So in the search box, if I type in basil and press enter, it shows me that one item. And I'm going to do the X to the right of the search box to clear that and get my full list of items back again. So I'm going to select the first item and it opens up the attachment details screen tells you when it was uploaded, who it was uploaded by information about the file. And you can, it comes with a caption, right? And again, I got these from OpenVerse. So I'm going to just remove that caption and I'm going to type in tomatoes on the vine. I can leave the title the way it is. And I like to put alternative text in so that anyone who's visually disabled, a screen reader will read what it says for this picture on the screen. So I'm going to just put the same thing, tomatoes on the vine for alt text. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom on the right, you can view the attachment page, edit more details or delete the image permanently. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the right arrow in the upper right corner to get to the next image. So I don't have to go through each of them. And for this, the alt text is going to be time plant. We'll leave the title and the caption is just going to be time. I'm going to move to the next one. Alt text is going to be strawberry plant and the caption is going to just be strawberry. So go through the rest of these images and assign, you should be able to tell from the title what it is. If I encounter any that don't have a title, I will let you know what they are. And you're going to just put in alt text and a caption for these. A couple that I want to point out the question mark, I'm not giving it a caption. And when you get to the red, yellow and orange bell peppers, 
notice there's a scroll bar in the caption. So you want to scroll down and that information that's in there about what kind of camera it was taken with, you're going to delete that out of the caption. And when you're done with your alt text and captioning, you can do that X in the upper right hand corner to get back to your media library. Now let's go start using some of our images. We'll start on pages and we're going to edit our about me page. And we're going to see what a featured image looks like on this page. Now on the right side, I'm going to scroll down and you'll see the featured image section. Not all theme templates allow for featured images. So I'm going to go ahead and click right there where it says set featured image. And it's going to take me to my media library, but there's another tab up there. If the file isn't already in my media tab library, I can go to upload files and upload them. And the image we're going to use is this backyard garden image. One, it looks like a, houses in it. So I'm going to select that image and you'll notice on the right, it has our alt text, our caption. We could do it now as we're using it. And down at the bottom, if you scroll through, you'll see the description. You have the URL to the image and you can copy that URL. And there's a blue button set featured image. And that's what I'm going to do. So now what I'd like to do is preview the page in the upper right. And I always like to preview in a new tab. And you'll notice where the caption shows on the featured image is right underneath the image. So we're using that placeholder spot, the featured image spot, which is built into the themes template to be in that position for this particular image. And now I've come out of the preview. I'm back on my edit page and I'm going to update this page. I decide to keep that image where it shows on the page. And now I'm going to go back to view pages. Let's go to our post section on the left sidebar. And we are going to edit the what grows in my garden post. And for this post, we're going to add a couple of galleries and also a single image. So what we're going to do is hover in between vegetables in the first paragraph. That's where I want you to hover. And when you get the plus sign there to add a block, we're going to select gallery. And then on the gallery screen, we're going to select media library. So we're going to select our tomatoes on the vine. And we're going to go down and grab our cherry tomatoes and our peppers. So we have three things selected. In the lower right, you'll see that it says create a new gallery. And if you accidentally selected something, you can clear the items down here at the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new gallery. And at this point, you can drag and drop to rearrange everything. So I'm going to just click on my peppers and I'm going to put them in the first position. And in the lower right, insert gallery. So you'll see the gallery of the three photos on the page. Notice that the captions in the gallery are actually on the image, whereas with the featured image, it shows up below. We're going to scroll down on this page. We're not quite done. We're going to hover in between herbs and 
its paragraph and add another gallery block from our media library. So we're going to start by clicking on the first herb, it's time. And then we're going to select our rosemary. Next one is oregano, mint, cilantro, and I think, yeah, if you scroll down, you'll find the basil. And then create a new gallery gives you the opportunity to organize them. So I am going to actually put these in alphabetical order just because I can. And it actually satisfies my OCD. So I have them organized to my satisfaction and I'm going to go ahead and insert the gallery. And then last but not least, we're going to add a single image because I'm only growing strawberries. So I'm hovering between fruit and its paragraph. And I'm going to add just the image block here. Go to my media library. And I'm going to grab the strawberries that are the plant, not the ones in the basket. And select. So the individual image block also puts the caption beneath the image. And so we have two galleries and an image on this page, this post, and we can go ahead and preview it. And it's definitely given this post a lot more visual interest. And now back on the edit page, I'm going to go ahead and update that post. So before we add images to our About My Garden sticky post, let's go back to our media library for a moment. And so on that post, I want to use the basket of peppers and the basket of strawberries. And at this point, it would be nice to have a basket of herbs to also show on that post in a gallery format. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you how to get to open verse and how easy it is to grab these uh, creative content files. So I'm just on a new browser tab and I'm going to just type openverse.org. It already comes up for me. And all I have to do is click in search for content and I'm going to type in basket of herbs and press enter. And so it comes up with all these different image files of baskets of herbs. And I think I am going to select this herb basket. You can select whichever herb. Ooh, I like this one too. <laughs> this is like shopping for me, right? I'm going to go ahead and select the herb basket that looks like this. And I'm going to choose get this image. And it takes me over to Flickr. And on Flickr, I can just click the download this photo button. I'm going to pick the original size there and it just downloads it as a JPEG in my downloads folder. And I'm going to close that Flickr window. While I'm here, I'm going to go back up to the top. I'm going to do X to clear the basket of herbs search. And I'm going to see if there's a better basket of strawberries. Just checking. And I see one that I like better than the one that I originally picked. So this first one on mine is what I'm going to select. I'm going to get the image and download it. Original size.
And while I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead and close that Flickr window. And I'm gonna do one more search here. And it's just gonna be for garden tools. Notice there's audio files on here. And I'm kind of looking for something like this, gardening tools and a watering can, something with some interest. I actually collect watering cans. So this one will suit me nicely. And I'm gonna go ahead and get it. So three files to add to our media library. I'm gonna go ahead and close Flickr and I'm also gonna close the open verse tab. And I'm back in my media library now and I wanna get rid of the strawberries in the basket that we originally had from the files in the video description. I just clicked on it and in the lower right corner, I'm gonna delete that permanently and confirm that deletion. And then up at the top of the screen, I'm gonna add new. I'm gonna just select files this time, make my way to my downloads, and I'm just gonna grab those three files. Now, what I normally do is rename them. So move them to a different location and rename them, but we'll see their images in here. So I'm going to just select the three of them and open and let it upload and crunch them. And once they're in the media library, I'm going to select the um, garden tools one. And I'm going to give it alt text garden tools in a watering can to describe it. I'm going to change the title here to gardening tools and the caption is gardening tools. And then I am going to go to the bath image and here's my new basket of strawberries. And back one more, and that should be our basket of herbs. And then I can go ahead and close that window. So we have our new basket of strawberries, a basket of herbs, and some garden tools. Let's go back to our post page. And now we are going to add a gallery to About My Garden sticky post. So I'm gonna go ahead and edit that. And I am going to hover between the two paragraphs and add the gallery block there. And I can go to my media library and I am going to add the watering can there. And I'm also going to select the basket of herbs the strawberries and then go down and select the basket of peppers and create a new gallery and then go ahead and insert that gallery. And notice that the vegetables in the basket, it's like in its own row here. Uh, the picture's as wide as the three above it. Let's go ahead and update this post.
And then I'm going to use the link to view the post. And it's not bad. I mean, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and fiddle with the size from the media library. And so I'm back in my post and I'm going to go to view post. And then I'm going to go back to my media library. There are some editing capabilities in the library. I'm going to select that basket of vegetables, the wide one. And I can edit the image from the link right underneath the image. So I could scale the image if I wanted to, right? I could crop the image, rotate it, flip it, so on and so forth. And if you look at the question mark to the right of scale image, it will proportionally scale it. So you don't have to worry about that, but it gives you other information that if you're going to scale it, do that before you crop, flip, or rotate the image. They can only be scaled down, not up. Now, again, it's limited editing capabilities in here, but sometimes that's all you need. And in our case, we don't have to change these dimensions. I'm quite okay with it being underneath the other pictures in the gallery. I just wanted the opportunity to show you that you can do some limited editing from within your media library. So I'm going to just do the X in the upper right hand corner there. And now we're going to go and add some images to our categories. And so we're going to start with fruit by editing that category. And in the description section, you're going to select add media. And we're going to select the basket of strawberries. And over on the right, we are going to insert into post. And if you scroll to the very bottom of that screen, you'll see your update button. And once it updates it, it takes you back to the top and it lets you know the category was updated and you can go directly back to all of your categories there. Now notice with this fruit basket, and this happens, it doesn't happen with every image, but sometimes it does. When you add an image to your category, it shows, like I said, on this category page. But if you add categories to your menu, then you'll have category pages on your site and the image will show there as well. Now, even if you have that caption ID and all of that stuff here above it, right? That won't show on the categories page on your site. Now, sometimes it will let you delete that information. If you go back into edit for fruit and you notice before the picture showed up, right? You saw all of that text there. Now this is the thing. Sometimes the text shows up where the picture is. If you go to the text tab on the right, you will see that text. But if you delete that text there, and go back to visual, you'll notice that the picture is also deleted. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna back out of there without updating, go back into edit fruit category. And the trick here, now this doesn't affect it in the media library, is to delete the caption right underneath the picture then go down and update. And when you go back to categories, you won't see all of that extra text. So it's like a weird thing that happens. For me, a weird thing that happens is when it happens sometimes, but not all the time. So anyway, we're gonna go ahead and you're gonna use the basket of herbs for the herb category 
and you're going to use the basket of vegetables for the vegetable category. Go ahead and set those up on your own. So after deleting the captions underneath the images when I added them into the category, I can see that I don't have that extra text. So what I'm going to have you do now, and I'm going to have you do this on your own, I'm going to have you add the images for all of our other categories, starting with basil. For uncategorized, use the question mark image that we have. And you can go ahead and pause the video and get that done. Remember, get rid of any captions under the images because it seems pretty consistent in here that it is showing all that extra text. And so I'm down to the last one that I have to do. So I'm editing tomatoes. And here they are. Now I am not deleting the caption over here on the attachment details because then that deletes the caption from the media library. And since the issue is only on this category screen, once I insert it into the post, I'm just deleting the text that's underneath the image and then updating. And that way I keep my captions in the media library. I'm just removing them from categories. So back on my categories page, you can see all of the images that I used, none of them have that extra distracting text on them. And so we've applied these images to our categories. So the way to add category pages to your site is via the menus. So we're gonna hover over appearance on our left sidebar and click on menus. So when we set up our theme, we set up the primary menu. And if I go to the drop down here and select primary menu, you'll see that we added, let me select it. I always do the drop down and forget to choose the select button. So we have about me and blog on our primary menu at the top of our site. And then because of this setting, automatically add new top level pages to this menu. When we did our articles page, it added that to the primary menu as well. And so up top where it says select a menu to edit, we're gonna do the drop down and select secondary menu and click the select button. And so over on the left side, we're gonna expand categories. And let's just do vegetables under most use tab. We'll do vegetables, herbs, and fruit. Or we could have done select all. And then we'll choose add to menu. And we're not gonna select anything under menu settings. We're just gonna go over to the right and save that menu. Now let's go back to our pages and let's view our about me page. So you see we have about me, our blog, our articles. And if I scroll to the bottom of the page, you'll see our categories. If I click on vegetables for categories, it takes me to that category page with that category image, and it will show you the posts that are categorized as vegetables, even if they're categorized with multiple categories like our two posts are. So that secondary menu resides at the bottom of the page. And I'm gonna just go back and get back to my appearance menus. Now the other thing I could do, and I'm still on my secondary menu here, 
is on the left side, I can expand categories and I could go to the view all page. And since we already have vegetable, herbs, and fruit on there, I'm going to select all at the bottom, unchecked fruit, herbs, and vegetables. And that gives me my uncategorized category as well. And then I'm going to add those to the menu. And now I can organize them. I'm going to drag uncategorized so it's under fruit. And then <laughs> as you're rearranging them, you don't want them to be sub items. So I'm going to do the drop down for basil. If you drag it even a little bit to the right, so I'm going to move it out from under cilantro, it makes it a sub item. And I'm going to collapse that basil again and trying not to move it inwards. I'm going to move it underneath herbs and I can actually indent it there because it is a sub item of herbs. So let me, wow, I'm really messing up this demo. And so I'm going to use the menu to help me navigate. So. I want basil to be a sub item under herbs. So I just kept moving it up until it was directly underneath herbs. And then I did under herbs. So it makes it a sub item. I'm going to go and grab my other herbs and make them sub items under herbs as well. So once I've organized everything, as I was going through it, I realized that I never added my strawberries picture to the strawberry category. So I went and did that. And then I was able to make that a sub item of fruit here. And you want to make sure your menu is saved. And now let's go back to pages and let's view our about me page again. And when we go to the bottom now, So when we click on, here's our categories. When I click on the vegetables category, I'm still seeing the vegetables category page because we made those sub items. We need to assign one of those categories to a post. So I'm going to go back to my post. And so on my post page, I'm going to do a quick edit on the what grows in my garden post. And you can see I can assign the categories there too. So I'm going to just do a check mark in front of strawberries. And I'll also do a check mark in front of basil just for demonstration purposes here. And then I'll update. I'll go back to my pages my about me page, I'm going to view again. And when I go to the bottom this time, you can see the categories that have been selected, right? For any of the posts I have. So if I go to strawberries there, I'll see the category page for strawberries. So that secondary menu is remaining unchanged, vegetables, herbs, fruit, and uncategorized. But as you use more categories on your posts, they will show up here under categories. I'm going to go back to my posts. And I'm going to do a quick edit on what grows in my garden again. And I'm going to uncheck strawberries and basil and then update again. There may be times when you will want to import or export content out of your WordPress or into your WordPress site. For example, you may want to move your site from WordPress.com to WordPress.org or vice versa, 
or you might want to move content from another platform into WordPress, or you might be rebuilding your site and you want to move key content to a clean install or, of WordPress. So there can be other reasons why you would want to do this as well. It's a really simple process. You're able to import and export without having to use any plugins. I mean, out of the core of WordPress, you can do this. You might just have to activate for one or two of these things, as you'll see shortly. So we're going to start with exporting content. And what we're going to do just to make it easy, because many of you viewing this video only have one site and that's fine. So we're going to export some of our content from our current blog site, and then we're going to import it back in so you can see what happens. And it would work the same if you were importing it into another site. So this is the screen you will see when you go to export content. And I have a link at the bottom that will give you some more information on exporting from the wordpress.com support page. So what it does is it creates an XML file for you to save to your computer when you export. And so, and that's extensible markup language. You can use it to communicate between different programs. It's also called WordPress extended RSS or WXR, and it contains your posts, pages, comments, custom fields, categories, and tags. Once you've saved the download file, you can use the import function in another WordPress installation, or in our case, in the same one, to import the content. So you can choose to export everything, or as you'll see when we get in there, you can export one item at a time. Those are option buttons, not check marks. So it's either all content or you just want to export post. And when you select an individual item, it gives you the ability to filter it. So you're not exporting everything. And you'll see that shortly. The next screen is when you go to import. So it can import from other systems as well as from WordPress. So if you have information on a blogger blog, you can import it into WordPress. There's a categories and tags converter there as well. If you have posts on live journal, if you have a movable type or type pad blog, you can get that stuff into WordPress. You can import from an RSS feed from Tumblr using their API and also WordPress. So if the importer you need is not listed and it says that at the very bottom of that screen, you can search for a plugin to see if an importer is available. But these are the ones that come with WordPress core. And at the bottom of this slide, I have a link to WordPress documentation on importing content. On the left sidebar, we're going to hover over tools. And that's where you'll see import and export both reside. Let's go ahead and click on export. And depending on what you have in your site, choose what to export may be a little bit different than the screenshot that was in the slide deck. And so you can choose all content, or if you look at post, if you do the option button in front of posts, it will let you select specific categories, authors, start and end dates, or all, which is the status there, right? You might want to look at just published or draft or scheduled, so on and so forth, private. So you get the filter ability when you select one of these individual options here. We don't have any campaigns that ties into something else. And we do have media. So let's do this. Let's say we want to export just our post. So I'm going to leave everything on all here and just have post option button selected. 
And down at the bottom, I'm going to select Download Export File. So it will come up on your downloads on your browser. And now what we're going to do is go back to our post and let's put our what grows in my garden post in trash. And then I'm going to go to trash by using the link and I am going to delete it permanently. Now we're going to go back to tools and this time we're going to choose import. So this is where you'd have to install. Like if you needed to import posts and things from blogger, you would have to install now, so on and so forth. Now you might have to install your WordPress. I've already had my WordPress importer installed. So if you have to do that, you can, it'd be a link right underneath it. And in my case, I'm going to go ahead and run my importer. And so it's telling me to upload that XML file that's in our downloads. So the only choice I have here is to choose that file which is sitting in my download. It has the name of my site. If I hover over it, you'll see that it is an XML file. I'm going to just double click it there. And once I select it, I can upload the file and import. When you do that, it brings you to the assign author screen, right? So the import author, you can create a new user with a login name here or assign posts to an existing user. I'm going to do the drop down next to select and select my admin user. And then you have to check the box that says download and import file attachments. And then you submit that. Because we told it to export our post, it's letting me know upon import that that about my garden post already exists. I'm going to go back over to post. And you can see that what grows in my garden is back. So when we export it, we exported both of our posts. And then when we import it, it let us know that one was already here. So it's not going to bring it in again. It just brought in the one that we had deleted. And so again, this could be a clean WordPress site. Let's go back to tools and hover over export again. So if you strip down your site or you start a fresh install of WordPress, you can come to this site first and export all the content and then import it into your new site. In module four, we started by adding a new page with links on it to our site. And we went over some of the other page options while we were doing that. We spent most of our time in this module working on the media library. So you learned how to upload pictures to your media library. We also learned how to go ahead and give them alternative text and captions or change the captions that come in with the media. And then we spent time adding some images to our pages and our post. We used featured image, individual images, gallery of images. And then we moved on to adding images to our categories. And we saw that some of that extra description text showed up in our categories list. 
So we learned how to delete the caption from underneath the picture, not from the caption on the sidebar that ties to the media library so that we could clean that up in our category page. After we assigned pictures to our categories, we were able to go ahead and create category pages by modifying the secondary menu in our theme. So that way your users will have the ability to see all of the posts that are assigned to a particular category on that particular category page on your site. And we ended up learning how to first export content. We exported our post and then we went in and deleted one of our posts and then we imported our post by accessing the XML file that we had downloaded. So our fifth module will focus on plugins. Specifically, we'll break them down, like what are they? We've already talked a little bit about plugins. You'll learn how to install plugins. And then we'll go over the must have pack of plugins. Now, the must have pack of plugins varies depending on who you ask. So I'm going to provide you with a list of what I consider to be the must have pack of plugins, depending on what you're going to be using your site for. Earlier in the course, when you were introduced to the WordPress family, you learned that plugins are considered to be the children of the family. Also earlier, we talked about how the WordPress core does not by on its own have much functionality. So plugins allow you to add new functionality or extend existing functionality on your site, allowing you to create virtually any kind of website from e-commerce stores to portfolios, to directory sites, to blog sites. Plugins literally plug into your WordPress site. So on our left sidebar, let's hover over plugins and go to installed plugins. So these are the ones that come with the core. And you notice that there's an anti-spam plugin. It's used to protect your blog from spam. Keeps your site protected even while you sleep. And even though it comes with the core, if you want to use it, it needs to be activated. It also lets you know that it will automatically update whenever an update comes out for that particular plugin, it will automatically update. That's been enabled on your Bluehost settings page. And so before we get to installing new plugins, let's go ahead and activate our anti-spam plugin. And for this particular plugin, you need to use Jetpack to connect to it. So that's another plugin that comes out of the box. We're gonna go connect with Jetpack on the right side. And now you're being prompted to log in with your WordPress.com account. So I've gone through all the steps. Um, it sent me an email and I got to the email and it gave me a link to log in. And so now I'm on this screen and I'm going to approve this. So it's letting you know that it'll be able to view user information data, username, name, email, blog, and Gravatar. I'm gonna go ahead and click on approve. And so once you're in, you have a series of tabs across the top. You're looking at your account overview. It, I have it hiding some personal information on this screen. And then it's features, pricing. We're using the free version, developers help blog. And then activate is where we're going to go. So on this page, right here in the green box, if you already have the Akismet plugin, installed and activated on your WordPress site, you can skip to step five. Since we went through Jetpack, 
we can go down to step five here and we don't really have anything to do. It's just telling us where to go to find it in WordPress. So here you're going to go under Jetpack, and then you'll see that a Kismet anti-spam. So I'm going to go back to WordPress. And now over on the left, I'm going to click on Jetpack. And you'll see that you have the Akismet anti-spam option under Jetpack. Now it's still saying connect with Jetpack, but I think it's active on the site now. Let me check that. So I clicked on dashboard under Jetpack and then I went back to Akismet anti-spam. And now it lets me know that it's active and ready to stop spam. And this is where I would come if I wanted to see statistics. Now our site is not out to the public yet, so nothing will be here. But I think it's pretty clear on walking you through how to activate a plugin. Most of the time, it's pretty clear. So you shouldn't have any problems with that. We're going to do others. We're going to look at some of the others that came with Core. Back on the plugin screen, if I wanted to deactivate anti-spam, I could just do it there. Google Analytics requires you to have a Google Analytics account that's already set up before it will work with this plugin here. So I'm going to actually deactivate mine and I'm going to just say other and submit and deactivate because I'm not going to be using it in here. And then Hello Dolly really doesn't do anything for you other than put a little bit of a smile on your face. So what it does is it randomly displays lyrics from the Louis Armstrong song, Hello Dolly, on every screen that you're on while you're working in admin. So we can just activate that and see its effect. And now if you look up on the right at the top, Underneath your site status tab, you'll see a lyric from Hello Dolly, Promise You'll Never Go Away. And then if I go to, let's say, to a different screen, if I go to Pages, it's so nice to have you back where you belong. If I go back to Plugins, I feel the room swaying. And this one is really, like I said, it doesn't really do anything other than bring some levity into your day. For me, it's particularly special now, this plugin, because I learned how to play Louis Armstrong's Hello Dolly on my keyboard about two weeks ago. And the last one we're going to look at in the ones that come with WordPress core is all the way at the bottom, Yoast SEO. So we've been seeing Yoast information everywhere we look. When we're going into a page to edit it, we're seeing information in there about SEO. So we just need to finish your first time configuration for this one. So I am going to go ahead and click on that. So one of the things I want to point out is that this little pop up here, get the most out of Yoast SEO. If you want to optimize even further with the help of their SEO experts, you can sign up for a free weekly webinar and there's a register now link right there. For your first time configuration, it wants you to tell us about your site so we can get your site ranked, right? It says, the Yoast Indexable Squad can't wait to get your site in tip-top shape for the search engines. Help us and take these five steps in order to put our Yoast Indexables to work. So other than giving a brief description of SEO, we don't really go deep into SEO in this course at all. So it's saying the first step here, it's already done. It's analyzing your site just like Google does and it's running the SEO data optimization. It says it will immediately improve technical issues without you needing to do anything. So it's already done it. It successfully analyzed our site. 
can move to the next step. So I'm going to click on continue there. And so your site representation, I'm going to say that it represents a person, this particular blog site, there's the website name, right? I can select a user. And it has personal logo or avatar. So it's taking me to my media library there and I don't want to represent myself that way. So I can always come back in and get this information. I'm going to just choose save and continue here. Oh, well, it's not going to let me do that. So I'm going to just make myself a question mark for right now so I can get past the screen. And I can always come back in and replace the image. Let's see, I think I have everything else there. And now social profiles, you can add your social profiles to this profile. So you're, you know, if you have Twitter, or Facebook, stuff like that. And I just went to continue there. So now it's on personal preferences. You can either allow or disallow it, which is the default for it to collect anonymous information about your website and how you use it. Gives you information about what will be tracked if you say yes. You can also sign up for the newsletter down here. I'm going to just do save and continue. And now it's able to do a lot of optimization for your site already. And so you can register here for the free weekly webinar if you'd like to, right? So this one's pretty simple to get it configured for the first time. You're just following the steps. And now on the left, you can, under Yoast SEO, you notice a couple of these workouts and redirects, or you would have to upgrade to premium for that but you can work that menu there. You can go to general, right? And it's showing me that it couldn't detect any serious problems, which is good. I have no new notifications. And that's on the dashboard tab here. And I can go to settings. And it brings me to this panel. Welcome to your new Yoast SEO settings. I can go next on here. It's giving me some information. They've moved things around with this upgraded version. And I'm just nexting my way through there and then got it, right? So it's just giving you some navigational information. And then also under Yoast, you have integrations, tools, and premium. And you can take a moment and look at those categories. And so when I'm on the tool screen, I see that SEO data optimization is complete. So those are the plugins. I'm going to go back to the plugins page. Again, those are the plugins that come with the core. Now, the next section that we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to find and install other plugins. The last lesson in this course is the must have pack of plugins. And again, that list can vary depending on who you ask. So I have a Word document in the files for video description. And if it's in the same directory as your PowerPoint, if you have the PowerPoint open, you'll be able to open that Word document. Otherwise, I have it up on my screen, so no problem. We just activated and it's, um, activated Yoast SEO so that works for search engine optimization. The next one on this list is called Updraft Plus. Now it has both free and premium versions. It actually has a few different premium plans and it can help you by backing up your site. So the thing about Updraft and just some background information you should know an estimate of 13,000 websites gets hacked every day. So 
Also, parts of your WordPress website can sometimes stop working due to simple errors. So if you have a recent backup, it can save you a ton of headaches, whether you've been attacked, encounter a compatibility issue, or simply want to migrate your site. It can create automatic or manual backups of your website. You can store your backups locally or in the cloud. You can restore your website to a previous state from a backup. And we are going to actually install that one when we go back into WordPress. There's some more on this list. Optimal has both free and premium versions. The premium version is $22.50 a month, which is charged annually as of this writing. So check your pricing because it can change. Because images can take up more than 50% of the average web page size, optimizing your images can make a huge difference to your site's page load time. If your website takes more than three seconds to load, the bounce rate can reach 38%. And so Optimal will take every graphic you upload and optimize it so that it takes up less space. It uses a cloud-based system to speed up your site. It auto detects the screen size and resizes images to provide fast loading and a responsive experience to your users. So if they're accessing the site from a mobile device, it's responsive to that. The third one is revive old post. And in this document, you'll see that this one refers to social media. So social media is the source of over 30% of referral traffic to most websites. You can share your new and old posts to Twitter and Facebook automatically from your site. You can set a schedule for your social media publications and include hashtags and links back to your website on those posts. Revive Old Posts has both free and premium versions, and there are three premium plans as of this writing. We have WP Rocket, and that's a caching plugin that helps you speed up your loading times. I'll let you read the rest of those details on your own. Elementor is a visual page builder that gives you the ability to craft original designs for your pages that are somewhat independent of your current theme. So it works with all WordPress themes. You can select from over 300 templates from its library. It has responsive designs and also free and premium versions. WP Forms is another one that comes with the core. The free version comes with the core. Of course, it has a premium version. And it gives you the ability to build beautiful forms. It's very user-friendly and it's responsive for mobile devices. Has a lot of pre-built form templates and you can create a form for free if you're using the free version. Otter is another one. Gutenberg was the replacement for the WordPress classic editor. So it adds useful extra functionality to Gutenberg. You can add Google Maps and advanced heading blocks. You can use it to also create an attractive contact form. And it has 30 plus Gutenberg blocks for unique pages and it is free. Redirection is the other one here. You know, if you've ever tried to go to a website and there's something wrong with it, you get that 404 error, can't find the page. So that makes for a bad user experience. Redirection is a redirect manager for WordPress. It lets you set up custom redirects within your website and then keeps a full record of data on clicks. You can use it to track broken URLs on your site so you don't get those 404 broken pages. It will show you a list of pages that are 404s and all you need to do is enter the URL where you want redirection to redirect the visitor. And that is free. And you've seen Monster Insights messages popping up all over WordPress. And this helps you get to know your audience so you can grow your business. 
It's based on the user's behavior on your website. So you can adjust your marketing strategy in order to improve engagement and conversions. Really useful when you're having, like if you have an e-commerce site, it's integrated with Google Analytics, which I mentioned you must have an account. So you can get all the relevant data about your visitors. You can see what content on your site performs best and which pages need improvement. You can create an audience profile, which includes demographics, education, gender, age, and interest. Learn about your visitors' behavior, like how they find your site, how much time they spend there, what links they click on, what keywords they search for, and more. And it has free and premium versions. As of this writing, there are three premium plans. So on the left side under plugins, we're going to click on add new. And from here, you can look at featured, popular, recommended favorites, or premium ones. You also have the ability to search. So in that search box, I'm going to type updraft and press enter. And you'll see that the Updraft Plus WordPress Backup plugin pops up. And I'm going to choose Install Now. And then I can choose Activate. It takes me back to Installed Plugins, and it's in the list. And notice you have these options underneath it. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Settings there. When you get to this screen, you'll notice that you have tabs going across the top, right? So let's go to migrate clone tab first, and it gives you the ability to create a temporary clone on their servers of your site. Now you have to have credit in your account in order to be able to do that. You can also, they're recommending that you can try out their migrator add on. So that can perform a direct site to site migration. Like if you're using, you want to migrate this site to another host or something like that. Let's go to settings. And this is where you can set up a backup schedule, right? So I'm going to leave mine on manual for the files, right? But you see the different choices you have there. And the same for the database backup schedule. So this is for files. This is for your database. Remember your database contains everything that's on your site. And then down here, you get to choose your remote storage location. So you have all of these choices, right? Google cloud, Google drive, Google drive is what I'm selecting. And when you scroll down, it's letting you know here that it will create a folder called Updraft Plus. You can rename it if you want in your Google Drive. So everything, all your backups will be in that folder. You can authenticate. You have to sign in with Google. You have to authenticate. I've already authenticated. So you can go through that process if you are using Google Drive. And you can tell it what to include in the files backup. And then you have some things that you can exclude from uploads if you like. And then there's the other directories. Remember that WP dash content folder that I showed you, right? And you have the choice to exclude there as well. So once you're done on this page, you're going to go to the bottom and save the changes. After all of that is set up, I'm coming back to the back up slash restore tab. And I am going to click on backup now. And I get this perform a backup dialogue. Everything is checked except for the bottom one. Only allow this backup to be deleted manually. So, for example, keep it even if retention limits are hit. 
I'm going to leave my default check. So it's including the database, the files, and it's sending it to remote storage. And I'm going to click on backup now. And you'll see the progress going across the bottom. And when it's done, you'll see the last log message there. It apparently succeeded and it's now complete. And then you'll see under existing backups, the backups, right? And from here, I can delete a backup. I can view the log or I can restore from here should I get hacked or run into another problem. And you can see in my Google Drive, there is an Updraft Plus folder and it has my backups in it. So all five of those categories are in a separate zip folder here. This one is uploads, this one is themes, plugins, others, and the database. And the last thing I want to talk about is once you've built up your site, when you're ready, you can launch your site. Now I'm on the plugin screen and I have this pop up here. They've showing all over the place, right? Once you already launch your site up here, if I click on the site status coming soon, I can click on that to launch my site. However, I will tell you this, if you're on a hosted site like I am, you don't have the ability, well, you do have the ability if you launch it, say by accident, you realize, oh my goodness, I didn't mean to do that. If it weren't hosted, you would be able to come over to the left and go down to settings and under general settings, you would find a privacy area. So it's not there because this is hosted, right? And so this privacy link that would be here under settings is only for that privacy page, that privacy policy page. So if you launch your site and you want to quote unquote unlaunch it, that could be a little bit challenging, but there are ways to do it. There are plugins that you can use to put like a coming soon page up, or you can go back to your pages and posts and change them from public to private or draft. So there are ways to unlaunch your site, but just takes a little bit more when it's hosted. So if you don't want to do this step because you're not ready to launch your site, you don't have to, but I'm gonna go ahead and click on launch my site here. And when I do that, it comes to this, welcome to your WordPress site, right? And it has all of these things, what they recommend before launching your site, right? And then the last thing on the list is launch with confidence. And when you select that, then you get the launch your site button. So like I mentioned, the options for private coming soon, and draft are not underneath the settings like you know I talked about because it's hosted. But once you launch it, you can come back here to restore your coming soon page if you want it to. And I'm gonna show you other ways of doing this as well. So when I go to visit my site, it's letting me know the site status is live here. I'm gonna go back over here and get back into WordPress. And if I wanted to just have some of my pages or posts not showing on my site, everything is live now. I could go to post. And you know, my post screen is kind of messed up. I'm gonna to go to edit for that first post. So at the post or page level, where the visibility on the right is public, I can change it to private there, which means it would only be visible to site admins and editors, right? Or password protected, only those with the password can view this post. 
The other thing I can do, but up at the top, I can switch it to a draft. So if I click on this, what grows in my garden and switch it to a draft, it's unpublishing that post because, and I'll click OK and let it update. So in that case, it's a draft, it's not showing. What I normally do is, I'm gonna come back over here, so it's still saying public over here, but what I normally do, instead of saving it as a draft, I say I make it private if I want other people to be working on it and fixing it. It's still not visible to the general site visitor. So that's normally how I handle that. And back on my post page, when I scroll down, I can see that this about my garden is published, but it does it's not saying published now for what grows in my garden. That's kind of how that works. And I've gone back, I just clicked on that live link on the tab in the upper right. So I'm back on this let's set up your site page and I can restore the coming soon page from there. So now, and that might take a moment to update, it's still saying live there, but it should all be coming soon now again. So there are ways of accidentally on purpose publishing your site and then realizing it and having to go back either at the page or the post level, you can do it that way, or you can come back to this screen. And I just went from that screen to my post screen and you can see that the tab now says coming soon again. So in this final module, we focused mostly on plugins. You learned a little bit about more. We kind of touched on this earlier, but what they are and how to go about activating ones that come with the core of WordPress and we activated a few of them, the anti-spam one, Yoast SEO, Akismet. And then you learned how to add a new plugin and walk through the steps of grabbing that, getting it installed and using it. And that was after we went over the must have pack of plugins and that's how we got Updraft Plus for our backups. And then I reviewed how to launch your site. And if you launch it by accident, how to change it back to coming soon so that users that hit upon your URL will see that coming soon landing page. So I'd like to thank everyone for viewing this WordPress course. Again, my name is Trish Connor Cato. And it's been my pleasure to present this video to you. In the fourth module, we created another page using links to articles. And then we spent a lot of time working with our media library, uploading files to the media library, adding alternative text and captions to those image files. And you learned that I grabbed those images from openverse.org, which you can get to through wordpress.org as well. We actually later on went into openverse and got some more images. So you learned how to walk through that process as well. And then after we had all of our images in, we added images to our pages and posts individual images, galleries, featured image. And then we also went back and added images to our categories so that those images would show on our site when a user accesses a category page. They also show on the category screen. And we learned the little glitch where we had to delete the caption from underneath the image for the category, but not from 
the attachment detail screen. We ended that module by learning how to export and import content. And then we started our last module and we learned more details about plugins, how to activate plugins that come with the core, and also how to install a new plugin and get it set up. We reviewed the must have pack of plugins. After that, we talked about how to launch your site and then put it back to a coming soon state. Hello everyone. My name is Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the WordPress video course. And we'll begin this course by using the blog site we created in the WordPress beginner course. Securing your site is of the most importance and you will learn how to apply the principles of WordPress security to your site. Security is so important. We will cover it thoroughly in the first of the six modules in this course. The second module will be dedicated to learning factors to consider when you're choosing a theme for your site before locating and installing themes for your website. The theme is an important part of the user experience as it controls most of the appearance of your website. In module three, you'll learn ways to further customize the appearance and design of your website by customizing menus, using widgets, learning to use the WordPress customizer, and finally exploring AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages plugins to enhance the user experience when they're accessing your site from a mobile device. Now this course is designated for anyone new to WordPress or who is self-taught on the product you would gain from taking this course. You don't need any prior web development or programming skills. It's designed for non-technical users who are more interested in content management and search engine optimization than the technical aspects of website creation. Module one is all about securing your WordPress website. Now I should mention that this slide deck is in the video description. It has some good information in it for your future reference. So this module has a total of seven lessons and I'm going to divide them into two groups. So the first three lessons are in group one and this is going over the principles of WordPress security. And then you'll learn best practices for WordPress security. And then after that, you'll learn some security plugins that can be used to help secure your website. And after that, we'll go ahead and put these principles and practices in action on our site by grabbing those plugins, activating them, and upping the security on our website. The second group of lessons deal with user accounts. So when we get to the second group, you'll learn how to set up secure user accounts. You'll learn about user roles and abilities, how to manage users, and then we'll use some user management plugins that can help you manage your users. So let's start by reviewing the principles of WordPress security. I have about five of them in this slide deck. So the first one is integrity, and that means that you ensure data is not tampered or altered by unauthorized users. Your hosting provider has some responsibility as the files and database are on their servers. So you want to look for a host that offers up to date server software, malware monitoring and removal, firewalls and other security measures. 
making sure that you get all of your WordPress plugins and themes from trusted sources lends itself to integrity on your site. You want to avoid them if they haven't been updated over the last year or more, have less than a few hundred installations, or receive low ratings. And I've included on this slide links to two different WordPress.org sites where you can find the approved plugins and the themes. Another way to ensure integrity on your site is backing up your site. Your host may offer backups and WordPress itself includes the Updraft Plus plugin, which you can use for backups. The second principle is availability. And this means that you ensure systems and data are available to authorize users when they need it. Using solid hosting with good uptime is one way to ensure this. Your host should have measures in place to reduce the damage of denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks. These are attacks in which your web server is inundated with traffic in an attempt to knock your site offline. Not only do you need to have backups, you need the ability to restore the backups when you need them. And ensuring users can access what they need requires that the site be online and that users have appropriate permissions. The next principle is minimize attack surface. The attack surface describes all of the different points where an attacker could get into a system and where they could get data out. For a WordPress website, that means all the software that makes up your website, the data it contains, and the ways the software and data can be accessed. So one way is to remove unnecessary plugins, themes, and users from your website. And by the way, deactivating plugins and themes is not enough. You would also need to delete them to minimize attack surface. And you would want to check your web server for unnecessary files via your hosting provider's file manager system. We have two principles left. This one is defense in depth. The principle of defense in depth means that you have multiple layers of defense. Even if a hacker gets through one or more layers, there are other layers that will stop them. Your web host should have multiple layers of security. If you're not comfortable with your host security, you can consider a WordPress security plugin as well. Our last principle is confidentiality. And it simply means that you only allow access to data for which the user is permitted. You would ensure that legitimate users can only access as much as they need to, and illegitimate users cannot access anything. Ways that you can do this are by using strong passwords and two-factor authentication. Cryptography is a tool to protect confidentiality as well. You encrypt data and only authorized users can decrypt it. When you add SSL slash TLS to your site, that encrypts data flowing between the user's browser and the web server. Don't save your WordPress password in an unencrypted file. And access control protects confidentiality. Each person who needs access to your site should have their own separate WordPress account. And confidentiality in WordPress acts off of the principle of least privilege. Do not grant a user account, process, or program more access rights than it needs to accomplish its designated task. In terms of a typical WordPress website with a blog, Think of your editors, authors, contributors, and subscribers. Each of them needs access to more or less of your website's back end. The principle of least privilege is also known as the principle of least authority, the principle of minimal privileges, 
or the least privileged user account. And you can also, to ensure confidentiality and enforce user accountability, you can use an activity log plugin to keep a log of all the changes that users do on your WordPress website. It helps you with troubleshooting as well as with user accountability. So now that we have the principles of WordPress security behind us, just a reminder, the slide deck is in the files for the video description, so you can always reference it on your own. We need to discuss best practices for WordPress security. When we get hands-on later in this module in WordPress, we want to have these options under our belt, and you'll see that when we start doing exercises, we will be enabling some of these best practices. So best practices, you can see them here on the slide. You want to have secure hosting. You know, the host has the responsibility for a lot of your security. You want to be able to back up your website in case it's necessary to have to restore it. You want to avoid certain usernames like admin, your real or nickname, anything based on personal information or the title of your site. You want to have very strong passwords. You'll learn how to lock down your login page and you can enable two-step authentication for further security. You can also automatically log out idle users, add security questions to the WordPress login, and have it scanned, have your site scanned for malware and vulnerabilities. You wanna update themes and plugins, and you'll see how that's done. I have the asterisk next to some of these items, like disable file editing, disable PHP file execution, change WP database prefix, it automatically starts with WP underscore, and also disable directory indexing and browsing. And that is because we're gonna discuss those in more detail. Just to expand on these best practices that I asked the risk on the previous slide, disable file editing can be done two ways, as well as disabling PHP file execution in certain directories. So disable file editing. Within WordPress itself, you have a set of theme and plugin editors that you can use. Now, many WordPress users aren't programmers and will never use these editors. Hackers, however, can use the editor to execute malicious code or delete entire parts of your website. So disabling that file editing function, if you're able to, and if you are not going to be editing any themes and plugins on your own through coding, it's wise to disable them. So again, there's two ways to do it. I will go over both ways with you when we get hands-on. Now the disabling PHP file execution in certain directories, let's break it down a little bit. PHP stands for Hypertext Preprocessor and it's a scripting language. Hackers can upload malware to your website in an attempt to break in. Disabling PHP in certain directories will stop the malware from running. So it goes on to tell you about how there are multiple PHP files in your WordPress website. And these files exist to allow users to enter in custom PHP code to execute on pages. So if you want to disable PHP file execution in certain directories, there is a link there that will show you the long way of doing it, but there is also another way that I'm going to show you to do it as well. And both disable file editing and disable PHP file execution can be handled with a plugin that we're going to use on our site. Now at the bottom, we have directory browsing and indexing. It means that people can view the content of the individual folders on your website. 
So for you to see if directory browsing is disabled, first of all, this is what it looks like when it's enabled. You will have an index and it shows all of the folders, right? And so you may have been on websites where you can actually see that. We want to disable that functionality there. And my hosting provider, I'm using Bluehost, automatically disables directory browsing. If you want to check to see if it is enabled in your address bar, you can type HTTPS colon slash slash your domain. And in this example, it's example.com and then slash WP hyphen includes slash. So if you type that in and press enter, if you see a list of folders, it means that directory browsing is enabled. If it is disabled, you will see a forbidden page. So when I use that in my browser's address bar with my domain, I get forbidden and it was done at my host level. I didn't have to do anything to make that happen, meaning that it is disabled. And last but not least, another thing that you can do as a security best practice is to change your WP database prefix. So everything is stored in your WordPress database, which means it is every hacker's favorite target. Spammers and hackers run automated codes for SQL injections. Many people forget to change the database prefix while when they install WordPress. This makes it easier for hackers to plan a mass attack by targeting the default prefix which is WP underscore. So you can change your database prefix and you can do that while you're setting up your site. But if your site is already established, you can do it after the fact as well. Now I have a link on this page that will take you to step-by-step -step instructions. I'll show you part of the way of doing this, but if you want to do this on your own, you can follow these instructions from the link on the slide. Now, my hosting provider has also automatically done this for me. So I don't actually have to go through this process. Sometimes you'll find that your provider automatically takes care of this for you. So the way that we are going to enable our security best practices is by using a variety of plugins some of which are included in WordPress core and others we will actually go in and find and download. So the plugins that we're going to be using, we're going to be using the free versions. Many of them have an upgraded premium version for a cost. So the first one we're going to use is updraft plus it comes with the WordPress core and it's going to be used to back up your site and also to restore your site if necessary. Then we're gonna use Security Scanner. That's an auditing and monitoring system that keeps track of everything that happens on your site. And through its screens, we will be able to disable file editing and disable PHP file execution. And then we have a series of plugins that we're gonna to use to lock down the login page. We're going to use limit login attempts reloaded to limit the number of login attempts. Mini orange two factor will set up both two step authentication and it has the ability to ask security questions on the login screen. Um, there are a bunch of separate plugins for two step authentication. There are plugins for security questions. This is one that includes both components. We're going to use inactive logout to automatically log out inactive users. We are going to use WPS hide login, which allows you to change your URL to whatever you want. I actually have a link there where you can get all the information about how to use it. We will discuss it when we get hands on and you'll see the difference between that and something else that we're going to be doing. And then we're going to use the WP activity log to log all user activity. And you know, it ensures user accountability. 
And then Jetpack is also one that's included in the core, and that's overall security, and it includes a Kismet anti-spam. To get started, this is my site as I left it at the end of the WordPress beginner course. So it is a simple blog site. It doesn't have a lot of posts. It doesn't have a lot of pages. It has some media and already has a theme applied to it. I'm going to start this by giving you a brief tour of my site in case you didn't take the beginner course and build this site. So you'll know the starting point that we're working with in this course. Now, later in this course, we're going to change this from a blog site to multiple different kinds of websites, as you saw in the course description. So for right now, it's a blog site only. And on the left, I'm going to start by going to my pages. And you can see that I have an about me page, which is my front page. I have an articles page, which has links on it. And I have a blog page where my blog posts show up. That's it. This privacy policy page is comes by default. I haven't enabled it at all. So those are the three pages that I have. Now, just to get a quick view, my site has not been published. If anybody goes to my URL, they just get coming soon at this point. So you see my site status up here, coming soon. This is my About Me page. I have some media there, picture there. That is not my garden, I wish. And you'll notice as I scroll down at the bottom, there's a search box. This is all part of the theme that I have selected. It's showing the recent posts, any recent comments. And then I actually have a secondary menu that shows at the bottom based on my categories. So I can go to vegetables down there and get my category page, which also I have assigned pictures to categories. And so both of my posts have all three of my categories attached to them. They're just generic posts at this point. Now at the top, I have my main menu, which if I want to go back to that about me page, I can also go to my blog page from here, from the main menu, and it just shows my blogs. And then I have that articles page, which I said has some links on it that open in a different window to articles about gardening. And now I'm back on my site and I'm on my post page. And I just want to point out again, if you didn't take the beginner course, because of the resolution I need to use for this video, for some reason, my post page is weird. So all of these options, like I'll go back to my pages page. When I hover over a page, you see these edit, quick edit, trash view, blaze options. On my post page, they are vertical. Well, they're horizontal, but it's just kind of skewed because of my resolution. But I only have a couple of posts, as you saw on my blogs page. Then I'm going to go over to categories and in the beginner course, we added all of these categories. We made some of them hierarchical. So under fruit, for example, is strawberries under herbs, there's basil, cilantro, mint, so on and so forth. And we actually added some media representing those things. I used a question mark for the uncategorized category. And you can see that I have the vegetables category. That's the picture that shows up on the vegetables category page. And then each vegetable in the hierarchy has its own picture. And I'm going to just go here to appearance. And the theme that I'm using on this is called the 2021 theme, which you saw has the two menus the primary and then the secondary menu at the bottom of the page. And lastly, and I included this in the files for the video description, 
all the media that I used in the beginning course. So it's all in the files in the video description if you want to add them if necessary to your media library in WordPress. So the first thing we are going to do before we begin implementing our best practices for WordPress security is create a backup of our site. Now, WordPress core comes with a plugin called Updraft Plus. So if you go to your plugins on the left and you scroll down, you'll see your installed plugins Updraft Plus should be in that list and it may not be activated. So where mine says deactivate, you may have an activate link to click on so that you can go through and activate it. And then you can go through its settings so that you can tell it where to store your backed up files. So in my case, you can store them locally. You can back up to Amazon S3, Dropbox. In my case, I'm using Google Drive. In Google Drive, it creates a folder called Updraft Plus where it stores my backups in it. There's more places that you can store as well. So if you need to take a moment, you can pause the video, go ahead and get your Updraft Plus activated and set up to where you wanna store your backups. Now, while I'm still on the installed plugins page, I'm going to direct your attention to the column where it's talking about automatic updates. And you'll notice that my host, Bluehost, automatically updates any plugins that I have. So from my Blue hosting site, my updates for all of my plugins are automatically enabled. And that's one of the things you want to keep an eye on because you want to make sure that you have the latest version of a plugin. And that's mostly for security purposes. If you do not see Updraft Plus in your list of installed plugins, on the left sidebar, you can go to add new under plugins. And then you can just type it in the search box. And it will give you, if it's not already installed, that's why you would be searching for it here. It will give you an install now button, like on this WP Optimize one. Mine is already active, so active is dimmed out. But just so you know, you can always grab it. Again, it's a free version, but you can upgrade to premium if necessary. Now, once you have it installed and activated and you've gone through the settings, you should have Updraft Plus on your top toolbar to the right of your need help. And you can look at that drop down. You can go to Backup Restore, Migrate Clone Settings. I'm going to go to Backup Restore there. And all of those other options from that drop down, I can get to from the form of these tabs running across the top. So, the first thing I want to do is go to the settings tab. So this is where you can set up your files backup schedule and your database backup schedule. It defaults to manual and it retains two scheduled backups for each type. So you can change that for when you want your backups to happen. So everywhere from every two hours to monthly you can change it too for both files and database. And I would encourage you to give some thought to this. When do you want your backups to happen automatically? And then now you know where to go, where you can set that schedule and how many backups it should retain. Now you would need to upgrade to Updraft Premium, Updraft Plus Premium, if you want to fix the time at which a backup should take place or if you want to take incremental backups or to configure more complex schedules. Here you can't set a time, you can just set a when and how many to retain. If you scroll down on that settings page, this is where you get to choose your remote storage. You can see that mine is set for Google Drive. 
And underneath all of those options, it lets you know that you would also need to upgrade to premium if you need the ability to send a backup to more than one destination. You can do that through Updraft Plus Premium. So here's my Google Drive information. So it's putting it in a folder called Updraft Plus, which I'm fine with. You would need to upgrade to premium in order to set a custom folder name. I'm already authenticated with Google. I have a privacy blocker over my email there. And as I continue to scroll down, you'll see that it's including plugins, themes, and uploads in the files backup. I can add some exclusions if I want to add exclusion rules. So at the bottom, it's offering you premium so you can have uh, encryption on your database backup. You can have a email sent, a basic report sent to your site's admin email address, which I have blocked there. And then you have some expert settings that you can go over. So I'm back on the backup restore tab and I'm going to just show you my last log message. I deleted a file a little bit earlier today. So that's what's showing there just a little while ago. Actually, I deleted a backup file. So I have my last log message showing that I have a previous backup that's in my Google drive. So this leads me to, let's say something awful happens to your site and you have to restore it. You come right here and you can get to your restore button right there. And then you'll be able to choose what you want to restore. So I'm going to scroll back up just a little bit and I'm going to click on that blue backup now button. And it brings me to perform a backup dialogue. By default, include your database and your files in the backup and sending the backup to remote storage are checked. And then you have the option of checking only allow this backup to be deleted manually. So in other words, keep it even if retention limits are a hit. So I'm going to leave the default checkboxes and click on backup. Now you'll see that it's creating the file backup. It's going to run that process and upload files to remote storage. So to give you a brief pop-up, letting you know that the backup is done. And when that disappears, your last log message is updated. It, it apparently succeeded and it's now complete. And if I scroll down, I have my limit set to two. So I have my two backups. So what happens if I do another backup? The earliest one would automatically be rolled off of there. My March 22nd one would roll off of there because I have a limit set to two to retain. So now that we've backed up our site, it's safe to go ahead and do some of the other things that we want to do for our site security. So this is my updraft plus folder in my Google drive and you'll see, so I'm retaining two backups. You can see the dates. This is the first set of backups. These are the ones that I just did. And so you have different files for each date. This is uploads. If you hover over them, themes, plugins, others, and then the database itself. So that's how it looks in updraft plus folder in Google drive. So two of our best practices are disabling file editing and disabling PHP file execution. And there are ways that you can manually do both of those things by editing some of the files from your host file manager, or you can use a plugin to do both of those things. Now we're going to ultimately end up using the plugin, but I just want to show you how you would do it. We'll focus on disabling file editing first. So if I hover over appearance on my left sidebar, you'll notice that there is a theme file editor and I can click on that theme file editor. It gives me a heads up here. So 
You appear to be making direct edits to your theme in the WordPress dashboard. It is not recommended. Editing your theme directly could break your site and your changes may be lost in future updates. If you need to tweak more than your theme CSS, you might want to try making a child theme. If you decide to go ahead with direct edits anyway, use a file manager to create a copy with a new name and hang on to the original. That way you can re-enable a functional version as something goes wrong. So I'm going to say on this one, I understand, but I'm not going to touch anything in here. So it's showing me what theme I'm in, right? And I can literally come in here and start playing around with this code or worse than that, a hacker can do it. And so this is why you would want to disable file editing so that you don't have the ability, especially if you're not used to coding, you don't want to come mess around in here, not knowing what you're doing. And there's a plugin that will disable this for you. So that's your theme editor, right? But you also have under plugins, you also have a plugin file editor. So this is the same thing. I'm getting a heads up here on this one. I'm going to say, go back. And it put me back on that theme one. So I'm going to just click on themes under appearance to get out of that editor. So. The way you would disable it by modifying a specific file is you have to go to your host site. So in my case on the left, I can just click on blue host and click on home there. And then I can do the menu to get to the blue host control panel by clicking on that icon. And so again, my hosting provider is Bluehost. Most hosting providers have access to their file manager. I can only speak to Bluehost right now. So on the left side, I'm going to click on advanced. And it takes me to what Bluehost calls it C panel, right? On the left side under advanced, I'm going to click on file manager. And this is where you're seeing everything that's in your website. This is how it is organized in the Bluehost file manager on my end. So if I wanted to disable file editing, I would have to modify a file that is called wp-config.php. And that file would be found in my public HTML folder. So on the left side, I'm going to click on that folder. And so I actually double clicked on it. So you can see the contents of that folder. And so again, the file that we would be looking to edit here is called WP dash config PHP. Now, before you edit any of these files, you would want to create a backup of the file. So I'm going to walk through the steps of what you would do if you wanted to do this manually. I'm not actually going to do it and you'll see how I'm going to do that in just a moment because we want to use a plugin to do this, but to create a backup of this WP config.php file, I'm going to just right click on it and I'm going to copy it. Before I do that, if you're not seeing that file in your list on your public underscore HTML folder, you may need to go up to settings all the way. This is in Bluehost anyway, all the way to the right at the top, there's settings and you would want to check show hidden files and then save that. And then if you go into that directory again, it should show that file. So once you have that WP hyphen config dot PHP file, I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to copy it. So it wants to know where I want to copy it to. Well, I have a folder in here called ETC 
and this is just temporary for me because I'm not really going through with this. So I'm going to just select everything that's in there for public HTML. I'm going to do the slash and then ETC if my fingers are on the right keys. And then another slash. And I copy that file. So now on the left, I'm going to double click my ETC folder and you see I have that WP dash config dot PHP file in there. Now this one, if I change this one, it's not going to impact anything. It has to be in that public HTML folder. So I'm going to make believe that I was really going to change this in that folder, which I'm not going to do. I'm going to right click on it in my ETC folder and choose edit. So it lets you know that you should back up the original file before you do this. It lets me know that I'm editing this file that's in the ETC folder as opposed to the public HTML folder because I really don't want this to go into effect. And I'm going to just choose edit at the bottom. So it brings me into this file with this PHP code in here. And if I wanted to disable file editing, what I would do is I would go to the very bottom of this file. So in my case, it's bringing me to like line 102 would be the first blank line. And I'm going to click there. Now you see the slash asterisk asterisk in the green text. That's a comment, meaning it doesn't execute. It's explaining what the code is going to do. So I like to comment code. So I'm going to do a slash and I'm going to do two asterisks and then I'm going to type disables file editing. And at the end of that, I have to do an asterisk and a slash to end the comment. So that shows up in green. The next thing that I would type here is the actual code. And so I'm going to type the word define lowercase open paren and I'm going to type a single apostrophe and it gives me two and the, my insertion point is in between them. What we need to type inside of here goes in between those parentheses. So in all caps, I'm going to type disallow underscore file underscore edit. And then I'm going to come out of that closing apostrophe or single quote, you could call it. And I'm still inside the parentheses. I'm going to type a comma and then the word true. And true doesn't have to be capitalized. It actually change it blue once you type it. I'm going to come outside of the parentheses, the closing parentheses, and it needs a semicolon there. So if I really wanted to do this, I would do it in the WP dash config dot PHP file that is in your public HTML folder. This one is in my etc folder, so it's not going to impact anything. So I'm going to go ahead and save my changes up here in the upper right. It lets me know I had success and then I can close. So this one has been modified. Now we're going to do this via a plugin. So this one that's in my ETC folder, I'm going to right click on it and I am going to delete it. And I'm going to tell it to skip the trash and permanently delete the file. And I always verify I'm in the right folder, the ETC folder in my case, not my public HTML folder. And I'll confirm that deletion. So if you want it to do it manually, that's what you would have to do to disable that file editing. And that way, if you go to themes or plugins, it won't have that editor option there for you. But again, we're going to do it via a plugin. So I have the link in the PowerPoint with the steps for you to manually disable PHP file execution. And if you do it manually, that would require a change to another file here. So I'm going to just go to my public HTML folder. And that file is called dot ht access. And so you would have to modify that. We're going to use a plugin to do it. 
But the reason why I want to point out this file to you is that even if you don't see that .ht access file in your public HTML folder and you've gone to settings and you said to show the hidden files and it's still not showing, you may have to take an extra step to get that file to show. So I'm going to just show you that extra step again. We're going to disable PHP file execution by using a plugin, but if you ever have need to get to this file .ht access and it's not there, there's something you can do within WordPress to make that file show up. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So back in WordPress, I would hover over settings on the left sidebar and click on permalinks. Now we're not doing anything here other than going all the way to the bottom and clicking on save changes. So if that .ht access file is not showing in your hosting provider's file manager, you would come here to settings permalinks, go to the bottom, click on save changes, even though you haven't changed anything, it will give you a message here saying the permalink structure updated. And then if you were to go back to your file manager, that .ht access file should probably be there. This is a tricky workaround. If you need to access that file and it's not there, this is a way to make it happen. So I just thought you should know that. So now we're going to go and get the plugin that we're going to use to disable file editing and PHP file execution. The name of the plugin is called Sucuri. It is not included with WordPress core. So underneath plugins, I'm going to go to add new and then I'm going to search and it's S U C U R I. S U C U R I. And so you'll see that it's an auditing malware scanner and security hardening plugin. So security hardening, for example, would be something like disabling file editing and disabling PHP file execution. So since this doesn't come with WordPress core, I'm going to go ahead and choose install now. And once it's installed, I'm going to go ahead and click on activate. Once you activate it, it takes you back to your installed plugins screen and you can see your security security there. And also if you look at the bottom of your left navigation, you'll see security security. And we can go to dashboard from there. So when I go to look at the dashboard, it's talking about WordPress integrity, right? It's letting me know that core WordPress files were modified. This might indicate a hack or a broken file on your system, right? It gives you all kinds of information. And so it's showing if I had audit logs, they would be showing here on the right. It's telling me that the site is basically clean, right? Not block listed. Gives me some recommendations and then some WordPress security recommendations there. And here's your disable file editing and prevent PHP direct execution. So it's making those recommendations there on that security dashboard screen. Go over to the settings tab for security. And you'll see here that you have your general settings, you have scanner, you have hardening, and let's go to hardening. And this is where we can go to block the PHP files in execution in certain directories, as well as disable file editing. So here's your block PHP files in the uploads directory, WP content directory, and WP includes directory. If you wanted to block those, which is recommended, you could apply hardening. So I'm going to go ahead and apply hardening. 
to all three of those. And be careful because it scrolls you. <laughs> you notice you can revert to hardening if you apply it by accident. So, And then I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. And there's my disabled plugin and theme editor. So I'm going to apply hardening there as well. So this prevents you from having to go and modify those files. As you're applying hardening at the top, it will let you know. So the last one I did was the plugin and theme editor. So it gives you that message at the top that it applied hardening there. I can close that because it has an X on it. And take a few moments and go over the other tabs in there just so you can see the kind of stuff that can happen via Securi. And so you can see that it is constantly monitoring and auditing your site for you. And it can give you notifications and alerts. And so the other thing, because we use the hardening screen to harden our security by disabling both file editing and PHP file execution, on the left sidebar, if I hover over appearance, you notice that themes editor is no longer on the list. The same thing would happen if we edited the file in our hosting site file manager. So it takes away that editor so you don't accidentally stumble across it and be playing around in there and maybe breaking your site. The same thing if you hover over plugins now, the plugin editor disappeared from that menu as well. That is the result of the hardening that we did. Before we get into how to disable directory browsing if it wasn't done by your host, I want to show you something else that you can do in WordPress to control some of the pop-ups that show up on your various screens. So on the left side, I'm going to go to my dashboard. And notice in the upper right hand corner, there is a screen options drop down. And when I select it, it opens up a panel. So some screen elements can be shown or hidden by using the check boxes. So do I want email marketing by creative mail? I'm going to uncheck that. I'm going to uncheck WP forms for right now. Not really using it. I'm going to uncheck the opt-in monster. Let's see. I'll leave that on because I'm using Jetpack and Yoast SEO. So we'll leave that. I'm going to uncheck Quick Draft. WordPress events and news for right now. And Welcome, which you see that controls this pop-up here. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'll leave my site health status, my at a glance up there, my activity, stuff like that. So I can always modify this any way that I want, but this just gets rid of some of the clutter on my screen when I'm working as an admin in my site. So I'm going to now collapse screen options so I don't have that panel showing at the top of my screen. And I'll mention if you did not watch the beginner course, I have on different screens, you'll see a line from the Louis Armstrong song, Hello Dolly. That's a plugin, a free plugin, and it's just for entertainment purposes. It doesn't do anything other than show lines from that particular song. Now on to disabling directory browsing. So I showed you that my host disabled mine. So if I go to the URL that I had in the slide deck, it shows a forbidden page. And that means that directory browsing has been disabled at my host level. If it hasn't been disabled for you, you still have to go to your host file manager in order to disable it. So I spoke earlier when I was talking about disabling PHP file execution manually, that you would have to change 
the .ht access file. And I showed you that if that file is not showing in your public directory, even after you're telling it to show hidden files, then you would need to go into your WordPress settings and go to permalinks and just save the changes even though you're not making any to your permalinks. And that can create that .ht access file that you're seeing on my screen right now. Now this is also in the public HTML folder. And the change that you would have to do here if you need to disable directory browsing is you would have to edit that file. So like any other file here, you would want to make a backup copy of the file. And so I'm going to just right click on it, like I showed you earlier, and I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to copy it to my ETC folder. So I don't really have to make this change because it was done at my host level. And then I'm going to go to my ETC folder and right click on the copy of the file and edit it. So it gives me the warning and I'm going to go ahead and click edit. And by the way, if you go to permalinks and you save the changes and it doesn't create that file, you would have to get in touch with your hosting provider. So, if I needed to, which I don't, I would go to the very end of this file. I'd put in a comment line and this is PHP in here. So I would put in a comment line and you just, anything that's green is a comment. So you see in here, it starts with the pound sign, right? And then after the comment line, I would have to just type in one line of code. So it would look something like this. I do a comment and I would just say disable directory browsing. And then I'd press enter and the line of code would be options dash and then indexes, and that would be it. Now this line is already in here. I said it was already set up by my hosting provider. So this is that line that's causing my directory browsing to be disabled. If that is not in your file and it's enabled, then you would have to add it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just delete the comment line and the line at the bottom I'm going to just close this. I'm not saving the changes. And I am going to delete that file from my ETC directory. And again, I always check that it's the right directory. And I'm, I'm going to skip the trash and permanently delete the file and confirm that. So that's how that process would go if it's necessary for you to do so. So the next group of plugins that we're going to access have to do with locking down our login page, one of our best practices. So the first one is going to be limit the login attempts. And so on the left, I'm going to just hover over plugins and go to add new. And I'm going to search for this one. And it's called Limit Login Attempts Reloaded. So by default, WordPress allows unlimited login attempts. And this can lead to passwords being easily cracked via brute force attacks. This particular plugin will block an internet address and or username from making further attempts after a specified limit on retries has been reached. So it makes a brute force attack difficult or impossible. Now, before we install this, just want to point out some things on this screen. So you saw that earlier when I went to my themes screen, 
I showed you that my hosting site does automatic backups of my themes. When you're looking at plugins, a few things that you want to note. Underneath it, it will show you approximately how many active installations. So you're looking for plugins that have a lot of installations. You are also looking at when it was last updated. Things that haven't been updated for years, you might want to shy away from. And so it's letting me know here that this plugin has been untested with my version of WordPress. I have the current latest version as of April, 2023, when I'm recording this video. So this will help you out with that. Now, these are things that are important in terms of like picking a plugin to use. Most of the plugins that you'll find on your site through here are approved, but some are not, and they can sneak through. So you want to be careful checking that additional information, how many installations, when it was last updated. You also have a more details link on it. And when I click on that, it brings up another screen, gives you more information about the plugin. On the right side, you're seeing the version of the plugin when it was last updated. It says it, the WordPress versions that are required, it's compatible up to 6.11. It is not showing my version. I have a later version. It's giving the average rating, which is important. You'll notice that most of the reviews are five-star reviews. So that makes me secure in using this as long as it works with my current version of WordPress. So from that screen, I am going to go ahead and choose install now. And now that it's installed, I will go ahead and activate it. After I confirm my email address for security information from them and I press continue, it's asking me to activate the premium version of this plugin. It lets you know that if you don't have premium, you can just say no thanks. I'm going to go ahead and click the no thanks link. On your left sidebar, if you look under settings, you'll see where limit login attempts lives. And now that we've generated backups through Updraft Plus, that will be showing there as well under settings. You can also get to it from down here in the same area where we access security, security earlier. And it brings you into its dashboard. It's letting you know we have zero failed login attempts for the past 24 hours. You have tools, help, global options, right? Shows you failed login attempts by country and total failed login attempts. And of course, at the top, it's telling you to upgrade to their cloud app for enhanced protection, visual metrics, and premium support. So that's on the dashboard tab. Go ahead and go to your settings tab. So under your general settings, the first thing you'll see is GDPR compliance. And it's a checkbox enabled thing. And that stands for general data protection regulation. So if you check the box, it makes the plugin GDPR compliant by showing a message on the login page. There are two links there. There's a link to GDPR and a link that says read more. Where you can get additional information about that. But basically, if you check that, it has a default message in here that the user would see, right? And that message is sufficient. Now, you can also put in a short code there to link to your privacy policy page if you have one for your site, if you need specific language in it. But just so you know, logging IP addresses for the purposes of security is an extremely widespread practice. It complies with standard security practices for websites. It is the default and most, if not all websites do this. 
and it is legal to do without consent. However, I am not an attorney and I pulled that information off of this read more link. So I'm going to just leave it unchecked here. And then you will get notified to the email address that showed on the previous screen, right? After, and it defaults to three lockouts. If you're comfortable with that, you don't have to change it. To show top level menu items, you would have to reload the page to see any changes. You have the option to hide a dashboard widget and to show the warning badge, which is a default. You would need to reload pages there to see the changes. So now when I scroll down, I'll see the active app is local because I haven't upgraded to their cloud app. So it's just local. And then I have my app settings, right? The app absorbs the main load caused by brute force attacks, analyzes login attempts and blocks unwanted visitors. It provides other service functions as well. So this is where you determine how many allowed retries are there. After a failed retry, how many minutes are they locked out? After the maximum number of lockouts occur or retries occur, in this case, four on my screen, it can increase the lockout time to 24 hours. And then it's 24 hours until the retries are reset. So that is basically how this works based on the settings that you put here. If you've changed anything here, just like other pages, you would want to go to the bottom and save your settings. So as you have the ability to always come back to this page, I would suggest that you change some of your local app settings so you can test it on yourself. Like maybe allow two retries, maybe five minutes of lockout or something like that. So you don't have to wait, you know, get rid of that 24 hours in case you really mess it up kind of thing. And then, you know, test it. Once you test it, come back in here, make your changes to the way you really want it to be, and then resave your settings. Now the next plugin we're going to use that'll help us lock down our login page is the two-factor authentication plugin. Now the particular one we're going to use allows for security questions, which will be our focus on setting up but they also have other two-factor authentication methods that you can use in conjunction with security questions or just by themselves. So this will protect against users using weak passwords and automated password guessing and brute force attacks. And the name of this plugin is Mini Orange. I'm on the new plugins page install new plugins or add new plugins page. And I'm just going to go to the search box and type in mini orange. It's all one word. And so you'll see that you have two results. The one that's mini oranges, Google authenticator, WordPress two factor authenticator is the one that we are going to install. And once it's installed, I'm going to go ahead and activate it. And it invites us to get started with its wizard. So I'm going to go ahead and click, let's get started. And so it asks you a couple of questions here. The first one is inline registration. So it's, do you want to prompt your users to set up two factor authentication after login? So when you enable this, the users will be prompted to set up the 2FA method after entering username and password. Users can select from the list of all 2FA methods. Once selected, user will set up and will log into the site. So that's what this screen addresses. So you have two choices. The users should set up their 2FA after their first login, or they will set it up in a 2FA plugin dashboard. I'm going to select the first option and choose continue setup. This one gives you the ability to enable two factor for all users or only for specific roles. 
we are going to select all users or I'm going to select all users here and continue setup. And then I can give my users a grace period to set up 2FA or they can have to set it up immediately. So I'm going to say I'm going to give them a grace period. And then it asks me the grace period and I'm going to set the grace period to three and I'm going to make sure I select days and not hours. And at the bottom, I'm going to select all done. Now you have the choice to configure 2FA for yourself or close the wizard and configure it later. I'm going to choose to configure it for myself. If you're planning to use multiple authentication methods, you would have to configure them one at a time. So on this screen, I'm going to go ahead and select security questions. And then I'm going to choose save and continue at the bottom. And it allows me to configure my security questions. You have three of them that you need to choose. Two of them you have embedded questions that you can pick from. So for my first question, I'm going to just go with my childhood nickname. And when I enter my answer, you won't be able to see it because it's already set for privacy here. but I can look at it to make sure I typed it in correctly. And I'm going to go ahead and select my second question and you can select whatever questions you want. I'm going to go with the name of my favorite childhood friend and input my answer. And then you get to enter a custom question. So I'm going to just put in what instrument do you play? And again, I'll type in my answer here. And I'm ready to save and continue. It lets me know that I've successfully configured the two factor authentication, at least the method that I chose questions, and I can get to advanced settings from here. And from advanced settings, you can choose other methods to configure from this screen. Now, some of these methods, you actually have to have their premium version of this plugin in order to use. Others, you don't. I know that you can use the Google Authenticator, but you have to have a mini orange account to do so. So I'm gonna point you to where you can go and set up your mini orange account if you don't already have one. At the top of your screen, back in the WordPress interface, by the way, at the top of your screen, you'll see my account and you can click on that to set up a mini orange account for free. If you already have an account, you can click on that button and it will prompt you to log in. If you don't, you just need to choose a password and confirm it on this screen and then click create account. So I'm not going to show you my account page because it just has too much confidential information on it. So I just came out of my account and I'm back on where you can select other authentication methods. The other thing I want to say about this is, and if you want to, you can go ahead and it will walk you through with the wizard, how to configure them. Again, some of them you'll need a premium mini orange account to configure or to access. When you're ready to test these, I would strongly suggest that you open up a new in private tab or a new window and get back into your WordPress. Now I'm going to show you where you would go in WordPress to get back to this. So in WordPress, you would go on your left sidebar to mini orange two factor, and then it's on the two factor page where you can configure these other authentication methods or test the one that you have. The next plugin that we're going to use is going to automatically log out idle users. So 
you know, if a user wanders away and doesn't lock their computer and anybody else can wander up and if they're logged in, especially admins, it could really give people access to things they shouldn't have access to. And so you can protect your sessions, your user sessions from shoulder surfers and snoopers by using the inactive logout plugin. So we're going to go back to our plugins and add new. And my plan is to test, to finish setting up and testing my plugins when we get to the end of this module. Again, some of mine say they're not compatible with my version of WordPress. I have the last version, so I definitely want to test my plugins at the end of all of this. So on the add new screen for this one, we're gonna search inactive logout. And so this one was last updated three days ago. It is compatible with my version of WordPress. That's nice. Has 10,000 plus active installations. And so I'm gonna go ahead and install it now. You know this process. And then activate. And from my installed plugins page, I'm gonna go to the settings for inactive logout. Once you have inactive logout activated, you can find it under settings on your left sidebar. And you could also go back to your plugins, installed plugins page and get to settings from there as well for this. So your idle timeout, you have on the general settings tab here, it sets to 15 minutes. If you're using multi roles, then the idle timeout will be selected for each individual user role. It's limited to 24 hours. So 1,440 minutes. Your idle message content, you're being timed out due to inactivity. Please choose to stay signed in or to log off. Otherwise you will be logged off immediately. So that'll be the first thing that's gonna pop up on somebody's screen. And then if they don't do anything, they'll get a secondary pop-up that says you've been logged out because of inactivity. So it has a timeout countdown period of 10 seconds. So the first message will pop up after 15 minutes, right? And then they have 10 seconds to do something and then it will log them out if they do nothing and show the second message. You can disable the timeout countdown. So when the timeout pop-up appears, the user's not logged out instantly. It allows the user the chance to continue or a logout will occur within 10 seconds. If you check disable timeout countdown, it will immediately log out the user after the idle timeout minute. You can have it show a warning message only. You can also have it prevent multiple logins. So the same user won't be able to log in from different workstations. You can enable or redirect. So if you don't do that, the user will be logged out to the login screen after timeout. And then you can also enable a debugger there. And then you have some Moldau or pop-up settings at the bottom where you have examples that you can look at. So like, for example, the header text, um, you can look at an example of that. The after logout button text it will say, okay, you can see an example of that button, so on and so forth. Um, you can also hide this close without reloading button that can show up as well. So if you want to take a moment and look at some of those examples, feel free. So this is the example of that header text, which is session timeout that would show up on a user screen. The next setting is role-based settings. So I'm just going to that tab. 
And if I enable multi-role timeout, it will enable multi-user role timeout functionality based on the user role. So when I click in that enable multi-user feature, I can select specific user roles, administrator, editor, author, contributor, so on and so forth. And then you'll be able to define different timeout constraints for those roles. I'm going to get rid of editor, which I selected, and I'm going to uncheck that box. We'll be discussing user roles and capabilities in more detail a little bit later in this module. The next tab you have is support. So if you need more features, it's pitching its pro version as usual, right? You can rate it, you can support it, you can reach out to the developer about it. And then if you wanna upgrade to the pro version, you have that Go Pro tab there that takes you to its website. And you actually can try a free version, which is what we have. Um, this one doesn't seem to have a free trial for pro. So before we continue, on my slide of security plugins, I've listed this one, WPS High Login Plugin. And I wanna talk about what situation would cause you to want to consider using this plugin and more information about it. So we are actually not going to use this plugin. There is a more secure method for doing a similar thing. So this one, you know, by default, your WordPress admin login is located within the same subdirectory, the last part of your URL. So for example, your URL.com slash login. So anyone can type in your website and add the slash login at the end of the URL. If you do have proper security protection, like strong passwords, maybe using reCAPTCHA, limited attempts before lockout, and more, you can rest easy that brute force won't get through. A good hacker, however, could be able to obtain the correct login through different means. But if you were to hide admin in WordPress, it may not do them any good, or at the very least, it will stall them. This particular plugin can prevent some amateur hackers, however, not too many professional hackers. And also, it may not work well with other plugins that are hard-coded to the wp-login.php file. Either the other plugins will not work correctly, or they will interfere with this one. So you have to be careful and do a lot of testing if you choose to use this. So what will it do for you? So example, you have yoursite.com slash login. That's the default. You could change it to something like yoursite.com slash GDN log, something like that, or whatever you need it to be. So it's not slash login. But again, that's only going to stop most amateur hackers, not too many of the professional ones. So we're not going to actually use this login. I just want you to know about it because it comes up as a very popular one, but I wanted you to know its limitations. And I have that link at the bottom where you can get more information about it. One of the things you can do for extra layer of security, and we talked about this in the PowerPoint presentation, is changing the WP database prefix. Now by default, your database prefix starts with WP underscore. And that's if your hosting provider doesn't change it automatically, like mine does. So my Bluehost already changed my prefix for me and filtered it through. It's not just a database prefix, but you have to change all table names as well. So I'm gonna show you how to check to see if it's been changed on your system. So I'm back in my file manager for Bluehost and I'm in my public HTML folder. And the file that I'm going to edit, now I'm not gonna take a copy of it right now, I'm just gonna right click on it, and I wanna edit the wp-config.php file. 
So go ahead and bring that file up by editing it. So when you edit that file, you're looking for a line that starts with dollar sign table underscore prefix equals. Now I have mine blocked out because my hosting provider changed it for me automatically. So my table prefix has already been changed. I don't have to go through the steps that I'm going to show you. If your table prefix says WP underscore, then you're going to need to go through this process if you want to do this. And so it gives you again, more security because every WordPress site has WP underscore for the database name and the database prefix, as well as all of the tables that are on your site. So they all start with WP underscore, which kind of every hacker knows. So if you can change it to something else that will prevent them from being able to hack your site. And so the first thing you would have to do is copy this file, you know, put it somewhere else. So you have a backup and then change your prefix to something like it could be WP underscore T underscore nine, seven, six, five, four, three underscore. You can only change it to letters, numbers, and underscores. Once you make that change here, you still have to go and change it for all the table names. And there's an easy way to do that using a SQL script. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just cancel out of here. I'm not making any changes again. My hosting provider already changed it for me when I set up my site through them. And just a reminder, if you are going to change that file, copy it first, put it in a different directory, and then come back here and change that table prefix to whatever you need it to be in the one that is in your public HTML folder. And you would want to save your changes after that. Now, if you do that, then you need to also go and change all table names. So what I'm going to do here is go back to my C panel for my hosting provider. So when I get there this time under advanced, instead of going to file manager, I'm going to go to PHP, my admin. And so in PHP, my admin, I'm not going to do it on my screen because I don't want anyone to see what my provider changed my prefix to. So you can expand this and you'll see all of the databases, all of the tables that would need to be changed. And instead of having their prefixes changed one by one, you can go to the SQL tab up top. And in that link that's on the PowerPoint, it gives you sample SQL code that you can use to change all of your table names at once. So I've opened this link and it actually has a whole video tutorial in there. Right, it's telling you how to change the table prefix in that WP config PHP file, and it's using an example of changing it to WP underscore A123456 underscore. And now it's showing you how to go to PHP My Admin to change all the database table names. And so that SQL query is right here. Now, when you look at your list of tables by expanding in there, you'll see tables that are related to some of the plugins that we've used and the core tables, which are like here. So you would want to make sure you grab those core tables at least and rename them to whatever you're changing that prefix to. So that's kind of how that works. So there's a whole article with step-by-step -step in a video out here that will walk you through that step. Jetpack is a plugin that comes with the WordPress core and I activated it in the beginner course. So I'm back in my installed plugins page. And if you need to activate Jetpack, you can do it from that page. Let's talk about what it is. So in the middle of that screen, so here's your Jetpack and where you could activate it if necessary, you can get to its settings. 
But over here in the middle section, I can go to view details. So let's first learn what Jetpack does. So it is one of the most popular WordPress plugins for just about everything it says. It handles security, performance, marketing. It has design tools. It makes WordPress sites safer and faster and helps you grow your traffic. So it has 24 seven automatic site security. It uses real time backups, easy restores. So we used Updraft Plus for our backup. It has malware scans, spam protection. It has brute force protection and downtime uptime monitoring all for free. So you can back up your site automatically in real time and restore it at any point with one click. Cloud storage starts at 10 gigabytes, which is more than enough for most sites. And you have additional storage options available. You can manage migration to a new host, migrate theme files and plugins to a new database, easily duplicate websites, create full database backups, clone websites, so on and so forth. It also includes an activity log. Now we just installed another plugin for that, but this one includes an activity log. It automatically performs malware scans and security scans for other code threats. It blocks spam comments and form responses with the anti-spam features powered by a Kismet. Has brute force attack protection to protect your WordPress login page from attacks. It monitors your site uptime, downtime, and you can get an instant alert of any change by email. It also has an optional two factor authentication for login. And it automatically updates individual plugins for easy site maintenance and management. Now my host takes care of that for me, but if your host doesn't, it would be good for that for you. So it gives you peak speed and performance, powerful tools for growth, easy design tools, integrations, expert support, right? So that's everything you need to know about Jetpack right there. I'm going to close that detail screen. And on the left navigation, Jetpack is toward the top. If I hover over it, I can get to its dashboard, which I will go to first. So Jetpack stats has been activated. It just needs to collect some data and they'll display your stats there. So I click on OK. And I have no activity for this period. You'll see my views today, all time comments, so on and so forth. I can also view detailed stats. I have very little because my site is still on a coming soon status. So it gives me seven day highlights. It's given me by days, I can look at it by weeks, by months, all of that kind of stuff. And you see what's included in here, right? And a lot of stuff at the bottom about upgrading to their premium version. So that's looking at the stats. I'm going back to my dashboard over here on the left. And then as I scroll down, I'll see security, right? Comprehensive site security. It's telling me to manage my security settings here. I can get there. So if I want to go in and manage my security settings, I would click that link. Let's see where it took me now. So there's my anti-spam setting. My downtime monitoring is there. So I'm going to turn this on to get alerts if my site goes offline and they'll let me know when it's back up too. And then I have my anti-spam through a Kismet and that's already protected. My firewall. So this one, I can protect my site with their web application firewall. I can enable that, right? And 
then I have two other choices there that it's letting me get to. If I want to upgrade to enable automatic rules, I can from down there. So you notice how this is blocked out here. I can't do it unless I upgrade. And then there's brute force protection. I'm going to enable that. It will prevent bots and hackers from attempting to log in with common username and password combinations. So I have allowing users to log into this site using wordpress.com accounts to get in. So those are those settings that I'm looking at, right? Back over here, that was my security settings. Here's performance settings writing settings, sharing settings, discussion, and, and traffic. So you have all of those. We looked at the stats already. If I go over on the left again, I can get to that Akismet anti-spam. So it's just letting me know what my settings are for that. So it's really pretty thorough, I think. On the left side, I've gone to Boost. So that's another plugin, the Jetpack Boost. You can get a free version. It popped up on my screen. So I have the free version. It shows you what's included in there. So that's why I have Boost there. I have Search for Jetpack as well. And that is, I can start searching for free if I wanted to add that on. And then my jetpack is the last one over there on the left. And this is where you can go to manage your jetpack products. So all in one screen. So jetpack in my case has been running in the background and it's often true, you know, this one, you can do backups. I prefer my Updraft Plus. It's a matter of personal preference for that one. But you have the ability to do the same thing from multiple plugins. So I mentioned this earlier. I just want to drill this point home a little bit better. One of the most important things when you're selecting a plugin to use is that you're looking at the details about it. You want plugins that have been updated recently, that haven't just been hanging out for several years with no updates. You want plugins that have good reviews. So if I go to my installed plugin page, which I'm on, I can, for example, a Kismet anti-spam, it comes in under Jetpack. I can view its details here from that screen. It tells you about the plugin, right? And major features. But on the right side, it gives you the version, the last time it was updated, the required WordPress version, what it's compatible up to. You get your average rating and you get to see some, you know, how many stars per review type of stuff. And so that's important. Like I said, if it's in WordPress, it's probably safe, but you still want to check this. Some third party ones have gotten through without consent. So you do want to make sure that they're being updated, that they are, you know, being monitored closely before you use them. And I'm going to just close this. Now we're talking about security for plugins here. But there is also security that we'll talk about for themes when we get to the next module. So I'm back in my site and we're going to go back to plugins, add new now. And this one is the WP activity log plugin. So I'm going to search for it. So it comes up and I have 200,000 plus active installations. It was last updated two months ago. Again, it hasn't been tested with my version of WordPress. I'm going to go ahead and install it. So this forces user accountability as well. We talked about that earlier. So I'm going to install. 
And I'm then going to activate. So it asks me if I want to run the wizard to configure the basic plugin settings. And I'm going to select yes. Going to just walk through the screen. So start configuring the plugin. So the level of detail you get to select for your activity logs. Basic would be I want a high level overview and I'm not interested in the detail. It defaults to geek, which means I want to know everything that is happening on my WordPress. And you can change this setting from its settings at any time. I'm going to leave it on geek and choose next. Do you, do you or your users use other pages to log into WordPress other than a default login page? So I'm going to leave it on, no, we only use the default WordPress login page. And again, these settings can be changed later. I'm going to do next. Can visitors register as a user on your website? So I'm going to leave mine set to no. And next, how long do you want to keep the data in your activity log? You can keep it for six months, 12 months, or all data. I'm going to leave it on six months. So at the bottom, it has some information down there. The plugin stores the data in the WordPress database in a very efficient way. Though the more data you keep, the more hard disk space it will consume. If you need to retain a lot of data, we would recommend you to upgrade to their premium version of this plugin and use the database tools to store the WordPress activity log in an external database. So I'm going to just do next on that. It can also monitor changes done in other plugins. So extension for WP forms, which I'm not using. There's an extension for Yoast SEO, which I am using. So that would keep track of all the changes that you do in Yoast SEO, Metabox, plugin settings, and much more. So you have the opportunity to get those connected in here as well. I'm going to just do next. If I wanted either of those, I could install the extension. I'm going to just do next. And so it's letting you know that it is installed. It's all set up and ready to use. You can finish. It gives you some useful links there. And I'm going to go ahead and click finish. So on the left side, on that left navigation, you'll see toward the top, the WP activity log, and you can get to your log viewer. If you have email notifications, you can create reports, see which users are logged in, go back to your settings, so on and so forth. So you can access it from the left sidebar. And you can also, of course, upgrade to their premium or pro version. So just to show you an example of the WP Activity Log Viewer, I've gone and made some changes on my site. One, I created a custom field, and the others I deactivated, activated, and installed plugins, the ones that we used. I went and uninstalled and deleted and then reinstalled and activated a few just so I'd get some entries in this activity log. So all of the users are the same. It's me. I'm the administrator. So I would be able to see all of the users activity in this log viewer. And it's basically letting me know the date, the time, the user. I have blocked out my IP address. In the first instance on this screen, it's the object is a user. That's where I created the custom field. The second and third ones are plugins that I either activated or installed. So in this case, I installed and then activated the inactive logout plugin again. Now you also get these warnings here. The green one is low in terms of severity. The orange one, the orange open circle with the exclamation point is high and the exclamation point with the filled in circle would be critical. So just, uh, I can organize these by their level of severity as well. 
And for each log entry on the right, there's an ellipsis where you can view all the details of this change. I'm not gonna bring up that screen. It just has too much of confidential information on it for me to share it in the video. So I just wanted you to see an example of that activity log. So for the next plugin, and this would be the last one that we're gonna be looking at in this lockdown login page section. It's actually could be in a broader section than that. And that one is called Jetpack. Jetpack comes with WordPress core. And so you should already have it under your installed plugins and you may need to just activate it. So I'm gonna have you go through the activation and then come back here to go to, through the settings on your own. But I'd like to show you my Jetpack, what I have going from Jetpack right now. Now there are things you would have to upgrade to to get access to, but I'll show you what I have and all of what I have so far for my Jetpack is free. So on the left side, on my left sidebar, I'm gonna hover over Jetpack, right? And I see all of these things. So I'm gonna go to the bottom and choose my Jetpack first. So from here, I'm seeing the Jetpack products and some of these have a cost involved with them. Some of these are free. So for example, if I go to add vault press backup, it lets me know that it's a dollar trial for the first month and then $10 a month billed yearly. There's also another popular upgrade here for security, right? Which includes the vault press backup scan and a Kismet anti-spam. And that's 20 a month paid yearly. I can go back to my Jetpack from there. And so I have a manage button and active next to my Akismet anti-spam. And when I click on manage, it lets me know that it's active and ready. Now this works on comments and forms. So it gives you some settings here that you can, you know, choose to select. And it gives you down at the bottom, your subscription type. This is a free account for a Kismet and it also has an upgrade. And I'm just gonna end by showing you my Jetpack stats from its dashboard. So again, my site hasn't been published, so I have no activity this period, no views, all of that kind of stuff. I can view detailed stats from here. It has a security section where I can upgrade, which I told you there was that upgradable security option. I have my vault press backup, which I can upgrade, my scanning, which I can upgrade. It shows the Akismet stuff, the anti-spam from comments and forms. Brute force protection, it's letting me know that it has protected me from 61 malicious attacks. And I haven't received any emails that my site is down at all. But if it were, I would. As I scroll down, there's the performance and growth section. It's letting me know that my image accelerator is enabled. I can upgrade now the search feature is it has a cost involved video press allows you to have one free video and then you would have to upgrade boost that plugin is installed and active and CRM is as well. All of these are different things that I can get via Jetpack. And then at the bottom, it has your connections and then you can access some help from there. So go ahead and activate or install and activate Jetpack and go to your My Jetpack and pick the features that you want. So I have a slide here for you 
showing the user roles, also known as capabilities, that are available in WordPress. Now, you may or may not have SEO editor and SEO manager, and that if you have enabled Yoast for your SEO settings, those two roles will show for users. Then you have subscribers, which is the least amount of permissions, all the way up to administrator, which can do everything on your site. So when you're setting up your users, you want to make sure that you're assigning them the appropriate role that they need for access to what they need to do on the site. The default user's interface in WordPress can be limiting depending on what you need. And so right now I'm on the all users page in WordPress and you could see my username. I blocked the email, my role, the fact that I have two posts, my two FA method is security questions and the icon over on the right shows that this user is linked to Jetpack, that overall security plugin that we added. And so I have all of that set up here. Now I'm the only user at this point. If I hover over my username, I can edit or view my user profile, which I haven't completed at this point. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go down under users on the left sidebar and we're gonna select profile. So you'll see some personal options here and you'll see that you can change the admin color scheme. I'm gonna go ahead and change my color scheme here to sunrise just to make it a little bit more interesting. You can see the change as soon as you select it. So when I select light, it looks like that. If I go to ectoplasm, it looks like that. I'm gonna leave it on sunrise for now. I might come back and put it on default. If you want to be able to use keyboard shortcuts, you can enable that there. And then you have a link where you can figure out what the keyboard shortcuts are to navigate in WordPress. The toolbar shows by default when you're viewing the site. The language is the site default. And then you have this particular user's name and you can fill in additional information here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in my first and last name. And by default, it assigns you a nickname, which is the same as your username and that can be changed. So I'm gonna change my nickname to Garden Nana. And then I have the choice to display my name publicly as my username. And you'll see in the upper right hand corner, it's showing that howdy to me at my username, or I can choose my real name or my nickname from the drop down list. And it gives me variations. I can use my first, my last my full name, last name, and then first name, or my nickname. I'm gonna choose my nickname. Underneath that, you have a contact info section where you can put in your website information, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, MySpace, Pinterest, so on and so forth, profile URLs. And then you have an about yourself section where you can fill in a little bit of biographical information for your profile. I'm getting my profile picture from my Gravatar account, which will follow me around the internet. And then I can set a new password. If I were logged in in multiple locations, I could log out everywhere else from here. And then lower down, it gives you some application password information as well as some Yoast SEO settings. And then another screen where you set your two-factor authentication. So we chose the security questions 
and we had entered them when we set it up. For some reason, it doesn't carry over here, so we'll have to enter them again here. And this is the same place that your users will come to in their profile to set up their two-factor options. And again, you can configure other options from here as well. And then if you make changes here at the bottom, of course, on the left, you're gonna go ahead and click Update Profile. One of the things I like the most about working in WordPress is let's say I was at the bottom of my profile page and I got a phone call, got tied up in that, switched to other screens on different tabs, and I come back. It scrolls me to the top of the page and it let me know that I already updated my profile in case I forgot what I was doing before that phone call came in. And of course, I can close that message. On the left side, I'm gonna have you go to add new under users now. And so you'll notice that this is the add new user screen. Now I'm not gonna fill it out right this second. I just wanted to point out something in here first. So I'm gonna scroll down and notice that you can only assign one role to a user. It's a drop down. Now this is gonna look a little bit different than some of the user roles that you saw on the slide. So I'm gonna do the drop down, and because I enabled Jetpack CRM, I have a bunch of roles for Jetpack CRM. I'm also using Yoast for SEO, so my SEO editor and SEO manager roles there. And then you have five what I would say are default roles, which you saw on the slide, subscriber, contributor, author, editor, and administrator. Now, what if we wanted to give a user or some users multiple roles? We would need to use a user plugin for that. There are two user management plugins that we're gonna use. Members will let you easily create and manage user roles and permissions in WordPress and more. And it also allows you to assign multiple roles to users. And then user switching will let you quickly switch to different user accounts. So I'm the admin and maybe for every user that I'm adding, I want default language in their profile. So I could go switch to those users, add that language, and then the user can add on to it when they're into their account. So we're gonna examine both of these plugins in detail. So when we were on that add new user, you saw that it gave it a role of subscriber. Now I'm on general settings on the left sidebar, and you'll see that this is where you can come to set your new user default role. In my case, I'm gonna just do the drop down here and I'm gonna select author. I'm gonna say in my example, most of the users I'm going to be adding are going to be authors. So, and I can always change it when I go to add that new user, it's just a default. So I scroll to the bottom and I'm going to save those changes. And now I'm ready to search for the members plugin. And I'm going to choose install now. And then as usual, activate. And once I do that, it'll be showing on the left side where we have our Yoast SEO, our limit login attempts, our mini orange two factor, security, security, there's members. And when I hover over it, I'm going to select roles. So you're seeing a listing of all the roles. The one at the top will be your role. In my case, I'm administrator. And then the default role will show next. Now, if I scroll down through this list, 
I'll see all my Jetpack roles, my SEO roles, as well as the other default roles. Now for my role, I can edit it. I can clone it. If I click on users there, it would just take me back to the WordPress default users screen. So this is just showing the roles here. Now, one of the things that you could do here is you could change the capabilities of a role, the things that users can do that have that role. And so if you look here, I have one user who is an administrator. The administrator is granted 76 capabilities and denied zero. So the administrator, as you know, can do everything on the site. The author, by the way, is only granted seven capabilities. So it's showing you the number of capabilities granted for each role here. If I want to change that, so let's do this. Let's go to the contributor role and choose edit underneath it. So here you can see all of the capabilities. These are the general capabilities. Under that, a contributor can only read. If on the left, I go to the post capabilities, you see that a contributor can edit posts, just their own, delete posts, just their own, read post, and that's it for post, right? Let's say that I have a few people who I want to assign the contributor role and I want them to be able to publish their post. So I'm going to go ahead and if that were the case, I would grant them the ability to publish post here. So if I truly wanted to do that, I could. What I would prefer to do is just create a new role with those capabilities. And so I'm not going to grant them the ability to publish posts here. But I just wanted you to see that for every role, it has its capabilities, general posts, pages, media, so on and so forth. So I recommend, like I said, adding a new role instead of editing an existing role. And you can do that two ways. So I'm going to go to add new role on the left under members. And it gives me the ability to enter the role name. Now we're not going to use this method. And I'm going to tell you why. When you choose add new role, it only gives read capabilities for general post pages. I think, yeah, that's it. I think that's the only capabilities it gives when you add new role by default. So you would have to remember the capabilities from the contributors role to be able to grant them in this new role, as well as any additional capabilities you want to have. So what I do instead is this, I'm going to go back down under members and I'm going to go back to roles and I'm going to hover over contributor. And this time I'm going to select clone. So it gives me a contributor clone. If I go to post, you'll see that what it granted for the contributor. So it carries over everything that it already granted to the contributor and you can make the changes in here. Now, I wouldn't keep the name contributor clone. I'm going to get rid of clone. And at the beginning of it, I'm going to type the word valued. So it'd be a valued contributor role. Their general capability will stay the same. For their post, I'm going to allow them to publish. And that's the only extra capability that I'm going to give to this role. And that's kind of how that works. So over on the right, you'll see that no users have been assigned to the role. It's granted four capabilities. 
total. And I'm going to click that Add Role button. So when I go back to my Roles page, I'll see my valued contributor role there as well. So now let's explore some more of this members plugin. And so on the left, we're going to go to settings now under members. And so you have general settings and then you have add ons. We're going to go through these general settings first. So under roles and capabilities, it lets you know that your roles and capabilities will not revert back to their previous settings after you deactivate or uninstall this plugin. So use this feature wisely. So this plugin is really an interface between your WordPress database. And so you're actually impacting that, which is why it won't revert back if you were to uninstall or deactivate the plugin. So the role manager, if you have that enabled, that allows you to edit and add new roles or add and remove default and custom capabilities. So we were able to do that because this is enabled. And then multiple user roles, if yours is not enabled, go ahead and check it because we want to allow some users to be assigned more than one single role. And in capabilities, if you've denied any capabilities to any roles that you're gonna use, it's saying they should always overrule granted capabilities. If not, your user will be, not be denied access to whatever that capability is. And then content permissions, will bring up an additional box on the post editing screen. So for any public post type, pages, posts, etc., you'll see the content permissions meta box, and it allows you to select which roles can view the content of the post or page. If no roles are selected, anyone can view the content. So it only will block post content, post excerpts, and post comments, nothing else. So that's what that content permissions tie to. So if someone didn't have permission to view a certain page or post, they would get a message that says, sorry, but you do not have permission to view this content. There are a few other settings underneath that we don't need to cover. And then if you go back to the top, you can click on the add-ons tab and all of the add-ons from members are free. So you have a plethora that you can use here. So for example, you have members admin access, allows site administrators to control which users have access to the WordPress admin via role. And so it may be a situation where you're getting a consultant to build out part of your website and you want to give them admin access in addition to yourself, something like that. So you can take your time and look through these different add-ons that you have here. If you wanted to create a hierarchical role system, you can add that members role hierarchy add-on. And so they run the gamut, right? have all kinds. There's a WooCommerce integration. And we'll be using the WooCommerce plugin later in this course. So you now know that members has an integration plugin for that. There's payment, subscriptions, email marketing, advanced content protection that you can get via add-ons. So now we're going to add a new user and again, our members plugin is enabled. So it'll be a little bit different than when we first looked at the add new user screen. So the first thing I want to point out on the add new user screen, which is different, is that now you can select multiple user roles. It's no longer a drop down; it's checkboxes. 
And that's because of the member add-in. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put in my username here. And I'm just gonna set up a training user. I'm gonna put in the email and then block it from your site. And then I'm gonna go ahead and fill out the first and last name. Not gonna put in a website. I like to let it generate a password. That is the best way to get like the strongest passwords in here. And if I wanted to generate a different one, I can just click that generate button again. And then the user will get an email about their account and that email will be how they can log in. So for this user, I want to give them author and editor permissions. Sometimes like right now, the admin, you know, is the only person that can approve people's posts and stuff like that. Sometimes when it's really busy, I would like to have certain people have the capabilities of the editor role as well. And then once I have all of that filled out in the bottom left, I'm going to simply click on add new user. So it brings me back to the all users screen and I'm seeing myself as administrator and my training user who also has a Gravatar account. That's why that picture is there has the author and editor roles assigned to them. It's also saying they have zero posts and they're not registered for 2FA. And because I just added them, they're not linked to Jetpack either. And so this training user will, would have received an email that would allow them to log in and then they would be coached how to go and get their 2FA set up how to fill out their profile, so on and so forth. I'm back on the add new plugin page and the last plugin we're gonna add in this module is user switching. Gives you or any administrator the ability to switch between user accounts. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in user switching and I'm going to install and then activate it. And this particular plugin does not show on your left sidebar. Where it shows is on your users page, your all users page. So again, only admins can switch users if you're running a single site installation or you would have to be a super admin on multi-site installations in order to be able to switch users. So the way I do it is I hover over training user and you'll notice that now I can edit that user, I can delete that user, I can view that user's profile. I can send a password reset to that user and I can switch to them now because of the user switching plugin. So I'm gonna select switch to. So it brings me into the dashboard page and at the top of that page, I can see that I could switch back to Garden Nana because I put in Garden Nana as my nickname and chose to have that display. Up here, training user is displaying in the upper right. So I know that I am in that user's WordPress. And so what I could do from here is go to that user's profile if I needed to. So in this user's profile, I put just one line in their biographical information in the about yourself section. And that's all I'm going to do in here. So I'm going to go to the bottom and save the changes. And when it brings me back to the top of the profile page where it lets me know it updated it, I can switch back to the admin account from here as well. And that's what I'm going to do. And before I recap this module, I just want you to see the result 
of the inactive logout plugin that we used. So I let my session expire. In the background, you'll see the session timeout dialog where I would have had the choice to say okay or close without reloading. And since I wasn't on the screen when that happened, it went ahead and expired my session and I would have to log in again. So this is because of that plugin, a way to lock down your login screen. By way of review of our first module, securing your WordPress website, we started by going over the principles of WordPress security and discussing them. You then learned the best practices for WordPress security, and then we reviewed the security plugins that we were going to use. Then we talked about how to disable directory browsing. And I showed you that mine has been disabled by my host. And you learned how you can type in your site address and then slash WP dash includes slash at the end of it to check to see whether directory browsing has been disabled on your site. I gave you a little bit of a tour of my site. And before we started doing anything, we backed up our site by using Updraft Plus. Then we installed the Security plugin, which monitors and audits your site, but it allowed us to disable file editing so we won't have that theme editor or a plugin editor that could be breached. We also learned how to disable PHP file execution, which requires a change to a database file unless you do it through Securi. So we use Securi's hardening screen to disable both file editing and PHP file execution. We learned how to modify our screen options in WordPress to control what kind of pop-ups show up on our screens. And then we learned how to use certain plugins to lock down our login page. So we learned how to limit login attempts. We added a two-factor authentication plugin and we set up security questions for it. We installed and enabled a plugin that will automatically log users out after they're inactive for a particular period. You learned a little bit about how to hide your login. So instead of having, you know, everything ends with the slash login at the end of the URL, for a WordPress site. Now, some hosting providers will change this automatically for you, as is my instance using Bluehost, but I gave you some guidance on how you would have to do it if your provider is not doing it for you. And that just, again, protects your login screen. You also learned how to change your WordPress database prefix if necessary. Mine was already changed by my hosting provider and you have the steps on how to do that. And we also used an activity log, a WP activity log, so that we can look at the actions of all of our users on our site. And then I had you go ahead and activate Jetpack for further security on your site. We then went on to talking about, and I kind of mixed these lessons up, but it made sense to do it this way. You learned about the user roles and abilities or capabilities, if you will, in WordPress. And then we went about setting up secure user accounts. Now we learned how to manage our users by using a couple of user management plugins. We used the members plugin so that we could assign multiple roles to our user, which the default WordPress users interface doesn't allow us to do. 
And we also used user switching so that an admin or for a multi-site, a super admin would be able to switch between different users. We created a new user. You saw how the password, a real secure password was generated. And because we already had the members plugin installed, we gave that user multiple roles. And then you saw how the admin could switch to that user's account and then switch back to their admin account very easily. Your brain will be given a break in module two compared to module one, as you'll be learning how to choose and install themes. So I'm going to shake this up a little bit too. I'm going to go over the factors to consider when choosing a theme, and then we'll go about finding and installing and changing themes in this module. As themes control the overall appearance of your site and layout of your site, you would want to consider these factors when you're choosing a theme. So you need to know the themes available features based on your site's purpose. So right now I'm working on a blog site and that's, you know, something that I would need to look at when I'm choosing a theme as opposed to like an e-commerce site which we'll get to later in this course. You also want to consider the simplicity of a theme. And obviously it's price depending on your budget. You wanna look at the functionality of it, how it can be customized to represent your brand's aesthetic, its responsiveness. So how does it interpret on a mobile device? Cross-browser compatibility would be very important, as well as plug-in support. Some themes don't support some plugins and vice versa. So you have to kind of look at all of those factors when you're choosing a theme. So now I'm sitting in themes, which is under appearance in your left sidebar. And you can see that I have a theme called 2021 as my active theme. And because it's my active theme, when I hover over it, I can see theme details and I'm going to select that. So what I'm looking at down here, because it's active on the right side, it tells me about the theme and at the bottom it has tags. So those are kind of like features that are part of the theme. And you see some of the features that are important to me are in the tag. So it's accessibility ready, for example. It lets me do custom menus. It has featured images. It allows for footer widgets. It also supports sticky posts and it's translation ready. So if those are a handful of the features that I'm interested in, this is a good theme for me. And that is why it is currently my active theme. So now if I go and view my about me page, my front page, you can see that this is known as the primary menu that lets me navigate the site. And because I can customize menus with this theme, when I go to the bottom, you'll see that I've customized a secondary menu, which shows the categories that I'm using on my blog, as well as the uncategorized category. You'll also see that it has a search wizard in the footer area on this theme as well. And at the top, it allows for a featured image. Now, if I go up to the primary menu and I go to my blog page, this is my sticky post, which is supported with this as well. So this 
will stay in the top position on my blog page until the point where I make another post sticky. And then that will remain at the top of my blog page. And I can use the clock symbol in the upper left where it has the name of my blog to get back to themes. So the other themes that are available on this page are themes that come with the WordPress core. So out of the box, I think I've added the vivid blog theme here previously, but Sinatra 2023 and 2022 are included with WordPress core upon installation. So let's say we wanted to add a new theme that's not here. Well, you're gonna click on the add new theme icon. And in the upper right corner, you have a search themes. So this is our blog site. So I'm gonna just type in the word blog and you'll see that there are a host of blog themes available to you. And so if I, I'm gonna just go up to the top and if I hover over the first one, in my case, it's called the Courier blog, I can click on details and preview and it gives you kind of a preview, not with your data, right? And it also tells you about the theme on the left side. And I'm leery of themes that have not been rated yet. So even if I like the look of this, I would probably pass on it as a security measure. Now that's not to say that there is anything wrong with the security of this theme, but you do want to be careful, similar to when we looked at plugins earlier, you want to be careful. And so looking at their ratings is helpful information. Now, if I wanted to keep it, I could simply install it up here, but I don't. So I'm going to use the X to get back to my search results. So this is a lot of different themes that are categorized as themes for blogs. And so I want to filter the list to the left of the search box. And I can actually clear that search box by using the X. That little gear says feature filter, and I'm going to click on that. So under subject, I'm going to select blog, and then I can drill down on features and layout if I want to. So the features that are important to me are accessibility ready. I like to be able to do custom colors. I'm also going to select featured images, footer widgets. I'm going to check post formats, sticky and sticky post. So under features, I have accessibility ready custom colors. I'm going to go ahead and do custom header as well. Featured images, footer widgets, post formats, and sticky posts. And then under layout, I'm going to choose right sidebar. And you can select other options if you'd like. So it tells me at the bottom, I'm going to apply nine filters. I'm going to go ahead and click that button. And so now I have a narrower set of blog site theme results. And so the one that I'm going to look at in more detail is called Agama Blue. So I can hover over it and click on details and preview. So now I can see a mock-up preview of this theme. You'll see it has a primary menu across the top. It has this header image with some coloration behind it and kind of a shape, a wave shape on it. And it just gives you kind of like placeholder information 
on this preview. And so on the left, it gives you a little snapshot of what it could look like with real data in it. And then it has a five star rating. However, there's only one rating. Now that would normally be of concern to me, but if I look at the detail here, it says this is a child theme of Agama. So typically when you install a child theme, you get the parent theme as well. And the parent theme usually has more ratings. So I'm going to take a chance up top and I'm going to just install this theme. So after it installed, I close the side panel and I'm back on my themes, my installed themes. And you'll see that I have a gamma, which is the parent as well as a gamma blue installed. And so if I hover over the parent and I go to theme details, unless I activate it, I won't see anything about its reviews, but I happen to know for sure that this one has more reviews and they're almost all five star. So it gives you the tags where you can see what's included in it here. I'm going to close this one and I am going to go ahead and activate a gamma blue. And so now it lets me know that it is active. Now, if I want to take a look at it, right, and see if there's anything that I might want to change about it. So the easiest way for me to do that is to go right up at the top of your themes. It says new theme activated visit site. So I can click that link there and see this theme with my stuff. So here it has this upper menu. This home page is actually called about me. That's my front page. It has another secondary menu over here. It also has a search box next to that menu. There's also a search widget on the right sidebar which is one of the features. It allows for a featured image, which was something else that we wanted. And if I go to blog up here, I'll see that it has my sticky post at the top of my blog page. And in this theme, it labels it featured post. Now I'm going to just go back up to the clock icon, the upper left corner and go back to themes. And by the way, if you activate a theme and then you look at it with your data, you may not like it. So you can just simply come back to themes and reactivate a theme that you used before that you knew you liked or look for other themes and check them out. So with this theme, I'm kind of comfortable with it for a while. I liked my original 2021 theme, but the thing that bugs me the most about this theme is that header picture that's up there. So in the next module, we're going to spend time with customizing items, but for right now, we're going to customize that header image. And before we do this, on the left side, I'd like you to go to media, click on media. And these are all of the images that I have in the files for the video description that I uploaded to my media library. If you haven't done that already, go ahead and you'll notice if I go on the left, I can click on add new if you haven't done it already. And then you can just select all of those image files and drop them here to upload them or click on select files and navigate through file explorer to get to them and select and upload them. 
So once you get those up, we're going to go back to themes. So right there on your active theme, you have a customize button, or you could go to customize under appearance on your left sidebar to get to it. Both roads lead to the same exact place. So it lets me know that I'm customizing my blog, the active theme here. If I wanted to change it, I could change it to any of my other installed themes. And then you have all of these different categories. Right now, our interest is getting rid of this default picture and the wave shape underneath it and the coloration. And so the first thing we're going to do on the left is we're going to click on header to expand it. And we're going to choose header image and expand that. And so the first thing we're going to do is where the bottom shape says waves, we're going to do the drop down and select none. So we get rid of that wave pattern at the bottom of that mountain image. And then you'll see your current header, which is that image. And so what we're going to do is we're going to tell it to hide that image under current header. Now I've already uploaded some images because I've had my media library up for a while. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on add new image and make sure you're on the media library tab and you want to select the basket of herbs. So once you select that, I already have it. You would do select and crop on the bottom, right? And then you could just skip the cropping. I'm going to get out of here because I already have that image up there. And then you're going to go back and add another image. And that's where you're going to grab the basket of strawberries. You can skip the cropping on that as well. You're also going to want to grab the antique watering can as well as the basket of veggies. So make sure you get those four images added on that customized panel. Once you have those four images under previously uploaded, you should see those four images. And underneath that, you're going to click on the button that says randomize uploaded headers. So it will swap out those four pictures occasionally. So it is cycle through those four pictures. Now, the only thing we have left to do here is we have to save the changes we just made and we're going to address this coloration. We want to get rid of that coloration because it's really obscuring the image. So at the top of that customization pane, you're going to go ahead and publish. And then you can close that pane and you can go back into customize and we'll do this last change for now. And we're going to hover over colors and styling on the left, expand that. And we're going to expand header image and we're going to uncheck enable background overlay. So now you just see the actual picture without that overlay. Now it looks like I'm going to uncheck this for a moment. Yeah. I'm going to uncheck enable particles as well, because you see when they're enabled it has these little particles floating over the image and I don't want those. So I'm going to uncheck both of those and then publish. Now, the last time we published, I had you do the X and then get back into customize. We could have done the back arrow here to get back to all of the different options. So now I am going to close that panel 
And again, we'll do further customization in the next module. And I may even switch themes again. It just depends. So now if I go to pages and I'm going to view my about me page again, and I can see the image at the top again, it's rotating right between four different images just to show you that change. And it doesn't have the color behind it. I am going to just go back to themes or actually I landed on my dashboard. So I'll just go back to themes from here. So the other thing I'll point out is that on the themes page, sometimes you'll get a theme that recommends a plugin. So this theme is recommending this Agama blue theme is recommending a plugin called Elementor, and it gives you the ability to begin installing that plugin or dismissing this notice. Now, if you want to know what Elementor can do, you can click the link there and get information about it. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss this notice. And I have another notice up there that I'm going to dismiss. So when I install this theme, it changed something in my Jetpack that it wanted me to go and address. And that was the second message that I dismissed. And so we now have active the Agama Blue theme or whatever theme you selected. And I'm going to live with it for right now. So in module two, you learned about choosing and installing themes. We started by reviewing the factors to consider when you're choosing a theme, factors that would be important for you. So some of those factors could be available features based on a website's purpose, simplicity of the theme, the price of the theme, functionality, what can be customized, so on and so forth. And then you learned how to search for themes and how to then search for themes by using feature filters to narrow the list of results. We researched a theme by looking at some sparse details, realized it was a child theme, and went ahead and installed it. And when we installed it, we got its parent theme as well. We activated the theme, and then we went about customizing it just a little bit to get rid of the default image and have it cycle through four different images from our media library on its header. In this third module, we are going to focus on further customizing your website appearance and design. So in the last module, we customized, we did a minor customization of a theme, and we're going to expand on that in this module. Our first lesson will be all about menus. The second lesson will cover widgets. The third lesson is the WordPress customizer, which you've already been exposed to. And in the final lesson in this module, you'll learn about AMP plugins for WordPress, what they are, what it means, why you would need to know about them. So you've seen the menus based on the theme that we selected. And you know that it's a list of links that are typically displayed at the top of your site, but you also see that there can be multiple locations for them on a site, depending on your theme. And you know that they make it easy for your visitors to find their way around your site's pages and content. When you start a new site, a menu is created automatically. And again, your site's theme can control where menus are displayed. And typically you can have multiple menu locations on your site. Some themes come with a social links menu with icons that link to services like Twitter and Facebook. So visitors can find you on social media. 
If your theme does not have a social links menu, you can still create one by inserting a social icons block, which you'll learn how to do during this module. So I have on this slide the supported icons for those themes that do include a social links menu. There are some advanced menu options that you will see as we progress through this lesson. And I'm just, again, reminding you that the slide deck is in the files for the video description. So I consider this slide for your future reference. We'll go over these advanced options when we get hands-on working with menus. So now under appearance, I'm gonna scroll down and I am going to select menus. And the first thing I would like to do is toward the top, you'll see that it has two tabs. We're on the edit menus tab, which we come into by default. And we want to first click on the manage locations tab. So this is where it lets us know that our theme that we selected supports three menus. Select which menu appears in each location. So there's a top menu, a primary menu, and a mobile menu, right? So all the way at the top of this menu screen, you'll see a button that says manage with live preview. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that button. And what it's done is it took me to the customizing menus. So the WordPress customizer, and it's showing me my site. And at the very top is where they have that top menu for this theme. And then here where you have this lines, that is your primary menu. And then it gives you the mobile menu option, which would show on a mobile device. And so for the top menu, I'm gonna do the drop down and select primary here. So it starts with about me, blog and articles. That's how I had my primary menu set up in my previous theme. If you need to edit your menu, so the top menu right underneath where it says primary, there's edit menu. And so what I'm showing here, right? The menu name is primary. And I can reorder these items or add items. So if I click on add items, I already added pages, right? You can select from pages, posts, categories, tags, formats, custom links, stuff like that. So I have those three pages there about me, my blog page, which is a post page, and then my articles page. And so on the left, it also has the menu location. So this is the top menu, which is currently set to primary. And what I wanna do is, since we made this top menu set to primary, I'm gonna go ahead and publish that so I keep that change. And I can do the back arrow next to customizing menus primary. And I can go back to view all my locations again. And then my primary menu, which would be accessed over on the right side of the page, I'm gonna do the drop down there and select secondary menu. And if I want to, I can edit my secondary menu. And so my secondary menu is my category menu and my categories are in a hierarchy. So vegetables, herbs, fruit, and uncategorized. So I already have that set up. I'm gonna do the back arrow there. And so 
Let me go back and view my locations again. Right. So the top menu is set to primary. My primary menu is set to secondary. And my mobile menu also set to primary as well. And then at the top, I'm going to go ahead and publish. So I'm really kind of glad when things don't go perfectly here. So when I look at this primary menu, it's not showing my categories, but I'm not going to give up yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close this customization pane. And I am going to go back to pages and view my about me page. And so now I'm seeing that it is showing that secondary menu, the category and uncategorized there as my primary menu. And there's my top menu to just navigate the pages of the site. So the moral to this story is occasionally you'll run into a glitch where the live preview doesn't actually update. But before you call it a wrap and say, oh, it doesn't work, go view a page. I mentioned earlier that not every theme has a social links menu. And an example is the theme that we're using, right? So this particular theme has that top menu, a primary menu, and a mobile menu. There's not one that specifically named social links. And it's kind of hit or miss. I used to know a theme that had a social links menu built into the theme, but that theme no longer exists. So you would have to look at every theme's menus to see if it has social links. If you want to keep this theme and you still want some kind of social icons or social links on your site, you can do it via widgets which is our next topic. And in the next module, I will show you another way of kind of having those social icons on your site without using a widget or if your theme doesn't have the social links menu available. So we're going to learn how to add social icons via widgets for our site. So it might be good to know just what a widget is. It's a modular element that enables you to add a specific feature to your site. Widgets can be added to different areas of a site, such as sidebars or footer areas. And they're an inherent part of WordPress's design and layout customizations. One of the things I want to point out before we set up our widgets, I'm viewing my about me page again, and you'll notice next to this primary menu where we have the categories is a built-in search box. Now we can't modify that primary menu to get rid of that search box. If you look down on your right side, you'll see on that right sidebar for this theme, that's where the widgets are. So this theme includes a search wizard in that right sidebar. We don't need two searches on a page. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of that search widget and we're going to replace it with social icon widgets. And we're going to do that. I'm going up to my clock and I'm going directly to widgets. And so right here, I'm going to click, it tells you it's that main sidebar, which in this theme is on the right side where it says add label. I'm going to click and you'll get that toolbar above it on that toolbar. The last icon is the options ellipsis, and we're going to select it. And at the very bottom, we're going to choose remove search. So that whole search widget has been removed. And then we have a blank block, which I'm going to click in. And when I click in there, it says add block. I'm going to do the plus sign to add a block. And if you need to search for social icons 
or you might be seeing it already on your list. It's already on my list, so I'm going to select it. So now you'll see where it says, click plus sign to add. I'm going to click that plus sign and I'm going to expand this list by choosing browse all. And I can see all of the social icon widgets. The first one we're going to add, we're only going to add two here because in the next module, we're going to do some more social media type things and you'll learn other ways of doing this instead of widgets. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on Facebook. And then I'm going to come outside of that widgets box, click to the right of Facebook and I get another plus sign where I can add another icon. I'm going to click that plus sign and this time I'm going to add Twitter. So just Facebook and Twitter for now. So now we just have to configure these icons. I'm going to click on the Facebook icon and it wants me to enter the address to that Facebook account. So what I'm going to put in, I'm going to use the learn it Facebook page here. So that would be HTTPS. I'm going to do the colon slash slash www.facebook.com, another slash, and then what comes after this would be your site. So I'm saying I'm using learn it. So it would be learn dot it dot anywhere and another forward slash. And so to the right of that, you have that circular arrow and you have to click that to apply that to Facebook. And then I'm going to click on the Twitter icon and I'm going to enter the learn it Twitter information, which is HTTPS colon slash slash Twitter dot com slash learn it anywhere, all one word. And I need to apply that using that circular arrow. So now I'm ready to go ahead and click update in the upper right hand corner so that it saves that as our widgets. So now when I view my about me page, I no longer have that search box on the right sidebar. I have the Facebook and Twitter widgets. And if I click on the Facebook widget, it takes me to the Learn It Facebook page. So we only added two social icons to our main sidebar as widgets. And now I'm going to scroll down and you'll see that the Steam provides four footer widget areas. I'm going to select footer widget one, and then I'm going to click the plus sign. And this time I'm going to browse all, and you'll notice it has text and then media. There's categories here, design, and then there's a widget category. And you can see the choices that you have in there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the archives widget in there as the footer one widget. And so the only archives I have on this new site is from March of 2023. And I'm going to just leave that like it is. And I'm going to go up and click the blue update button. So it saves that change. And then you can navigate to your pages and look at your front page. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see that first footer widget, which is your ar archives of your blogs. 
So our next topic is using the WordPress customizer. And you've been in the customizer before, but we're gonna go through it thoroughly this time. We might do it a little bit out of order because I wanna stick on this social icon thing that we've been working on first. So one thing I wanna point out on my page is all the way in the upper right, there is another Facebook icon and you'll see in the customizer why that's there and you can change it if you don't want it to be there. Since we added Facebook and Twitter here to get to our Facebook and, or to learn it Facebook and Twitter pages or account pages, we don't necessarily need Facebook up here as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to the clock, maybe, and I'm gonna just go back to themes for right now. And then under themes, I'm gonna go to customize to get to the WordPress customizer. So we've been in here, we changed the picture for this theme and got rid of the coloration for it and we have it cycling through four different pictures. We did that through the customizer. Before starting at the top, I want us to scroll down and in the customizer, you'll see social icons and social share. So that we don't have a social links menu as we discussed but we used widgets to add some social icons. So let's first expand social icons and you'll see by default that Facebook icon is there. And that's what's causing that icon to show at the very top of your page, not where we added the widget. So what I'm gonna do on that social icon there, and I can add more to show at the top of the page, but what I wanna do is I wanna do the drop down there and I'm gonna just select remove. And if I wanted to add a new one or something, if I wanted to add it back again, I would just select from the list. So I'll select Facebook and I would have to add in the URL. The default one that was there had a URL that wasn't to the Learn It Facebook site. It was to my site and a feed page. So you would definitely want to set the social icon page URL. You can also tell it to open in a new tab if you're adding it up in that area. I'm going to remove it again. So we don't have that Facebook social icon. And then I'm going to go ahead and publish so that it saves that change and use the back arrow to get back to the customizers. Now, right under social icons is social share. So the social icons, and I expanded social share, the social icons mimic the widgets that we put in. So it will take you to whatever URL that you put in there. In my case, it was the Learn It Facebook and the Learn It Twitter. With social share, the first thing I'm gonna do is enable it. And I can say where to make it visible. And that can be on post pages or post and pages. I'm gonna just leave it on post. And these share icons are already here. So what these icons do is they have the user share your content on their social media accounts. So this is not taking them to the Learn It account in our example. It will share your post on their social media accounts. So I'm gonna go up and publish that or at least give them the opportunity to share it. And I'm gonna go ahead and use the X to close the customizer temporarily. I'm gonna go back to my pages and view my about me page. And then I'm gonna use my top menu to go to my blog page where my posts are. And so on this page, it's showing excerpts of my post. 
But if I click on the read more link, then it shows me the full post. And underneath it, it will have a share this post section. And then the user can click on any of these icons and I clicked on Facebook so it would prompt the user to log in to Facebook and then they'd be able to share that particular blog post. So I will say, depending on your theme, the customizer options will change. So for example, we're on the Agama Blue theme and I can upgrade to a Pro theme and there are Agama Blue options. You already know that the menus don't allow us to have a social links menu, right? For this particular theme. So these changes, these categories on the left can vary depending on the theme that you've selected. So what we're going to do now is have a comprehensive tour of this WordPress customizer. We're gonna start by clicking on Agama Blue Options, expanding that. We see there's only one, it's for the blog. I'm going to expand that. And then that heading title, we've been seeing it when we've been going to the blog page, is latest from the blog. If I wanted to, I could change it here. Now I'm gonna leave it at latest from the blog because I'm comfortable with that heading, even though I have that sticky post, which I want to remain on the top of my blog page. So I'm gonna use the back arrow to get back to the main customizer screen. Your next topic there is site identity. And when I expand that, I see my site title and tagline, which I can change here. Now it is displaying my site title on my site. It is not displaying the tagline and that's my preference. And so I can select a site icon if I wanted to. It gives you information about there, right? Site icons are what you see in browser tabs, bookmark bars, and within the WordPress mobile apps. You can upload one here and it lets you know that they should be square and at least 512 by 512 pixels. And you could click on select a site icon if that is what you would want to do. I'm gonna go up and go to the back arrow again, and I'm gonna expand general. So we have different sections here. I'm gonna start with pages. So do I want my page titles on or off, right? I prefer them to be off. And feel free to play with these options and then publish them and then go view your pages to see the changes. I'm just going by what my preferences are now for this particular blog site. I don't have the need to have the page titles on. So if I do turn them on, I'll just turn it on and just sample it for you. I'm gonna go to publish. And then I'll go ahead back to my pages. And I will view that about me page. And I am not seeing the title here, the page title. Let me go to the blog page. Uh, it might need to take a little bit to refresh, but I don't want it to show anyway. So I'm gonna just get back to my customizer and go back to that particular category and change it. So that was under general pages and I'm gonna turn it back off. I'm going to publish again, just so it saves that change and I'm gonna do the back arrow. So then you have a search page section, so you can post thumbnails if you choose to. And by the way, I'm gonna go back there. 
if I hover over that question mark, it tells me it enable post featured thumbnails on the search page. So I don't need that to happen. I'm going to do that back arrow. Static front page is the next one. So this is something I can get to through settings too. So my home page is a static page. It's the about me page. And my post page is my blog page. And I am going to do the back arrow and leave that as is. The next area is comments. And so it has this HTML tag suggestion is on. Enable tags usage suggestion below comment form. So that's turned on. I'm going to just do the back arrow. We have extra here. So nice scroll is off and back to the top is on. So enable browser nice scroll. I believe if you enable nice scroll, it allows you to do like one click scrolling. And then back to top has an option to get back to the top of the page you're on. So I'm going to leave those settings the way they are. I'm going to just go ahead and publish. And then I'll show you, I'm going to close customize and go back to my pages. And I'll show you where the back to top is located. So if I scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see in the very lower right corner, there is an up arrow button and that is your back to top button. So easy navigation to get back to the top of a page. And I'm going to go back to my customizer. Now this time I didn't use the clock at the top. I clicked on customize and it takes me right back there. So that was in general where we were under extra. And then you have also in general, you have additional CSS if you wanted to add any, if you know that programming. I'm going to do the back arrow to get out of general. And then you have typography, which will be the next category that we take a look at. So I will expand that topic. And there we have the site title. So it's giving you where you can change the font family, font size, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm going to go back. And then you have the body and it's the same thing, your font family and font sizes. Going to go back. Your top navigation, same thing. And noticing your top navigation, it's doing the text transform to uppercase. You might want to do the drop down and just choose capitalize and you can see it right there. And I'm going to publish that so it keeps it. And so then I'm going to go back and then I can change the font families for my primary and my mobile menus if I want it to. So for the primary one, I don't want that in uppercase. I'm going to go ahead and make that change. So the text transform, I'm going to just put it on capitalize. You can even do things like space the letters here. So I am going to publish that. And then I'll use the back arrow to get out of that category totally. We were in colors and styling earlier, but just for a brief moment. So let's go back in there. And that's when we changed the header image styling. So in here, you also have general and all these other categories. So let's go through them. The general category, the skin color is light. 
right? Your only other choice is dark. And they have a lot of built-in help here. If you hover over any question mark, it lets you know what you're dealing with there. I'm going to just go back. Site title and tagline again is there. And this is in terms of color. The body is there. There's a left and a right. So if I click on that circle, then I can change my background colors here. And then I can also put in a background image. I'm going to go back. We looked at the header image section, but the header can have a background color and a borders color if you would like. I'm going to just do the back arrow. We already went over header image, right? Where we disabled the particles in the background overlay to get rid of that coloration. And then you can go to your colors and styling for your top navigation, showing you the links color, your mobile navigation and your primary navigation. We have nav bar buttons. If we have a nav bar, we can change the coloration of that as well. You have breadcrumb where you can change background, font, and links colors. You have a slider category as well as the footer category. And so we added a social icon in our footer and it shows what the color would be if you added that. If we had a copyright links color, we can change that color as well as the widget area background colors and the footer area background colors. So these choices to me are so personal. I'm not recommending anything here. It just depends on how you want your site to look. So I'm going to just do the back arrow to get out of colors and styling. And then we'll proceed through some of these other categories. The next category we're going to take a look at is the layout category in our customizer. You have two choices there, general. So the layout style by default for this theme is full width. I'm going to do the drop down and I can select boxed. And you can see the change here where it's no longer full width. It's kind of in a boxed layout. I'm going to do the drop down and change it back to full width. I prefer that for my blog. And I'm going to go to the back arrow. And then I have the sidebar. And its position is on the right. I could change it to the left here if I wanted to. I'm going to just do the back arrow. The next one we have is header. And we dealt with the header image before. So let's look at our general settings there. So I'm on header style V3. I'm going to go back to header style V1. And you notice that it has one toggle and that's the primary menu to float on the right side. If we turn that on, we go up here. And this is my primary menu. When I turn that on and I hover over it, those lines kind of disappear a little bit and then I have to go back and re-hover. Uh, turn that off. I don't see any really change here that it was floating on the right side. I'm going to go to header style V2. And this is where I can enable that top navigation. If I didn't want that top navigation, I can disable it here. 
I can tell it to hide the top navigation in mobile view. So I could do that if I was looking at it in mobile view. And you have settings for enabling your social icons, which we used, And we got rid of the social icon that was up there. And then you can change your margin and your border there as well. And then you have header V3. And when I switch to that one, I get the ability to do that primary float. I'll try it again here. Nothing. And the other same choices, pretty much. So I'm going to just leave mine on V3, which is where it was to begin with. And I'm going to do the back arrow. And then if you want to add a logo, you can select an image from logo. I'm going to just go back. Nav bar buttons. Okay, I misspoke earlier when I said that we couldn't remove that search icon from the nav bar. We can here by clicking on its eyeball. So I didn't realize that and I misspoke earlier. So we removed it from the widget area because it was both on that menu nav bar and in the widget area. We could have kept it in the widget area and removed it from that nav bar in the way I showed you. I'm going to just do the back arrow there and leave it in the nav bar. And then I'm going to back arrow again. Your next one is navigations. And this is for your mobile. You could give it a menu icon title. And I'm going to just back arrow that. You have, we have a few more that we're going to go through. So let's go ahead and look at breadcrumb. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the breadcrumb by turning it on. And I'm going to disable the breadcrumb on the home page. Right? So now, basically, in this theme, in order to see the breadcrumb, you need to have both of these enabled. So I just wanted to point that out. The breadcrumb style by default is mini. Your other choice is normal. And so this is your breadcrumb here. This is what a breadcrumb would look like. And you can click the house, right? In this case, it takes me back to the home page, which I'm already on. So that's what the breadcrumb does. If I go to my blog page from here, I can see the breadcrumb on that page as well. So that would take me back to my home page, which is my about me page. So I'm going to just do, I don't particularly want the breadcrumbs. I think I have enough navigation. So I'm going to turn my breadcrumbs off and then go back. The next option is slider. The slider is our next one. And you use the slider if you want to display a slideshow of images and videos. And on the general portion, you get to tell it the height of the slider, the time, and the visibility, right? You can change it from your front page to your home page or whatever page you want it on. And I'll go to the back arrow. And then you have the slide section where you can add images, right? You can give it a title. I'm going to go ahead and just grab an image here just to kind of demonstrate this. And I'll use my cherry tomatoes image just as a demonstration. It has a box title, Welcome to Agama. 
And so this is what the slider looks like here. I'm not going to continue to build this one out, but I have, I can change the title color, the animation. You have all these different animations. You have a button title, learn more, right? And then the button link, which you may want to put on another page, create another page for that. You could change the color of that button and have the button animated as well. Um, it lets me know that I am limited to two rows here, right? So I am going to just remove that image. And I'm actually going to just scroll to the bottom and remove that entire default slider. So yeah, if you have need of using that, it's pretty easy to figure out. I'm doing my back arrow here and then you have front page boxes. Now I'm going to go to general first and I'm going to have the visibility on all pages just to show you what this would look like. And then I'm going to do the back arrow and expand boxes and choose add new. So for a box title, I'm going to just, and this is just a demo. I don't actually use boxes on my site, but you'll see what it does. So for the box title, I'm just going to put in my box. And so you can see that here it says front page boxes and then the title, my box. I can add an image and I'll select the question mark here just for demonstration purposes. And then it wants you to enter the font awesome icon name and it gives you an example. It's preceded by FA. So I'm going to just put in FA dash question. And you can see now that I have a purple question mark as well, based on this color here. I can enter the box image URL. I can enter box text. I can make the box animated by checking that. So you see the box has that bounce animation. I can change it to jello and see what that animation looks like. So it wiggles and then you can set your animation delay. So that's what a front page box does. It gives you the ability to have another image on your page. And I'm going to just go and remove my image, remove my, my box title, get rid of the font awesome icon name. Now I got rid of the purple question mark. And I'm going to do the back arrow and go back into general. And for visibility, I'm going to just put it on home page. And so it's back to the default and it's not showing anything. So I'm going to just do my back arrow there to get back to my customizer. So we only have a couple of more customizations to review. The next one would be blog and we have general, right? So our default is a list layout for our blog. I'm going to leave mine on that. You can see your other choices. I can have my post animated. It's already on. I can change the animation here if I want it to. The blog post featured image on the blog page. I have the ability to have that happen as well as a featured image permalink. 
It's showing an excerpt and I can change the size of the excerpt from here. It does have that read more button. Shows information about the author as well, which is based on their profile information. And enabling infinite scrolling is just an easier way of scrolling through a blog post. I'm going to use the back arrow and expand single post. So I have that featured image there as well. Back arrow and the post meta. Everything is enabled here in terms of the metadata. So we have the author, the date, the category, comments, so on and so forth. And I can just back arrow out of blog. We already went over social icons and social share. So you know the difference between those. We customized our menus or you saw how to do it. And we added widgets. And the last thing that we're going to look at is the footer. So I'm going to expand that and footer social icons are enabled, but this gives you a copyright area in the footer. And I can just put in for right now, just to show you what it would look like. I'll put copyright 2023, something like that. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom, I'll see underneath that footer one section, there's that copyright 2023. And I'm going to just delete that for right now. Don't need that in there. And I'll use my back arrow to get back. Now, when we get to a later module where we're discussing SEO, search engine optimization, We'll review our Yoast SEO settings and we'll come back to customize to look at the Yoast SEO breadcrumbs customization that can be done. So for right now, just so everything that I changed and everything, I'm going to just go ahead and publish up top. And then I'm going to close the customizer. And our final lesson in this module is AMP plugins for WordPress. So AMP stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. It's an open source development framework that was developed by Google and it was introduced in 2015. The goal of AMP is to decrease load times on mobile devices by removing excessive page elements and features that require more resources to process. When accessed on a mobile device, heavier quote unquote websites, which are those which contain and execute more HTML, CSS, and scripts take longer to load. AMP creates alternative mobile versions of web pages that remove excess code and bulky media content, leaving a stripped down page. This cuts down load times and improves the mobile user experience. I have a link on this slide to the 10 best AMP plugins for WordPress, but we should know that we have two plugins already that deal with accelerated mobile pages. And those are Jetpack and Yoast SEO. And so there's nothing that we would have to do. This is going to happen automatically because of either of those two plugins. By way of recap of module three, we spent more time customizing our website's appearance and design. We started by using menus and we noticed that the theme that we selected offices three different menus. So we have that top menu, we have a primary menu, and we have a mobile menu. The second lesson, we concentrated on widgets. And what we did is we removed a widget from the right sidebar and we added two social icon wizards to that sidebar as we didn't have a social links menu choice with our theme. 
So we used widgets to add some social links. Then we went into using the WordPress customizer. We had used it in the previous module just briefly. So we went through all of the options on the WordPress customizer so that you can further customize your site in any way that you wish. We briefly reviewed AMP plugins for WordPress. I have a slide in the deck that gives you a link to some top plugins, but I explained that we already have AMP enabled via our Jetpack plugin, as well as our Yoast SEO plugin. So there's nothing for us to do there. We'll be providing a better user experience for our mobile users. So I'd like to thank everyone for viewing this WordPress course. Again, my name is Trish Connor Cato, and it's been my pleasure to present this video to you. Hello everyone. My name is Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the WordPress video course. And we'll begin this course by using the blog site we created in the WordPress beginner course. The fourth module, will focus on various methods of integrating social media on your website. And then we'll learn a few methods of how to integrate podcasting on your site. We'll also discuss ways of integrating HTTPS on your site for an additional layer of security. In module five, you'll learn the basics about static websites, corporate and business websites, and one page websites. Now this course is designated for anyone new to WordPress or who is self-taught on the product, you would gain from taking this course. You don't need any prior web development or programming skills. It's designed for non-technical users who are more interested in content management and search engine optimization than the technical aspects of website creation. And so in our fourth module, we are going to focus on social media integration, podcasting, and HTTPS. So we have three lessons in this module. We're gonna start by integrating social media, continue on to podcasting, and end with HTTPS and SSL. Before we dig into lesson one, it would be helpful for you to open the useful links Word document in the files from the video description. There are a few URLs we're gonna be using during this lesson, and it'd be great for you to be able to copy and paste them. So lesson one is all about how to integrate social media on your site. There are several options for you to use. You can add social media feeds on your site and they would display posts from your social media accounts in real time. This is a way to help you stay connected with your audience when they're taking a break from social media, but still checking your site. There are built-in features for displaying your feeds from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and TikTok, to name a few. And you would use the embed block on a page for this option. Another option is using the social icons block. You can add and configure that on a page for the required icons for the services. And this would allow your visitors to click the icon and go to your service feed. Now in the last module, we discussed social media menus. And I said that certain themes come with them automatically. I also didn't have a theme with an included social media menu. I mentioned the one I used to use is no longer available. So, since the last module, I did discover a theme that has social media menu, 
and you'll see how to configure that. In the last module, we use social sharing by enabling it via the WordPress customizer. So it's still on this slide, just as a reminder for you that we've done that already. And then there's an auto sharing feature, which is formerly known as Publicize. It is included in all WordPress plans and every post you publish will automatically post to the platform you've selected. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Tumblr. Instagram does not allow auto posting from third party services. That's why it's not in the list. And then there are specific platform instructions. And I'm going to move further discussion about the auto sharing feature all the way to the end of this module because we can't use it until our site is launched. And so we need to launch our site. And I don't wanna do that until the end of this module because the next two modules, we're gonna be creating different types of sites. So I'm gonna move that feature. We'll revisit it at the very end of this module. I'm gonna go ahead and edit my front page, my About Me page. This is where we're gonna have a live feed from social media. Now, I wanna to scroll toward the bottom of the page and point out something to you. This content permissions section, this is because of our members plugin that we added. When we were configuring it, we went in and so these are the roles. We can limit access to the content of this page to specific users that have certain roles. We don't need to do that, but I just wanted to point it out. Once we configured that plugin, every time we go in to edit a page, we'll see that content permission section at the bottom. So what I'm going to do is I like to have my right panel open, my options panel. So in the upper right corner, I'm going to click the ellipsis to get that panel open. And what I'm going to do is scroll down. And actually, I'm going to click the ellipsis for right now. I don't need it open right now. Underneath that last paragraph, I'm going to click on the plus sign to add a block and I'm going to start typing in embed and then I'm going to grab the embed block. So here it's pretty simple. You're just going to enter a URL to embed here. So I have, and I'm only using it in the context of this video, I'm going to use learn its Twitter account for my embed URL. If you have an account, a Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, Instagram account, use your URL. So that URL is in that useful links Word document if you need to use it for demonstration purposes for this particular hands-on session. So once you have the URL in there, you go over to the right and you click on embed. And now I have learn it's Twitter feed on this page. Now there's a toolbar right above the embed block. And the first thing you see is the Twitter icon. And when I click on that, it just gives me the ability to transform it to paragraph, columns, or group. The middle, you can align it if you'd like. I have mine aligned center. Unroll means that it will import the entire Twitter thread directly into this page. You have an ability to edit the URL and then your other options are accessible from the ellipsis where you could copy or duplicate 
insert before, insert after, move it. You scroll down, a few other things. If I wanted to get rid of it, I could go to the very bottom and choose remove Twitter. I'm going to go up to my preview button in the upper right. I'm going to tell it to preview in a new tab. And when I look at it, what I like really that's cool about it is like the actual interface. So one of your visitors could actually follow your feed right from your page. And I'm back on my edit page and I'm going to go ahead and update this page. So our theme did not provide us with a social menu. And so we can create one in a theme that doesn't have it on a page by using the social icons block. It's not a menu per se, but your visitors will be able to visit your social media sites by using those icons, similar to what we did with the couple that we added as widgets in the right sidebar earlier, but on a page instead. So I'm going to go ahead and go back down to the bottom of this about me page. And I want to click the plus sign to add a new block. And if you need to, you can search for it. The social icons block is what it's called. I'm going to go ahead and grab it. And it tells you right in the block to click plus to add. And that's not adding a new block. That's giving you all of the social media icons that you could potentially add here. And notice that these are all underneath widgets. So the first one that I'm going to select, let's see, I'm going to go down and I'm going to choose Facebook. So it gives me the Facebook icon and I'm going to go ahead and add some more before I start configuring these. So I'm going to add LinkedIn and I'm not going to add Twitter since I have my live feed on the page, but I do want to add YouTube. I'm going to go back up and also add mail. And then I can go up to the upper left corner to the right of the W to close that block inserter. So the first thing I want to do with the social icon block is I want to move the mail icon to the first position. So I'm going to select it and then you'll see in the toolbar above it, I have the left arrow available. I'm going to move it left until it's in the first position. And you'll notice when you selected it, that it wants you to enter the email address so that when a visitor clicks on that mail icon, it will start an email already addressed to say you. So you need to configure it by entering an email address. And once you enter the email address, you're going to go ahead and click that circular arrow to apply it to that icon. For the Facebook icon, I'm going to configure it by using the Learn It Facebook URL, or you can use your Facebook URL or your company's Facebook URL. I'm also going to use the Learn It URLs for LinkedIn and YouTube, and they're in your Word document if you need to use them for this lesson. So I've configured all four of these buttons. Another way that you can move a button is by dragging it. So if I select the YouTube icon, when I look at the toolbar above, it has the YouTube icon and next to that, a double vertical ellipsis. When you hover over that ellipsis, it says drag. So if I click and hold, I can start dragging that icon to a different position. I'm comfortable with the position it was in. 
You also have the ability to change your items justification. So everything is justified left. You have center. You can control the space between your items as well from that. I'm just going to deselect that. I don't like them spaced that far apart. And you also have alignment options and sizing options. And I'm comfortable with the normal size. I've gone ahead and updated my page. And now I want to look at some of the block settings. So I'm going to select my social icons block. And remember when we used to be able to access settings from a gear icon? Well, now that's changed because of our theme and some plugins that we added. So I'm going to click on this new icon to the right of update to get to settings. So it opens up that panel on the right. I'm going to make sure my block is selected. So you'll notice here it's on the block tab and it has the social icons block, right? Here's the gear for settings. And then you have styles on the right. So there's our layout and our orientation. I don't want it to wrap to multiple lines. I only have four icons. I'd like it to open the links in a new tab. And you can turn on show labels to see what that looks like. That might be helpful for me since I refer to LinkedIn as Instagram. And then you have your permissions and advanced things that you don't need to worry about right now. Now we can go to the styles tab and we have a default style being used. You can say logos only on your style. I'm going to put it back on default, which has filled and your other choice is pill shape. So it seemed like it made them a little bit wider and that's fine. You have choices for icon color, right? It's using the default for each icon. Now, something else cool you can do, and before we do this, let's select our embed block for our Twitter feed and scroll to the bottom of it. And you'll see underneath it has the opportunity to add a caption. So I've just typed, please follow us as my caption for the Twitter feed. And now what we're going to do is with that feed, that Twitter feed still selected, I want to make sure that embed block is selected. We're going to go up to its menu bar and choose the options ellipsis. So the scenario here is that you may want to, in the future, add your tweets live feed and or your social media icons to other pages on your site. And instead of having to recreate the wheel, you can save these as reusable blocks. So on that options menu, you're going to select create reusable block. I'm going to name it Twitter feed. and save it. And then I'm going to scroll down after my page refreshes a little bit. And I'm going to select my social icons block and do the same thing. And I'm going to name this one social icons and mail. And go ahead and update your page. So what, now when I look at the toolbar above my social icons, you'll notice that it's showing me the icon for that it's a reusable block and what I named the block. And you can move those blocks around on the page. If I wanted to move it up, have it go above the Twitter feed, I could from there. And once you create a reusable block, when you go back to the options, you'll see that you can manage your reusable blocks or you can convert it back to a regular block. I'm going to go to manage reusable blocks. 
and it takes you to this screen where you'll see all of the reusable blocks that you've created in WordPress. And so you can go in like the social icons and mail block. I'm going to go ahead and edit that. And you see, it takes me to a page with just that on it, right? So on this page, I can change the title. I'm going to change it to, instead of cutting and pasting, I'll just retype. Mail and social media icons. And then I'm going to update it. So my reusable block has been updated. It's taking me back to post here. It said go to post, but it's taking me back to my reusable blocks. So I can see that the name is changed there. I'm going to have you change the name on your Twitter feed reusable block to live Twitter feed on your own. And if you're never going to use a reusable block again, you would come here and delete it. We're going to keep both of these. Now let's go back to pages. So now what I'm going to have you do is go back and view your about me page and test all of your social media icons in the social icon block to make sure they're going to where they need to be and that they're opening in a different tab. So now that you've tested your about me social media icons, let's go to edit our articles page. I'm just going to show you how to access a reusable block if you want to use a reusable block again. And so you would simply do the plus sign to add a block. And you should see your reusable blocks. They're in purple within all of the blocks that are available. So I have my mail and social media icons and my live Twitter feed. I'm going to go ahead and select the live Twitter feed and let my page update or refresh. And then I'm going to go to the bottom and I'm going to do the plus sign again to add another block and I'll choose my mail and social media icons. So whatever settings you have on these like open a new window will work because that's part of the reusable block. And I'm going to go ahead and update that page. And so when I do this, it lets me know what's been changed, right? The articles page has been modified, reusable blocks, showing just the live Twitter feed one. I'm going to go ahead and save. And it lets me know both my page and my site have been updated. Before we move on, I just want to make a note here. If you don't configure any of your social media icons, they just won't show up on the page. So if you forget to put in your Facebook URL, that icon just will not be on the page. I'm going to go back to my pages now. I'd like us to go down under appearance. Let's go down to widgets. Now that we have that social icons menu, Kind of doesn't make sense to have those social icons, well, the two that we have there in that main sidebar as widgets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that block that includes Facebook and Twitter. And we did this in the last module. And I'm going to do the options ellipses and remove social icons. And we're going to replace it with something else. So I'm going to do the plus sign to add another block. And I'm going to expand it so browse all. And I'm going to scroll down to widgets. And I think that maybe we can have the latest post over there. 
And then I'm also going to, let's see, main sidebar, right. That appears on the post and the pages. That's cool. And let's see what else we can add over there. I'm going to click right underneath those recent posts and hover underneath them and you'll see another plus sign to add another block. So I have latest posts. I'm going to go back to browse all and down to widgets again. And I'm going to choose latest comments. And I am going to see, I'm going to go ahead and update that. can always come back and change it. And I just want to go and take a look at this and see what it's going to look like. And I kind of like how that looks over there. So I have my recent post and then comments showing over on that right sidebar now instead of the social icons that we had there because we have them at the bottom of all of our pages and we have our live Twitter feed there as well. So in the previous module, we had used the widgets to display social media icons. You also learned how to add the social icon block to display social media icons. And now we're going to switch to a theme that includes a social menu. So I'm back on my themes page and I'm going to just scroll down until I see add new theme. And the name of the theme is explore. I just type that in and I'm going to hover over that theme. Now, of course, you're not obligated to keep this theme. You can always switch back to your other theme, but this one has a social menu. So I'm going to go ahead and install it and activate. So with my new theme activated, the first thing I'm going to do right on the top of the themes page is I'm going to click that visit site link so I can see what it looks like on my site. So it has a left sidebar and we don't have any widgets over there. We'll be customizing that. Still has my featured image here, All right? What we added over here is still there. When we changed our widgets before, it looks like this one likes the widgets on the left as opposed to the right. We can fix that. We still have our live feed. We still have our social icons block. Nothing has changed there. If I come over here and I go to like a recent article, what grows in my garden. So it shows more stuff up here and I'm viewing it right now, but it's showing my post where I had my gallery of photos. And it shows the one comment I have on that post. So what I'm going to do is up top, I'm going to click on customize. The best way to see where your menu locations are in a theme is by expanding menus on the customize panel and then expanding view all locations. So you can see that this theme has three locations. There's a social menu, a primary menu, and a footer menu. So your primary menu is already set, right? And that's showing up in the upper right hand corner. And then your social menu, if you do the drop down where it says select, it will direct you to either the primary or the secondary menu. We don't want either of those. Underneath that, we're going to click create new menu. And so we're going to give it a name and it's going to be called social media. And we want it to appear for the social menu. So we're good there. We're going to click next. 
And now we're going to click add items. And so you'll notice the custom links area is expanded. If not expand it, you could collapse pages, posts, anything else that might be expanded. And I'm going to use the Facebook URL here. So I'm going to just type it in or you can copy and paste it if you're using the one in the useful links document or type in your own. And then the link text, I'm going to just type Facebook. And then right underneath that, add to the menu. We're going to add another link. We'll add the link here for YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and get that one in there. and give it the text YouTube. So I'm not going to add any more right now. I'm going to just add these two just so you can see what this will look like when we're done. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the back arrow. So I have my social media is currently set to the social menu. Primary is currently set to primary. Let's go to secondary menu and you can see it there, right? That's where we have all of our categories. I'm going to do the back arrow, go down to view all locations and for the footer menu, select the secondary menu. And so we can look at this now. So your Primary menu is right here in the upper right hand corner and adjacent to it is your social menu and you'll see the Facebook icon and the YouTube icon up there, the two that we added. If I scroll all the way to the bottom of the page in the footer area, I will see my secondary menu, which are all the categories. Right. And it's also the hierarchy. So what I want to do is I want to edit that secondary footer menu. And I don't want it to be hierarchical. I just want it to be vegetables, herbs, and fruit and uncategorized. I'm going to get rid of bell peppers by removing it, clicking on it and removing it. For herbs, I'm going to click on it. I'm going to keep that vegetables, herbs. So I don't have to click on that one. I want to get rid of basil. So I'm going to just click on the ones and remove them. Cilantro, I'm going to remove mint, oregano, rosemary and thyme are getting removed as are cherry tomatoes and tomatoes. So I just want my parent categories and then I'm going to get rid of strawberries and then I'm going to click reorder and I can outdent herbs because I moved it and kind of messed it up. So it should be just a straight list, vegetable, herbs, fruit, and uncategorized. That's all I want on that footer menu. And you can see the change already down at the bottom of your page. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on, let's see, do the back arrow first, click on primary. And at the bottom, make sure it has automatically add new top level pages to this menu. That's the only one we would want that on. And then we're going to publish. And now you have experience with a social menu. And so again, not every theme has one. You've already seen that the name of this theme is explore and it happens to have that type of menu included in the theme. So if you look at my screen right now, I have my latest posts both on the left and the right sidebar. 
So in the customization screen, if you go under widgets, if you go to left sidebar, you'll click the plus sign and you'll scroll down until you get to the widgets area and you'll see latest posts. That's what I added there. So after you do that, after you add latest post on your left sidebar, do the back arrow. And then we're going to go into where it says header sidebar one. And we're going to add a heading for that left sidebar. So I'm going to do the plus sign, either the one at the top or the one in the middle, doesn't matter. And I'm going to choose heading under text. And where it says heading, I'm going to type latest post. And so the other thing I can do here now is if I look over it, right, I can change the heading level if I want it to be smaller or something like that or larger. You have that, what I call the squiggly arrow that says move to widget area. I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna choose left sidebar. So now it's showing, our header is showing on our left sidebar, but it's in the wrong order. So I'm going to click on the heading in the left sidebar. Notice it took us back to left sidebar here. And I'm gonna use the up arrow to move it up so that it is above the latest post. And you can see the result of that on my page. I'm gonna do the back arrow and go to expand right sidebar. And I'm gonna select my two posts here, right? What grows in my garden and about my garden. I'm gonna go to its options ellipsis go all the way to the bottom and remove latest post. I don't need it on both sidebars. So on the right sidebar, we just have recent comments or latest comments. I'm gonna do the back arrow on the customizer and I'm gonna go to header sidebar one. Somehow I was in two for recent post. And I'm gonna do the plus sign and add a heading and the heading is going to be latest comments. And then I'm gonna do its squiggly arrow and I'm gonna move it to the right sidebar. And then I just have to move it up. So there we have it, latest posts, latest comments. There's actually like a block here that doesn't need to be here. Some kind of a group, okay. Yeah, so now it's up where it needs to be. So there might be other things you wanna add to the sidebars. Let me go back to the left sidebar. And let me take a look at something. I think I want to add another widget here. Yeah, I'm going to add archives there on the left as well. So it end up having a bunch of months in there for post. And I'm going to do the back arrow. Let me go to header sidebar one. Hang on one second. Header sidebar two. Head a sidebar too. Let's change that recent post if you have that in there. Just change that to archives. And then use its squiggly arrow to move it to your left sidebar. And you're gonna move it up so it's above the archives. So on the left side, we have latest posts and archives. And on the right side, we have latest comments. And we can go ahead and publish. And then we can close our customizer. 
and I'm just able to look through. So all the menus. So now you have so many choices because we have the Twitter feed live on two of our pages, as well as the reusable block of social media icons. We have the social media icons on a social menu in this theme as well. I don't like redundancy. I don't think it needs to be in multiple places, but I wanted you to get the idea of how you can have integration with social media on your site. And again, later on in this module, we'll learn about auto sharing. So our second lesson, we're going to focus on podcasting, specifically the anchor podcast method, which is part of Spotify. So it has a convert to text feature that can be used on any post that converts it into text and into a podcast via Anchor. This is at no cost to you. It uses technology to convert your written words to spoken audio. So you would have to have a new Anchor account to link your WordPress account in Anchor and start creating podcasts from your existing post. Now, as soon as you are completed with the process of linking your WordPress.com account to Anchor, it will automatically grab your existing post and list them in Anchor. You would have to go back and manually on them do the text-to-speech feature so that then they become podcasts. And you'll learn how to do that in this lesson. So like I mentioned, you're going to need a new Anchor account. Existing Anchor accounts cannot be linked manually at this time. And you can also easily convert new posts that you're publishing on your site using the text-to-speech technology. This is pretty cool. In your useful links Word document, I'm going to go ahead and access the link that says Spotify for podcasters. And that's how we're going to set up an anchor account that we can connect to our WordPress account from this page. And so if you have an existing anchor account, you would have to create a new one in order to link it to WordPress. And it tells you that on this screen. So at the bottom, I'm going to click on get started. And the email that you use when you're creating this account should be the same as your WordPress email that you use. So go ahead and fill out your information here. After your information is filled out, you're going to have to let it know that you're not a robot at the bottom and then go ahead and click sign up. And you'll end up on this page before you can do anything. You need to verify your email address. So go to your email, make sure you check your junk email as well. And you should find the email that will let you verify this account. So I verified my email and I get this confirmation and I still have another screen open here for Spotify for podcasters. So this is the one where I originally verified my email from, right? And now what I'm going to do on this page is I'm going to connect my blog. Now you may have to log into your WordPress site. It just depends. But in my case, it's asking me if it can connect to my WordPress.com site. And so I'm going to go ahead and click approve. And now it's prompting me to log in. It lets me know that it's connecting my blog to Anchor. And it successfully was able to do that. And so this is the one where we can convert posts to audios for a podcast. And I'm going to simply click on got it. And here it's showing my two posts that are in here as episodes, right? Okay.
I'm going to go ahead and close my other Spotify for podcasters page where I verified the email. I don't need that. I'm going to leave this page open and I'm going to go back to my WordPress. From my post page, I'm going to go to the top and choose add new. And if your settings panel is not open on the right, go ahead and use your settings button to open it. And the title I'm going to use for this post is going to be, I just learned how to grow onions. And then I'm going to click right where it says type. And I don't have to choose the paragraph block. I can just type. So I am going to type, I just learned how to grow onions from onions. And it is so fascinating. And I really mean what I'm typing here. So I ultimately ended up with just the heading and then two very short paragraphs, which you can feel free to copy for this post. And then over on the settings panel on the right, I am going to add this to my vegetables category. And what's cool is that from there, I can add a new category because under vegetables, I just have my bell peppers, cherry tomatoes, and tomatoes. And now I would like to have onions under there as well. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new category. And its name is going to be onions. And its parent category is going to be vegetables. And then I'm going to click on add new category. So, and it already selected onions for this post as well, since we just added it, it figured you want to add a category while you're in this post because you want to use it in this post. And so now I've scrolled down to where it says featured image, and I'm going to click on set featured image. And it's an image that I don't have in the files from the video description, which you put in your media library. So we're going to go to open verse, which has plenty of free images that you can use without violating copyrights. So when I get in there in the search box, I'm going to type onion and press enter. And so several pictures of onions come up. I am going to, I'd actually like to select this one where you can see some of the fuzzy roots at the bottom. So I'm going to select that one and then I'm going to click the select button. And so it inserted the image. It will show on the post as the featured image, which is up top. So just a short post with a featured image in it. And what we're going to do now is go to the upper right and choose publish. So it's going to ask you, are you ready to publish? You see your visibility there and publish it immediately. Again, publishing our pages. When we launch our site, everyone who visits the site will be able to see them, but we haven't launched this site yet. It gives me a suggestion to add tags. I haven't set up any tags. I've only used categories, share to post, social previews, all of this stuff. And so this activates subscriptions. I believe it's from the members plugin down at the bottom. There's your Yoast SEO stuff. And all the way at the bottom, it says always show pre-published checks. If you don't want it to show them, then you can uncheck it and you won't get this verification. I'm going to go ahead and publish again. So now that I've published, what will normally show on your settings pane 
is a convert to audio button. If it's not there, that's fine because we can still do this. I'm gonna go ahead and close that settings panel and I am going to just get out of my post, go back to my post page. And so now I've come over to my anchor screen and I'm on the episodes tab at the top and you'll see over on this screen, over to the right, it will say import one new blog post. So when we first set up our anchor account, it went and grabbed our existing post. I'm gonna go ahead and click on import one new blog post. And now we can see my, I just learned how to grow onions. And I'm gonna click on create episode. And so on my screen, the first thing that popped up is it wants to use my microphone. And I'm going to block that. And you notice I get all of this red text, you know, unable to get access to your microphone. Well, that's because there were two choices, right? I want it to automatically convert to audio or I can record it myself from here using my microphone. And so on the screen, create episode, it gives you the paragraphs that you put in that new blog post, right? So if you want it to record it yourself, you have the script right in front of you on the screen. What I'm gonna do is go to the bottom and automatically convert to audio. And then you have two voices to choose from. Remy is, I believe, the female voice and Cassidy is the male voice. I can preview both of these, so I'll click on preview. This is an audio preview of what your blog post could sound like. Anchor is the easiest way to create a podcast. Built and, upload and then I'll click on Cassidy. I'm going to go ahead and select Remy because it's the female voice and I'm a female and I'm going to continue. So it's going to take a few minutes to convert text to audio. And when it's done, it gives me the ability to preview what it converted from text to speech. I just learned how to grow onions from onions and it is so fascinating. I had and then I can go down and save and continue. And it takes you to the editing episode screen where you can access all of these options on the left. Over here, it shows the episode and its length, right? And I'm gonna just go ahead to save episode. So now I'm looking at some episode options. I'm going to go ahead and do the purple next button there. So it's showing my podcast information here and it's taking information from my WordPress site. And I'm going to assign this a category. I'm going to scroll down here. There's a category called home and garden. That's going to be my category. And for the language, I'm gonna choose English and continue. It's taking me through all these steps. I can search for a photo here. And so we used OpenVerse on the post page, which gives us access to completely free images. And this is powered by Unsplash, which does the same thing. So I've already typed an onion as my search term and I'm just gonna select the two onion for my podcast cover art here and choose continue. And on the add text screen, it has the name of my blog, it's in white. I'm gonna change the color to black cause I think it shows better over that picture. And then I'm gonna just choose update cover art at the bottom. And on this screen, it will allow me to publish my podcasts on spot on Spotify. And in the next step, you would be able to distribute it to more platforms if you wanted to.
It lets me know it'll be live shortly. I'm going to just click continue. If you did have the convert to text button on your post settings, it would have brought you right here to this episodes page and you would have seen the one episode ready for uploading, just like we did when we came over here. And so now that we have our episode, we are going to click on it. And down here, you see a couple of icons, right? Facebook, Twitter, you see copy link, and then you see copy embed. We're going to click on copy embed. And it lets you know that it's copied. And now I'm going to go back to my WordPress and I'm on my pages screen and up top, I'm going to select add new. So the title for this page is going to be blog podcast. And so just to be clear, there are podcast player plugins. There's a built-in podcast player. There's also a built-in Spotify block. They're not going to work for this. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to the plus sign and we're going to search for the custom HTML block and select it. And then you're going to control V and paste in that embed code. And so what this is going to do is it's going to convert it into a podcast player on that HTML toolbar, click on preview and you'll see that it has your post and it's able to be played. Now let's go ahead and publish that page. And over on the right, I can click on view page. So now I'm on my blog podcast page. It has this audio for that one post. And also it added blog podcast to my primary menu because that menu is set to add any top level pages to it automatically. So I'm back on my podcasters site and I'm going to go back up to episodes on the top. And so my other two posts, right? We did a new post and we came in here and we created an episode out of it. When we first set up this account, it grabbed our existing posts and brought them in, but it didn't make them into episodes. So I'm going to click on my create episode for what grows in my garden. And again, because I don't want to record it myself, I'm going to scroll to the bottom and automatically convert to audio. And I am going to use Remy's voice, the female voice and continue. And this one was slightly longer, so it took a little while. And now it's, this one is one minute and one second long. I can listen to a preview vegetables Rent. and I'm going to choose save and continue. And then I'm just going to save changes on the right. So it gives me the episode options and I am just going to publish now like we did before. And I'm going to close that pop up. I'm going to go back to episodes. And so for the last one about my garden or your last post, go ahead and create an episode out of that and have it convert text to speech. And I'm going to go ahead and save and continue it. And when I go back to my episodes, after I'm done with the process, all three of those posts have been converted to audio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the what grows in my garden episode, click on it, and I'm going to grab copy its embed code and go back to your WordPress 
pages and I'm going to edit the blog podcast page. I'm going to do the plus sign under that custom HTML block and I'm going to add a custom HTML block and I'm going to paste that embed code into it for what grows in my garden. I'm going to click on preview on its toolbar. And so you can see that it looks like that there. The upper one I'm going to preview as well. And now I'm going to switch back over to my anchor podcasting site. And you're going to grab the embed code for the about my garden post and come back to this page. And once I have that embed code copied, I'm going to do the plus sign and you're going to do the same thing that we've done for these other two here on your own. And now I'm going to go ahead and update this page. and I can catch the link to view the page in the bottom left. So now I have three of my posts on my blog podcast. And that's because we created that anchor account and we have the ability to go in and copy that embed code and use the custom HTML block. Again, I tested this. I used the built-in podcast block. I used the Spotify block. And I even downloaded a podcast plugin and used that in a block and it didn't work. The only way I could get it to work is by using the embed code in a custom HTML block. So I'm showing you a Word document that's in the files for the video description. It's called Why I Started Gardening. And it's slightly longer than the other posts that I have up there. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you on your own create another post using this content and you can copy and paste it. You're going to name the post why I started gardening, the name of the document. And then you're going to go to your Spotify for podcasters account, your anchor account and have it convert text to speech. And then you're going to grab its embed code and add it to the podcast page. So go ahead and get started on that. And when you are done, your blog podcast page should look like this. So let's talk about HTTPS and SSL. We'll start with some descriptions here. HTTP equals hypertext transfer protocol. It's the application protocol through which all data communication on the web happens. HTTP helps users retrieve web pages. And then when you add the S to it, it is a security enhanced version of HTTP. And then you have SSL. That is secure socket layer. It uses both asymmetric and symmetric encryption to protect the confidentiality and integrity of data in transit on the web. TLS is transport security layer, and that is a successor to SSL. So the difference between HTTP and HTTPS. HTTPS is HTTP with encryption and verification. The only difference really between the two protocols is that HTTPS uses TLS, the successor to SSL, to encrypt normal HTTP requests and responses and to digitally sign those requests and responses. As a result, it is more secure than HTTP. So I have this on a secondary slide for you, 
And a website must have an SSL TLS certificate for their web server domain name to use SSL slash TLS encryption. So my site, because of my host, when I created my site, it already switched to HTTPS because my SSL certificate is already set up on the server that is administered by my host, which is Bluehost. And since version 5.7 WordPress, if an SSL certificate is already set up on your server, it will automatically switch it to HTTPS. Now I will show you when we go back over to WordPress in just a second, there's another place where you can kind of add an S to HTTP, but I wouldn't recommend doing it. I would go through my host if your site URL doesn't already start with HTTPS, but I'll show it to you now. So you could just look up at your URL and see if it starts with HTTPS. Another thing that you can do in WordPress is on your left navigation, you can go to tools, site health. And if you don't have HTTPS for your site in site health, you will have a critical warning there. So you would have a critical warning here, letting you know that your site is not configured for HTTPS. Now I mentioned that you could change it in one location within WordPress, but I don't recommend you doing that. I would really get in touch with my provider if my site is not into HTTPS, but I will show this to you anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to settings and then go into general settings. So again, you can see here that both my WordPress address URL and my site address URL both begin with the HTTPS. What I've been told is that if yours says HTTP there, you can change it by just adding the S to both of them. Again, I don't really recommend that. It's always been done for me by my hosting provider. So, one of the things that I said I would do here at the end of this module is we're going to go back to the integrating social media topic so that you can learn to use the auto sharing feature. And so the thing is, is that your site has to be launched in order to use this feature. So one of the things I do before I launch my site, well, there's a few things we're going to do here. I want to go back to tools on the left side and go back to site health. So on mine, I have three recommended improvements, right? Two of them are security based and one of them is a performance based one. So if I do the down arrow on any of them, it gives me information about all of those recommendations. So for the persistent object cache that I have, it's basically directing me to my hosting provider and they can tell me if a persistent object cache can be enabled on my site. It says that my host appears to support it and I can get in touch with my host directly for that or I can read more information about it here. I'm going to leave that one alone for now. I will get in touch with my host about it at some point. So I'm going to collapse it. And then it's telling me that I should remove inactive plugins and inactive themes. You can always install and activate them again if you need to use them again. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to appearance and we're going to go to themes. And right now, the only theme that we're using is that explore theme. 
and we chose that one because it had a social menu, right? I'm going to just keep that theme on. And for every other theme that's sitting there, I am going to click on the theme details. And then in the lower right corner, I'm going to delete the theme. Again, these are all themes that I can go back and get. So delete all of your themes except your active theme. And so there I'm done with that process. I only have my active theme left. And then also on the left, I'm going to make my way to installed plugins. and see if there's any in there that I'm not using. So the Google Analytics for WordPress for, by Monster Insights, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that plugin. Anything that has deactivate is active, so I'm just looking for any that say activate. Sinatra Core goes with the theme that I deleted, so that's a plugin. I'm going to delete that plugin. And I'm just looking, and that's it. So now I'm going to go back to Tools, Site Health. So now it's telling me that I should have a default theme available. I'm going to expand that right? So it's telling me that your site has one installed theme and it's up to date. Your site does not have any default theme. Default themes are used by WordPress automatically if anything is wrong with your chosen theme. So right from there, I can use the manage your themes link. And I'm back in themes. And since we got rid of all the inactive themes, we don't have that plus sign to add a new theme. But if you look up at the top, you can click on wordpress.org themes and it takes you to the add themes page. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to search for a theme called 2021. Let's see what comes up. And I'm going to install that one. I'm not going to activate it. It'd be like my backup theme. That was my original theme when we started this course. So I'm going to just leave that hanging out there. I'm going to go back to tools, site health, and see if it's yelling at me about anything else. Okay, so I have a scheduled event is late. I'm going to just see what it is. So I'm good with the two that are there right now. I'm good with my site health is good as it shows at the top. So now we're ready to launch our site so that we can use this auto sharing feature. So I'm going to just go up to the tab where it says site status coming soon. When I hover over coming soon, it says launch your site. I'm going to click that. So right now, anybody that goes to my URL will see a coming soon page. So now I'm on my hosting providers page, right? And again, I use Bluehost. So it's telling you what to do. You know, here's some things that they recommend before launching your site. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just go all the way to the bottom of that list and I'm going to choose launch with confidence. So then it tells me your site has a coming soon message. It's telling you to check out our pre-publishing checklist and then launch with confidence. I'm going to go ahead and click launch your site. As soon as I launch it, it gives me a button that will let me restore coming soon. And again, this is attached. Look where I am here. I'm on my hosting provider's homepage 
at this point. When I refresh this page, the tab updates to site status live. So now it's a live site. Okay, so now we can use this auto sharing feature. So I just want to show you something. This would be the quote unquote normal way of using the auto sharing feature. And on the left, I'm going to go and hover over tools. And what I want you to notice there is that you do not have a marketing section on tools. And that would be the normal way because we are using Jetpack on this site. On the left side, I'm going to go over and hover over Jetpack and choose settings. And then at the top, I'm going to go to the sharing tab. So your Jetpack social connections is automatically going to share your post to social networks. And we have to connect our social networks. And then it has sharing buttons. If you want to add sharing buttons, I chose to add like buttons for my post and pages, right? And then here you're going to click on that link that says connect your social media accounts. So it opens my site on a new tab. And if you look on the left and hover over tools, you'll see that I have different choices here. This is because it's doing it from Jetpack. So that's where I'll see marketing under tools. And then up at the top, you're going to go to connections. And here you have the choice to share on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Tumblr. I am going to connect to my Twitter account. So on the right, I'm going to click connect. So because we have Jetpack, it is taking over this whole process, right? It's using what used to be called publicize. It's the same thing that you would be doing if we didn't have Jetpack on. Your site still had to be published in order for us to do this or launched. So I'm going to just put in my information for Twitter here, and then I'm going to click on authorize app. So now you can see that my Twitter account was successfully connected and now it has a disconnect instead of a connect button. So it will share any posts that I make to my Twitter feed automatically. So what I'm going to have you do on your own is go ahead and create a new post and then check your Twitter or whatever social network you connect it to, to see if that post is showing there. One thing I will point out here, so I just have a post screen up and on the right side now, there are Twitter settings. I can share a link to this post to Twitter. I can share the content of this post as a Twitter thread. So it's a single tweet or a thread. So I'm going to leave it on single tweet. And I'm going to go ahead and publish. So in my Twitter account, I can see here's my post testing, sharing gardening is my peace blog. And this is all I put in there testing to see if this post shows on my Twitter feed, by the way, um, you'll see that I joined Twitter, uh, this account in like last month, this is just a training account for me. So I can show you things like this. It's not my real Twitter account. So anyway, you can see that that sharing is working. And by the way, once you automatically share your post to social networks, if you should delete that post in WordPress, it won't automatically delete it from your social networks. You would have to do it manually. So I went ahead and did that with that test sharing message. I deleted the post and then I went to my Twitter account and deleted the tweet.
in module four, we focused on social media integration, podcasting, and HTTPS. So we got started with integrating social media on your site. We used a social media feed on your site. So we actually had added our live Twitter feed using the embed block on a page. And then we learned how to use a social icons block where we added email, I believe Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And you learned how to configure those social icons. And you know that if you don't configure any of them, they will not show up on the page. And then we tested the icons. We used some settings to make sure that on the page, when a visitor selects an icon, it opens the links in a new tab. And we actually made that social icons block and our social media feed embed block into reusable blocks and learned how to access them on a different page. We then went into creating a social menu. So we switched themes and found a theme that included a social menu and we configured it. And the theme that we used was explore. So you learned how to configure all of that. So you have a lot of choices now on how to integrate social media on your site. Then we moved into podcasting and you learned how to use Anchor via Spotify. So we set up an account in Anchor. And after that, we did a new post. And after we published it, we went back to the Anchor site and we were able to upload it and convert it to text. And then we went back ultimately and the two existing posts that we had when we set up our anchor account, pulled those over, we ultimately converted those into podcasts as well. You learned how to grab the embed code from each podcast. And we started a new page and we used the custom HTML block to paste the code in and then preview it and you saw the podcast player. So we ended up adding three of our posts to the blog podcast page. After that, we reviewed information about HTTPS and SSL. We went into our site and, you know, my host already has my site switched to HTTPS. Although you could go to settings general in WordPress admin and change the site address URLs to HTTPS by adding the S if necessary. I recommend it that you don't do it that way, that you get in touch with your hosting provider and see if they can do it for you. And also you learned that tools site health will give you a critical issue if your website doesn't use HTTPS. After we reviewed all of that, we launched our site so that we could use the auto sharing feature, which we access via Jetpack. So we went up to Jetpack settings and sharing and we set up a connection. I connect it to my Twitter account and I also added like buttons. So every time I create a post, it will automatically share it on my Twitter feed. And you saw that. And you also learned that if you then delete that post, it does not delete it from your feed. You would have to go to your Twitter and delete it, which I did. In module five, we're going to create a non-blog website. We're going to start by going over some website creation basics. 
And then we'll move on to learning about how to create static websites and the difference between static and dynamic websites. Lesson three will see us using corporate and business websites. And in the final lesson in this module, we'll be using one page websites. Toward the end of our last module, we made our site live so that we could use the auto share feature via Jetpack. And now we're going to be making more changes to our site. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a plugin that will display a coming soon page. And so no one will be able to access our site like it's under construction. And so I'm on the plugins page and I'm going to add new. And I'm going to search for nifty coming soon, nifty coming soon. So here's the nifty coming soon plugin. Notice it has over 20,000 active installations. It's got five star ratings. It was last updated about two months ago and it is compatible with my version of WordPress. I'm going to go ahead and install now and then I'm going to activate it. So once it's activated, you'll see up at the top of my window here, I have a red tab saying nifty coming soon is enabled. It automatically enables it. Let's take a look at some of its settings. So it resides on the left sidebar underneath security security, you'll see nifty options. And so here you can look at the plugin documentation. It has premium versions, so on and so forth. You're going to click on customize coming soon. And it opens a customizer for nifty options. So we can go through some of these settings just to show you one of the things I don't like is like the animation on the text. I find that distracting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at general settings and you can see that it's enabled. That's why it came up automatically. It has a page title for SEO. It, it took the name of my blog and it added is coming soon. The page description, I'm fine with it. That's also for SEO. It gives you information how to keep it between 50 and 300 characters. We are doing some work on our site. Please be patient. Thank you. There are other sections under general settings as well for some code. I'm going to do the back arrow here and you can expand layout. So it's showing a logo there. There's the nifty coming soon logo. It's showing animated text and I don't want the text animated, right? So I can use the eyeball to hide that feature. The countdown I'm good with and you can customize that as well as the slider. So if we do the back arrow to get back to our options. You can change the font and everything, background. Then there's the logo, animated text. I'm going to click on logo and I'll just use their logo for right now. I don't need to do too much changing to this. The animated text I'm going to go through. I'm going to turn off the animation there and then I can go back and show it and it just won't be animated. So I'm going to do the back arrow, the countdown. Like I said, I can set it for a target date kind of thing. I'm good with the countdown. I'm going to go back. You have a slider option. So there are slider blocks here. There's contact. That's the one of them there subscription, social. I'm going to hide subscription and social using the eyeball. And 
I'm going to go back again. Don't need to do anything else, I think, except go back to layout. And I can click the eyeball to get the text back on there. It's just not animated anymore. And then I'm going to publish. So the thing is, is that it is already enabled. Now, in my case, if I go to visit my site here, I'm going to just close out of there. If I go and visit my site, it doesn't appear to be enabled here. But if I go, even though it's saying nifty coming soon is enabled. And by the way, if I click on that, it takes me back to that customization screen. So when I log in on my other computer, if I go to my site, that's when I will see the nifty. So if you have another computer, go to your site and you should be able to see the coming soon screen. I was actually able to just do a new private in private window on my browser. And so when I type in the URL for my site, this is what it's going to say. And I'm happy with this right now. It still looks like it's animating the text, but I'm not going to worry about that. I can come back, put in, you know, a, a logo so it just doesn't say nifty coming soon plug in there, but I'm good with this for right now. If you want to modify yours some more, go ahead and do so. And we're going to get into module five. So I am going to have us do two other things just to protect our current site. And some might call it overkill, but the first thing I'm going to do is export all of the content on my site as it is right now. And so on the left nav, you're going to go down to tools and you're going to choose export. It creates an XML file for you to save to your computer, right? It will contain your posts, pages, comments, custom fields, categories, tags, if you have any. And once you save the download file, you can then use the import function to import the content back into this site or even into another WordPress installation. So I'm going to just export all content instead of, and it lets you know it contains all of those things, or you can export one thing at a time. So I am going to go ahead now, notice here when you do all, it doesn't export your media. So I'm going to export all content first by just downloading that export file. And it's in my downloads. And then I'm going to select the media option button. And I'm not going to select any dates. I don't think it's required for me to select a date. We'll see. And I'm going to try to click on download export file. So I have two of them. One is my media, one is everything else. And they're in my download folder. So now I want to go ahead and create a backup of this site. And so I'm going to just go back to pages because then I can get out of here. And we used Updraft Plus earlier to create a backup. So I'm going to go up to my top toolbar, hover over backup, um, excuse me, updraft plus and choose backup restore. And then I'm going to just click my backup now button. And I'm going to leave the default settings and backup now. And so you can see that the backup succeeded and is now complete. So now we're ready to move on. Our first lesson, the basics, is just for your future reference. All of these things have been done on our current site already, some of them during this course. So in our beginner course, we were able to set up our domain name and hosting provider and install WordPress, right? We also chose a theme. The focus on the beginner course was a blog site, so we chose our theme for our blog. We added posts and pages to the website. We customized it, installed plugins. We optimized the site to increase page speed. 
and we enhanced security during this course. So again, just for your future reference, so if you have it, another thing that you could add to this slide is visiting other WordPress site examples to get some inspiration for what you want to do. Lesson two is about static websites. And I added dynamic websites to this. So I'm going to be giving you the pros and cons of both. So let's go over this. Static website is made up of a collection of static pages or pages that don't change, or at least not very often, created by HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In its simplest form, each web page is represented as an HTML file visitors access while browsing a website. Static websites appear the same for every visitor who accesses them, and the only way to change this is to modify the source files. They can have interactive elements like web forms, although those elements cannot be tailored per individual user. So when the internet first started, most websites were static. Now, dynamic websites generate content on the fly, loading it from a database. The dynamic content on pages can be tailored to the visitor's needs based on visitor behavior. This means a dynamic site can present different information to different visitors. They typically have a content management system, CMS, or a web framework at its core, and they work best for websites that require frequent content updates. So these days, most websites belong to another category known as hybrid websites. Hybrid websites have a set of static web pages, the content that doesn't change very often, as well as a set of dynamic web pages. For example, you can blend some static and dynamic functionality on your company's website with a set of static pages, for example, about us or our mission, as well as dynamic ones, pages where content changes frequently, such as a blog. And the site that we've been working on, the blog site, is a hybrid site. It has static pages. My, I think about my garden page is pretty static. It's not going to change. And then we have our other pages, like our podcast player page, where the content changes frequently, as well as our blog pages. So here's the pros and cons of static websites. Three of each. Ease of creation. So it doesn't require any logic for content loading from a database. Good performance. It requires minimal backend processing and a better level of security since they require much fewer tech building blocks to perform. They are less affected by security issues. Now the cons, time consuming content management. If you want to modify content, you need to access source code. Poor scalability. If you need to add a hundred new pages to your site, you need to create all 100 manually and every page will be built as a separate entity. That does not sound like fun at all. And finally, static websites are unable to offer tailor experiences, allow limited or no personalization and customization for visitors. And then we have the pros and cons of dynamic websites. Pros, ease of content management. Changes can be done in one place and applied across all pages. Think about using the customizer, right? When we added widgets, they showed on all of our pages. Easy to update the visual design by using themes. And it provides a better visitor experience. It's possible to use user location and cookies to offer tailored experiences to visitors. Cons. It's a more complex web design process. You must invest time in creating business logic. Now, my provider is doing that all behind the scenes. That's where the database resides. 
Rules on how content will be organized in a database and accessed by visitors. Again, my hosting provider is taking care of that for me. Could lead to a higher cost of creation. It could require some technical expertise, maybe coding or how to use CMS, but WordPress makes it really easy for non-technical persons to create high quality sites. And then there are performance and security problems, which we've already addressed in this course. Because there are more technical components, each component can affect the performance and be vulnerable to a security breach. So again, nowadays, most sites are hybrid, having some static pages and then other dynamic content. In the files in the video description, you'll see a folder called business website. And within that folder are two word documents and another folder called business website images. So these are the two word documents. The goal behind this is so you don't have to do a lot of typing while we're creating our business website. And by the way, the type of site that I'm creating is a software consulting site because I actually have a software consulting business. And so these two documents will decrease your typing. So this document is called pages and post for business website. And it has our mission statement stuff that we're going to use for pages. And I actually have placeholder text in here. So when I create a who we are page at some point in the future, I would like it to have a sub page called meet the team and add the bios and pics for myself and my team. And so this other page is going to be entitled what we consult on. And so it has a list of applications that we do consult on that we want to put on that page. And so the other thing is you want to have open that images for business website folder as well, because we're going to start by getting these images into our media library. Now I don't want you to do that yet because we're going to grab a plugin so that we're able to create folders in our media library first. You'll notice in the default WordPress media library, you don't have any capability to create folders to organize your media. And so, I mean, it has a filter by default. It's showing all media items. So you could right now, I only have images, but if you had audio, video, things of that nature, you'd be able to filter by those, but you can't organize them in folders. So we're going to use a plugin that will give us the ability to create folders in our media library so that I can keep the gardening blog images separate from the business website that we're going to build images. I'm going to go ahead and go to plugins and add new. And the one you want to search for is called real media library. You'll see that it has over 70,000 active installations. It has almost a five star rating, like four and a half star rating. And it was last updated three weeks ago and is compatible with my version of WordPress. So it meets all of our criteria again for security reasons. I'm going to go ahead and choose install now. And after it's installed, I'm going to activate it and it lets me know the plugin is activated and I'm going to close that pop-up at the top and go back to my media library. So it's telling me I have this left panel now and it's telling me that I have 17 images. Again, all of them are for my gardening blog at this point. And it automatically creates an unorganized category. So all of my files are unorganized at this point. 
It tells me I have no folders found because I haven't created any yet. So to the right of the folders panel, the word folders at the top, there is a plus sign where you can create a new folder and it's already set for you to name it. And I'm going to name it gardening blog. So the ones that are in here, I can get organized first. And I'm going to press enter. It gives me a message. It created that folder. I am going to select that folder. And when I go into it, it lets me know that no media files were found. On the left, I'm going to go back to all files. And I'm going to click the checkbox right underneath bulk actions to select all of those gardening images. And once it's selected, I'm going to click and hold on the first image and start dragging them to that gardening blog folder. It lets me know that it's moving 17 files. So now when I open that folder, that's what it's showing there, that gardening blog folder, and I have zero media unorganized. So now I'm going to go back to unorganized and it'll be empty, right? So we're going to add another folder now for our business website images. So go ahead and do that and call it business website. So once we have our business website folder on our left sidebar, we're going to go to add new under media. And when you get in here, you'll just see unorganized. Again, this is because of the plugin. And so I'm going to click on unorganized and then I'll see the folders that we've created. I'm going to click on the business website folder. And so now it says business website and I can select the files or drop files here to upload. So we want to grab all of the files in the images for business website folder and get them in here. Once all the files are uploaded, I'm going to go back on the left to library. And notice on the left, it's currently showing 32. It's showing all files. And if I want to just get to my business website files, I can click on that folder. And that's what I'd like you to do. So one of the things I like to do upon uploading media to the library is I like to go ahead and edit the images and at least give it some alternative text so that if anybody is viewing the site using a screen reader, it will give the alternative text. It will read out the alternative text. And so you don't have to do this. You could do it later in the process when you use the image, but I tend to like to do it up front and that way I don't forget later. And so in order to do that, you would just edit every image. And this is the Boucheron corporate logo. You can see what I put in for my alternative text. So out of all of the files that we updated for the business website, let me just go into that folder. There are corporate logos and then there are application logos. So you have Boucheron, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, corporate logos. This is an application and it could just be called SSRS logo, VBA logo, SQL logo. This one would be Power Automate logo, Power BI logo. There's a couple more, our corporate logo, Gucci corporate logo, and DaVita Dialysis corporate logo. And then you have three that are called Power BI Viz, one, two, and three. Those are just Power BI visualizations. The second one is a Power BI multi visualization. And again, that's only if you want to go ahead and put in alternative text. It's not a required step. I will say that adding alternative text to your images or media files really helps your site become more accessible. So now let's go ahead and go to pages. 
and we're going to get started. And we know that our coming soon page is enabled. So, you know, we talked about hybrid sites where you have static pages. I'm not going to do anything about my blog pages at this point. I might set up a blog site at some point in the future or just convert this back to a blog site at the end. And so what we're going to do here is just add our new pages using that Word document, Pages and Posts, that I gave you. So my idea here is to create one page, and then we'll choose a different theme, and then we'll create the other pages. We'll find a theme that's better suited for our site. And so I'm going to go ahead and add a new page. And the title is going to be mission statement. We're going from top to bottom in that word document. And then I'm going to click where it says type because it's all paragraphs. And I'm going to go ahead and select that one paragraph in the word document, copy it, and then come over here and paste it. I'm going to click underneath there. So this is what we want on our page mission statement. So what I'm going to do now is I can go up and preview it in a new tab and see what it looks like with our current theme. And what I'll say here is I'm seeing the text mission statement and that paragraph, but notice even though we're using nifty coming soon, when I view it this way, I'm still seeing everything on the left and right sidebars based on this theme. And we're going to fix all of that. So nothing about the blog, including the name at the top and my tagline, the enthusiastic gardener is going to show when we're done. So I'm going to just get back to my pages. And you'll notice because I didn't go back and save it, my mission statement is in draft mode. I'm going to just go ahead and edit it real quick. So at the page level, one way that you can get rid of those sidebars is if you scroll down, if you have your settings panel open on the right and you scroll down, you'll see that it has the default layout from the current theme and the current theme has both a left and a right sidebar. I am going to select no sidebar full width and I'm going to go up and save a draft again. And then I'm going to go to preview and preview it again in a new tab. And so for this particular mission statement page, we don't have the sidebars. We still have some other gardening stuff on here. Our menus are going to need to be customized, all of that kind of stuff. We might want to get rid of some of the social icons. So we'll be cleaning it up, but I just wanted to show you one way of getting rid of those sidebars. Now, if we're going to want to make the mission statement our home page, it needs to be published. And it's okay if we publish it because we have our coming soon enabled. So what I can do is I can just do, I think I can do it from quick edit here. Let's see. Oh, no. Yeah, the status on the right. And I'm going to just choose published. And then there's an update button. So now we are going to go ahead and change a couple of things. And then we're going to find the theme that we're going to use and look for one that doesn't have those sidebars. So the first thing I want to do is I want to change my site name and tagline. And so you're going to do that by going to general settings. And so I'm going to put as my site title, Connor Cato Consulting. I'm 
I'm going to put elevate your skills as my tagline. So that will change once you scroll to the bottom and click on save changes. And now I've gone to reading settings and I'm going to change my home page to the mission statement. That's why we had to publish it. If you have it in draft, it won't show on this drop down. And for my post page, I'm going to just choose select. And then at the bottom, save changes. So now I'm on the themes page under appearance. And the thing is, is that a theme, um, we went over earlier factors to consider when you're choosing a theme. This is a software consulting uh, website. I'm going to give you some free reign here. So I'd like you to find a theme that works for you. It doesn't have to work for me. Find a theme that works for you. Try to find a theme. It doesn't need a social menu. Try to find a theme that doesn't have any sidebars, but at least has two different menus. Most of them have two different menus, but we want one without a sidebar. So go ahead and find a theme that you can use for our business website. So I found a theme that I like and I'm in customize. So you can see that I picked a theme called 2017. It doesn't have any sidebars. It has a couple of menu locations. Normally when I activate a theme, I like to come and look at menus if it doesn't have a detailed description. So this one has a primary menu, which is currently set to the top menu. There's a secondary menu, and then there is a social media menu. You're not required to use all of these menus. And so this is right here. And again, we're going to change it so it doesn't have any of our blog stuff on it. But you can see that is known as the top menu. And I like the look of the site. There's the mission statement. And of course, I'm going to get rid of some of these other widgets from the blog site. I'm going to just do the back arrow right now. And before I do any customization to this, I would like to add more pages and then customize. So I'm going to just do the X at the top of the customize panel. One of the things I want to do on the pages screen is I'm going to do the check mark in front of title to select all of the pages. And then I'm going to uncheck mission statement and that draft privacy policy. I'm going to go to the bulk actions drop down and select edit and then the apply button. And I'm going to change the status of these gardening blog pages to private this time. So it won't be visible to the public if we were to relaunch this site. Even if they know the URL, they won't be able to see it. It's only available for authorized users who are logged into the dashboard. So that's why I decided to go private on these at this point. Now draft is like if you're working on a page and you need to finish it later, you can save it as a draft. It's like that privacy policy page included in WordPress core that they give you. If you want to use it, you can make changes to it and then you can publish it. So, and you know, the only other status here is pending review, depending on user capabilities, they may not automatically be able to post pages and things like, or post. And so they need to be reviewed first by someone with the right capabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and click update here. And then we're going to add a new page. So we're going to use the who we are paragraph.
and then I'm going to publish. And go back to pages. And now I'm going to have you create the process page on your own, as well as the other services page and publish the process page. Leave the other services page in edit mode when you're done. So I want to add some more text manually to this page and do a couple of format changes. So for documentation, I'm going to just click on it and on its toolbar, I'm going to click the paragraph symbol and I'm going to change it to a heading. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to have you do the same with video one-on-one -on -one training sessions and group training sessions. And then let's change all of the headings from H2 right on their toolbars to H3 to make them just a little bit smaller. And so I've just collapsed my Yoast SEO and content permission pane. So I have more working room and I'm going to hover underneath documentation and click the plus sign to add a block and I'm going to choose paragraph and I'm going to just type one sentence and you can take a moment and copy that paragraph. We're going to insert a paragraph underneath video, a shorter sentence. So here are the rest of the sentences that I added for the other headings. And when you're done getting them in, we can go ahead and publish this page. So we are going to add a couple of more pages together now. Let's go ahead and click on add new. And let's name this page previous clients. And then I'm going to click the plus sign to add a block. I'm going to type the letter G and select the gallery block. And we'll see if this looks okay. So I want to use it for some of the corporate logos that are now in our media library. So I'm going to choose select images, go to the media library, and it's telling me at the top, no folder is selected. So I'm going to click on that because of our real media plugin. And I'm going to just choose business website. And so let's see, we have three, I have five corporate logos. So I'm going to start with uh, Boucheron, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Gucci, and DaVita Dialysis. And I think I put the caption in the wrong place for DaVita, so I'm going to just see if I can cut that and put it in alt text. And now in the bottom right, I'm going to say create a new gallery. Well, I did say it, but I clicked the button as well. So we don't have to put captions on any of these. I don't know why there are question marks coming in under Bank of America, but I'm going to let it go by deleting it. And then I'm going to insert the gallery. And I do not like the way this looks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select it. 
And then I am going to click on its option button. And at the bottom, I want to make sure I have set for gallery. Make sure I have that whole thing selected and not just an image in it. There, now it's selected. Now I can go to its options and remove the gallery. And so for right now, I'm going to just type the names of the previous clients and then I'll make a note. I would have to go and edit all of those media files with the logos to get them sized properly so they look good together in a gallery. And I don't want to take the time in the course to do that right now. So we're just going to list these companies in a bulleted list block. So I'm going to do the plus sign and I'm going to just type list and I'm going to select list. So it defaults the bullets and that's what I want to use. So we're going to type each company as a separate bullet point for now. And there is our list. Let's go ahead and publish it after you get your list filled in. Publish the page. And I'm back on pages. So now we're going to go back and customize. So I'm just going to appearance customize. The first thing I'm going to do is expand site identity and I don't want to use a site logo, but I'd like to try to use a site icon. And so let's go to the bottom and select site icon. And I have one where it has like a logo and it said Connor Cato consulting on it. That's what I'm going to use. It's going to have to be cropped and that's fine. It'll guide us through the process. So that's the one that I'm going to be selecting. And then on the right, I'm going to choose select. And so it can only be a certain size. So you can crop within that size. I just want to get the logo, not the text. So I just move that box over. And so over here, you can preview it. You'll see it. This is what it will show up on a browser tab. And then as an app icon on the bottom, right? Crop the image. And so we have that done. Now we can use the back arrow to the left of site identity to get back to our other options. So on the right side, I'm going to just scroll down and you can see that it added the who we are, the process, other service and previous clients pages to that top menu. We're still going to adjust it. And the rest of the page going down is just all white. We're again, going to get rid of the blog stuff. So what I like to do on the left on the customizer is I'm going to open up colors and I'm going to change to a dark color scheme, which I prefer. And I'm going to change my header text color instead of this white color up here. I'm going to select the color there and I'm going to select this orange color. And then I'm going to make it lighter by dragging down the slider. Kind of like that. Maybe just a little bit darker. Yeah. So it contrasts. Cause so I'm going to keep that picture there. I actually, when my team and I meet, we have a table that looks similar to that. And I have several succulents around. So I'm happy with that picture there. I'm going to do the back arrow on colors. And our next stop is menus. 
So the first thing I like to do, again, with menus is going to view all locations, right? So we saw this a little bit earlier. And so my top menu is the primary menu, and I'm happy with that. However, I do want to edit that menu. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Edit Menu underneath that. And I am going to do the down arrow on those four private pages and remove them. So nothing about the blog site should be showing on the menu now. And I scroll to the bottom just to double check under menu options, automatically add new top level pages to this menu is checked. And that's why it's been adding every page we create to this menu. And we wanna make sure that that is checked because we like that to happen. So I'm gonna go to the back arrow at the top again, and I'm going to go to secondary menu, and let's do the back arrow for a minute. Let's go to social media menu first, because we should have some social media on our site. So I decided to go ahead and do this, or you could use a secondary menu for your social media like we did previously. So I think this is going to be key for our site. I don't really need a secondary menu for anything. Like I don't have categories like I did in the blog, which was a good idea to have on a secondary menu. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this social media menu and it has Facebook and YouTube on it. I'm gonna go to add items. And at the top, I'm gonna expand custom links. And so this is where I can put in the information, like if I wanted to add LinkedIn, things of that nature. Right now, I'll bring that data up so we can use some of these URLs. So I'm just gonna add Twitter here. And again, I'm using Learn It's accounts here for right now. So that would be your https slash slash twitter.com. If you're using Learn It as an example, it's another forward slash and then Learn It Anywhere, all one word. And I'm going to just put this in as Twitter and add to the menu. Now it carried over the URLs from Facebook and YouTube from when I had them on the previous theme. And then I'm gonna go back one more time. So at the bottom under menu locations, it lets me know that this theme can display menus in two locations. So I have the top menu and the social media menu set up. And I'm not using that secondary menu, which has all my categories on it. So that's not going to be there. And so we have our top menu set and if I scroll all the way to the bottom, I'll see my social menu. And I want to change the order. I want it to be Facebook, Twitter, and then YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my social media menu. And here I can click on the reorder button. And so I'm going to move YouTube down. And actually, I'm going to put Twitter above Facebook. So Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And I'm going to select Done. I'm going to do the back arrow again and again. I'm going to scroll back up to the top. And I think what I'm going to do is I really need to change the color of this heading. 
So one of the things we haven't talked about are these pencil icons. I decide that I don't want the tagline there, so I'm going to click on the pencil closest to the tagline. And it takes me here to site identity. And I'm going to just delete my tagline. I don't want it on the site. Yeah, and I think I'm cool with this color. I might make my color just a little bit darker. So I'm going to go back and then back to colors. And I'm going to make this darker. And back arrow again. So let's go ahead and publish at the top of your customizer. A lot of times when I'm working in here, I publish after everything I do just so I don't risk losing anything. So I let that go a little bit long. But now let's go to widgets and expand that. So it has this blog sidebar and we don't want anything on this. And so I'm going to remove both the heading by going to its toolbar. And then I'm going to select that latest comment and remove latest comments as well. And I'm going to publish that. Let's see what the effect is here. I'm going to go back as well. So now we have, I'm still seeing a latest post. So latest posts are in footer one as well as archives. So we want to get rid of the headings and the content. And so I'm going to publish again here. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to go to footer two and it has archives in there. So I'm going to remove archives. Publish a final time. And we can go ahead and close the customize panel. And this time would be a good time to go and visit the site and see what changes we have made to it. So I'm going to go up top and hover over Connor Cato Consulting, and then I'm going to choose Visit Site. So now I can see what we have done. Here's our menu. Now this, when I scroll down, I see the mission statement, who we are, takes me to that page. I have my likes set on here and I'm seeing my social menu at the bottom, the process, so on and so forth, other services and previous clients. And I'm going to go back to the clock and I'll just go back to themes just to get out of here or just click on the clock. It takes me to my dashboard. All right, let's go back to pages. Now we're going to edit our previous clients page to add the industry info that's in that word document. So I've just added a paragraph block underneath the list of previous clients, and I'm going to paste the industry info in. And then I want to put the actual industries into a list because these are all individual paragraphs right now. So I'm going to just drag from retail to agriculture. Click on the paragraph icon on the toolbar and select list. I'm going to change the we've consulted in the following industries paragraph to a heading. And I'm going to leave it on 
H2, heading 2. I'm going to click in between agriculture and the we've consulted in all states paragraph and add a block. And it's going to be another heading block. And it's going to say locations where we've consulted with a colon at the end. And now we're going to go ahead and update that page. And by the way, since we're in the page, we're in a editing a page, a new page, or even in a new page, you'll see the logo there now that we put in through customize instead of the W, the WordPress logo, the default WordPress logo. So that's how it shows in an app. And you know how it shows on a browser tab. I'm going to go ahead and go back to pages. And we're going to add one more page. You can go ahead and close the pages and post Word document. We're going to be using the what we consult on Word document for our final page here. So let's go ahead and go back into add new. The title is going to be consulting services. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pretty much copy everything that's in that document. And once I paste everything in, I want to do a little bit of cleanup here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down till I get to Power Automate. And I want to make these list items into a list. So I'm going to change those lines to list. See if we have anything else to do like that. No. And then for each one's heading, I'm going to change that to heading. And let's see. I don't want H2. Smaller. I think H3 is good. So make the other one's headings H3. And now we're going to add some images to this page, not in a gallery form. So I'm going to hover underneath the Power BI heading, click the plus sign. And if you need to search for it, search for image, or it may show on your list. And I'm going to choose select image from media library. And this is the Power BI image here. So I'm going to select it. And on the right side on the bottom, I'm going to choose select. And notice how it has these two circles on it. I can actually resize the image there if I need to. So depending on how the other images look as they come in, we'll see. But it's just a little icon. That's the icon for Power BI. We're going to do the same under Power Automate. I'm going to add that image block. Get to your library. And this is the Power Automate image. So I'm going to select it. Looks like a blue chevron -y arrow. And I'm going to go ahead and select. Going to scroll down, hover under Power Apps, insert the image block. And I'll point out, this is the Power Apps one, the one that's kind of purplish. Going down to SQL Server, SQL Scripting. Uh, 
And this one you can see on your own Microsoft SQL Server. Select. And this one, I'm going to make it smaller to fit in with the other one so far. And then we have two more to do. So let's grab those images. The next one is SQL Server Reporting Services. And that one is like the orange one, ssrs.png. And last but not least, VBA, Visual Basic for Applications. And that is the one that kind of looks like a spreadsheet with some stuff in the upper left hand corner. And I'm looking back over the sizes of everything and it looks like everything is pretty much the same size except maybe VBA needs to be a little bit larger. Just a hair. And I could spend hours on stuff like that and I won't make you suffer through that. Let's go ahead and publish this page. So I'm pretty happy with how that consulting services page looks. The only thing I'm seeing is I think the Power BI icon needs to be just a little bit wider. And maybe Visual Basic as well. So I'm going to go back in the page and fiddle with a few of the icons a little bit. You can do that on your own if you'd like to. The other thing that catches my attention is the order of the items on the menu. All right. I want it to be, so we should have mission statement, who we are, consulting services, other services, and then the process. So there's a more complicated way of fixing that and an easier way of fixing that. We're going to use the easier way. So up top, I'm going to go to that top menu and click on customize. And I'm going to go to menus and then primary. And I'm going to choose reorder at the bottom. And I'm just going to move other services up one and choose done. And now I'm going to publish that. So now on the left sidebar, I'm on WP forms, all forms. It's time for us to build a contact form so we can get information for people who are interested in our consulting services. So if you notice on the left sidebar, it has all forms add new. There's a new setting there. It now has form templates, which you can use. I prefer to create my form from scratch. So what I'm going to do is I can either click add new up here, or I could just click create your form. I'm going to click add new. Now I should say that WP forms comes with WordPress core, and this is the free version. They also have an upgraded version where you can do things like use logic. So say for example, you ask someone what consulting service they're interested in and they say they select Power BI. And then once they select that, it can ask further questions. Are you interested in map visualizations? Are you interested in cleaning your data within Power BI? So on and so forth. So 
we are going to start by entering a form name and our form name consulting services and I'm actually going to put the S in services in parentheses and then needed. So after you put in the form name, we're going to create a blank form. We're going to use the blank form template. Now I should mention that we also get some forms through Jetpack. I actually prefer these WP forms better than the ones that are offered in Jetpack at this time. There are a host of plugins that you can use for forms. And most of them you'd have to upgrade to get like the premium features like using logic on questions. So on the left side, you'll see a series of icons. And then you have your add fields tab that you're on. And you also have a field options tab over there as well. And then on the right side is where you're going to build your form. And you have some, I, some buttons up top, help preview, embed, save, and get me the heck out of here. X. On the add fields panel, it's showing you standard fields. As you scroll down, you'll notice that all of what they call fancy fields are dimmed out as well as payment fields. You would need the premium version of WP forms in order to have access to those fields. For our purposes, we're good with the free version at this point. I had the upgraded version of this for a long time and then didn't need it anymore. So I'm back to using the free version, which suits me just fine. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select paragraph text under standard fields. All right. So I'm going to click on paragraph text and it adds it on the right side. And when I click on it on the right side, it brings up this general panel. The label is paragraph text. And I'm going to change that to how can we help where we're actually going to go. I don't need a description. I'm going to just go to the advanced tab at the top. I'm going to leave the field size the way it is right now. And I'm going to go into placeholder text. And I'm going to type, please let us know which application. And I'm going to put the plural S in parentheses. You are interested in having us help you with. I don't have to limit the length. I don't have a default value in there. I'm not doing any of that. Down at the bottom, if I say hide the label, it won't show how can we help. It puts that eyeball in front of it. So I don't want to do that. And I'm going to change it to small font size. And then I'll go to large just to see what I want, right? And I'm going to change it back to small. And we can always come back and modify these. And so that smart logic tab is dimmed out because you need the upgraded version in order to use that. Now, up top, I'm going to go to Field Options, that Field Options tab, and that's the same place when I go there, it takes me right back to Advanced, where we just were. I'm going to go back to Add Fields. And now under Standard Fields, I'm going to select Multiple Choice.
and then I'm gonna select that block so I get its general settings. And so now that we have that multiple choice on the left side for the label, I'm gonna type please select application with the S in parentheses of interest and a colon. Where it says first choice, so I'm gonna replace first choice with Power BI. The second choice is going to be Power Automate. Third, is going to be Power Apps. And then we have the opportunity to add more choices. And we want them to be able to choose more than one choice, which is why we selected multiple choice here. So over on the right side of Power Apps, right, you'll see you have that plus sign and the minus sign. And I've clicked the plus sign to get another entry box. This one is going to be SQL server slash SQL scripting. Going to plus sign again. And then I'm going to do SQL server reporting services, and in parentheses, SSRS, as it's commonly referred to. And then we're gonna add one more, and that is Visual Basic for Applications, and in parentheses, VBA, as it's commonly referred to. So we have our choices there. And I'm gonna go back to my paragraph block and I'm gonna edit that placeholder text. I'm gonna just click in there and press N to get to the end of it. Gonna get rid of the period. Please let us know which applications you're interested in having us help you with by selecting from the list below. And then I'm gonna click back on my multiple choice block. And on the general tab on the left, I'm gonna choose use image choices not sure if this is going to work, but we'll see. We're going to use the images that we have for these. So here you see it wants me to upload an image. Just takes me to my media library. I'm going to go to no folder selected and choose business website. And this one is for Power BI, so it's the yellow one and I'm gonna use image on the lower right. And then I'm gonna do the same for Power Automate. I don't have to choose the folder, it's just right here anyway. That's the blue one, use image. And this is why I'm not gonna like it because I don't like when the images are not sized appropriately. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna toggle use image choices just to get rid of them. So nice idea. At some point I will spend time getting those pictures sized for this as well as the other pictures for the corporate logos. But right now that's not important to do. So we have them, we have our consulting services needed form. How can we help? Please let us know, blah, blah, blah. Please select applications of interest. 
And notice down here, you can click to edit and drag to reorder if you wanted to reorder these. I do not. It says you could use icon choices too, but you need to have an icon library installed. So we're gonna cancel that. I'm just going over your things at the bottom. And this one, I'm gonna make it required. So they have to choose something or they wouldn't be reaching out to us. And we're almost done with this form. Let's go ahead and save it. And then under add fields, we're going to select name. And then we're going to select email. And we're going to select another paragraph text field. And we're going to click on that block, the paragraph text block. The label is going to be response time. And then we're going to go to the advanced tab to go to placeholder text, where we're going to type our policy is to respond to inquiries within 24 hours, comma, excluding U.S. holidays and weekends. And I'm going to add to that response time, go back to our placeholder text and go to the end of it. And I'll say, if necessary, feel free to call. And I'm just going to put in a make-believe phone number here. And I actually should probably put my country code of one in front of it. Because I always want to click in that box to... And I guess here it says click to edit, right? But I have to do it over here. So I'm going to just add the country code one plus to that. So that is our form. And we're going to go ahead and save it. And then we can preview it. I'm going to close this form and go back to preview. I'm trying to get that. I wanted to close this window, but okay. So how can we help? Please select applications of interest, multiple choice, first and last name, email, and then our response time policy. And then they have their submit button. And I'm going to close this window and go back to the form. On the left side, let's go to settings. And our general settings are there. We don't need to do anything there. We have our spam protection and security set. Let's go to notifications. Actually, I'm going to get away from there real quick. So now we can look at notifications. I had to put my privacy blockers up. So it's when people fill out the form, you'll get an email. That's what this is about. And it's going to the admin email address, has the subject line that you'll see in the email from, and it will be from your site name and from admin email. So that's what's happening there. Now I have a warning on my page. So I had to put up my privacy blockers. The current from email address does not match your website domain name. Well, that's a security issue for me. I don't want my admin email to be an email with my domain. 
And my host actually recommends doing that. So if I have any issues, and I've never had them before, it's recommending a plug in there if you have those issues. But I haven't had those issues, and I've used this before. And down at the bottom, you would need Pro to enable file upload attachments or entry CSV attachments. And on the left side now, I'm going to go to confirmations. And so if a visitor fills out a form, they will get a default confirmation. And so the confirmation type here is an email, which works for us. It's just simply, thanks for contacting us. We will be in touch with you shortly. You can modify that text, of course. When they submit a form, it will automatically scroll to the confirmation message for them. And if you upgrade to Pro, after they get their confirmation, it would show a preview of their entry. So that's all that's there. We're going to go ahead and save again. So now it's time to embed our form on a page. So we're going to go to embed in the upper right corner. It allows you to select an existing page, create a new page. You can embed your form manually or use a short code. We're going to choose create a new page. And the name of the page is going to be let us help. And I'm going to choose let's go. And it opens that page with the form embedded in it. And so we could add other stuff to this page. We are just going to publish it. And I'm going to go to view page. So this is where this form doesn't look good with the background of my page. Up here, I'm going to go to customize on that top bar. And on the customize pane, I'm going to expand colors. And it was originally on light, but I don't want that. I changed it to dark and that doesn't work with that form. So I'm going to do custom. And I'm going to drag this bar over to like the orangey colors, not a yellow. See if it even takes that. Let's see what happens with that one. I think I have to do publish because I'm not seeing that change. And it's not taking that color change. So it doesn't seem to want to accept my color change. And that's something I've made a note to myself to deal with it a little bit later, right? And so I'm going to just leave it on white now. I'm going to go back to customize so I can get that menu correct. So it's the primary menu we're concerned about. So I'm going to do reorder and we want our mission statement and then who we are. I love when I cl keep clicking the up button and I'm on the wrong panel because it already moved up. So mission statement, who we are, consulting services would be next. Other services, the process, previous clients, and let us help. And then let's publish that change. And you can close that customizer panel. So I've gone into the mission statement page. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to click the plus sign under the paragraph and I'm going to add an image. 
and we're going to choose select image and this time we're going to use Pexels free photos and it defaults to bringing up pattern as the media and what we're going to do is type business office for our search for this particular page, our mission statement page. And so I'm going to use, let's see, I can scroll down. There's quite a few. I like the people working at the wooden table together. So I'm going to actually select that one and insert it. And once I have that image in, I am going to update this page. And I'm going to go back to my pages. I'll view them all after I get them done. So that was our mission statement page, our front page. So our other business pages, we want to add images to. And we can, I would say, except for the Let Us Help page, the contact form page, the other ones we're going to add images to. And I'm using Pexels free images. You can search for things like computer, business office, trust, and add whatever images you like to those additional pages. And then I'll do a show and tell when you're done. So now I'll show you what I've done. I'm going to start going page by page, the mission statement. I have this picture on here and I actually will probably at some point replace it. However, right now it's good and it might even stay. On who we are, I put in a placeholder picture. So remember, this is the page that we want to have a sub page. So then we have the team and then I'll have team photos. So we're going to get that set up. Not the whole thing, but this is just a placeholder. And then consulting services. I didn't put any other images on here because this page is pretty full and it has the little icons representing all of the applications there. So I decided not to put another image on that. Other services, I found an image that says here to help and I put that right under documentation. And then the process page, I found this, which is as close as I get, get to a process. Now what I really wanted was something like a flow chart. So I will probably grab a flow chart photo from somewhere else and place this here, process flow chart with swim lanes and stuff like that. And in previous clients, I didn't put anything on because I want to eventually get those logos that I have on this page. And I decided to put an image on the let us help page with the form because I found this success go get it image and I thought that would be really cool to have there. So hopefully you have images that you can live with for right now on your pages. So what I've done is just outline this page. Again, this is going to be a sub page to who we are. And I've just kind of outlined how I want it to go. So there's seven of us. I'm going to have image one, bio one, image two, so on and so forth. And now I'm going to go ahead and publish this page. Again, we have our nifty coming soon page up. So no one will see this. And then what I want to do is copy the page address on the right. And now I'm going to go back to pages. Going to go down under appearance and go to customize. And we're going to go to menus. And we're going to click on our primary menu. And you see how meet the team is at the bottom. 
we're going to move it up and we're going to make it a sub page of who we are. So I'm going to go ahead and click reorder and move it up to underneath who we are. And then you'll notice on the right side of it, there's a right pointing arrow. We're going to click that once. And so now you'll see on your primary menu, who we are has a drop down arrow. And when you hover over it, it will direct you to the meet the CCC team page. And on the left, we're going to click done. We're going to go ahead and use our back button to get out of customizing menus and just back to the main customizer page. And now we're going to click on widgets to expand it and then footer one. And so I just deleted something I had in there from before and I'm going to click the plus sign and I'm going to search for button. And then I'm going to click on buttons. The text is going to say, contact us. And then when I look at the toolbar here, right, I can select buttons. That's the first choice, right? So it's selected. Can click away from it, go back to it, and get the full toolbar. This is the button. I can change the style. It has fill. I can put an outline on it and drag it. I have no place to move it, so those arrows are dimmed out. I can do the justification and the vertical alignment, line the text within the button. And the other choice I have here is link. So I'm going to go ahead and click on link. And then I'm going to paste in that page URL. And even though we copied the URL for meet the CCC team, we're going to replace that with let hyphen, I'll say dash let dash us dash help with a forward slash at the end. So let us help forward slash. And then I can press enter or do the circular arrow to get the link attached to that button. And then I'm going to tell it to open the link in a new tab. And then I'm going to publish. And I'm going to scroll down on the page until I see that contact us button. And when I click on it, it should take us to the let us help page where we have our contact form. I'm going to go ahead and close the customizer. And I'm just going to go up to the top and visit the site so that I can give it another final walkthrough. It's my mission statement page. Who we are and it has that meet the CCC team page, which is just outlined right now. Consulting services, other services, the process, previous clients, and let us help. And we have our social media icons at the bottom. At this point, we know there's more media editing that needs to be done. I'm not going to worry about it. I would have to replace the phone number on my form with a real phone number, so on and so forth. Need to finish the meet the CCC team 
page up. So, but basically we have a business site that is usable in its current form. So I am going to start the last lesson, one page websites in this module by showing you the page that I've created for the site. And then we're going to create this page together. There is also a folder in the files for media description called one page website. And we're going to be using items in that folder. So. I have a page. I named it all about us. I have a slide show block in it, which consists of 12 slides that I made based off of the information that we had on our previous site on different pages. So here's our mission statement and then who we are. I have a slide that just says consulting services, and then I have Power BI, Power Automate, Power Apps, SQL Server and SQL Scripting, SQL Server Reporting Services, Visual Basic for Applications, The Process, Other Services, Previous Clients, and then it cycles through. And so one of the things I realized going through this is that I have, I want other services after the consulting services. So what I'm going to do here, just so you'll see what it's really going to look like. is I clicked on edit on its toolbar, and this is where I can drag and drop these to different positions. So I'm going to just move this in front of the process update the gallery and I'll go backwards cause they're toward the end. So you have your, all of your services and then other services, the process and then previous clients. So that's the first thing I put on this page. And then underneath that, I embedded our contact form and underneath that, I added that reusable mail and social media block. And so we are going to start building this together for a one page website. Now there are a lot of examples on the internet of one page websites, typically recommended for small businesses. I mean, I would consider my business a small business, but I prefer to have a full blown website for mine, but we're going to set this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update this. I'll just go back to pages. So we will create another page in just a few moments. So I'm back in my media library. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a new folder. And I'm going to call it one page website. And I'll just point out here when we were choosing photos using pixels, you'll notice those photos ended up in our library as well. So on the left, we're going to go add new under media library. And I'm going to choose select files and I'm in that one page website folder and I'm going to just kind of click and drag across all of the files to select them and choose open. And I've scrolled down to make sure that all of them have loaded. And now we're going to go back to pages. Since we want to mimic a one page website here, we are going to select all of the pages from our business website. So starting with consulting services, let us help 
meet the team, mission statement, which is the front page, other services and previous clients. And we're going to go up to the top for bulk actions. And we're going to choose edit and apply. And we want to change these pages to private temporarily. And update. And I didn't notice at the bottom, I'm going to select the process and who we are. And I'm going to do the bulk action. I can get to it from the bottom, edit and apply. And I'm going to change those to private as well and update. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and move this all about us page that I created to the trash. And I can get it back if I need to, I'm not going to permanently delete it. So I'm adding a new page now and I'm going to call it all about us exclamation point. And then I'm going to do the plus sign to choose a block. And the block that I'm going to choose is called slideshow. And then I am going to select images from the media library. And I won't worry about the order they're in right now. We have four, eight, 12. So I selected all of them. And in the lower right corner, I'm going to create a new gallery. And this is where I get to drag and drop to reorder them. And it would be nicer if they were a little bit bigger here. So the first one, the first position I want mission statement. And you can always click on it and then you can see in the side what it is. And then the second one I believe is already who we are. Okay, let me find the next one that we want. It's the one that we're going to get consulting services and move that into the third position. And then we're going to find the power BI one. And we want that in fourth place. Power automate is going to go after power BI power apps after power automate. And then we're going to want our SQL Server SQL scripting one after Power Apps. And then we have SQL Server reporting services. So after SSRS, we want VBA but I can always come back and get it. So after SSRS, we're going to have other services, the process, and then previous clients. So what it looks like I'm missing is VBA. I'm not putting captions or alt text on these at this point. I'm going to insert the gallery. And let me just go through it. Mission statement, who we are, consulting services. Oh, there's Visual Basic for applications. It was in the wrong place. So I'm going to click on the edit button. And I am going to move VBA to after SSRS. VBA 
SQL service reporting services. There's that one. VBA, other services, the process, previous clients. And now I'm going to update the gallery again. And I'm going to go ahead and open the settings button while I have my gallery selected. So for my slideshow, I'm going to set it to autoplay and I'm going to take it. I think the max is five seconds. So I'm going to just put it on a delay of five seconds. You can see it happening. Transition, it's just sliding. I can put a fade effect on it if I want. And you'll see it fades. I prefer to slide transition in this case. The settings are large for the slides and that's fine. I've already published this page, even though it's still in progress. I would like to save it as a draft, but if I do that, then WP Forms won't be able to find it to embed the form on it. So go ahead and publish your page. I'll just do an update on mine. And I'm going to go back to Pages. And then on the left sidebar, I'm going to click on WP Forms. And you can see our form is sitting there. I'm going to click Edit. And I'm going to go back to the Embed button in the upper right and click Embed. So if we had saved that page as a draft and we have all of our other pages private, it wouldn't even have the option here to select an existing page, only create a new one. So we're going to select existing page and it's the only page that we have that's not private at this point or that privacy policy, which is in draft. And then I'm going to say, let's go. So it doesn't actually embed it. It's giving you some information on there. So you're going to toggle the block. You can click done on that message. You're going to toggle the block insert to plus sign in the upper left corner. And you're going to type WP forms or start typing it. And now it's a block in there. So I'm going to click on that block and it added it. And then you get to select the form. So we only have the one form. And now we have that form embedded. And I'm going to select that form. So it has the blue border going around it. And I'm going to open up the settings panel on the right. And so the form settings on the right side, I'm going to scroll down. The field styles is medium. All of that is good. I'm going to do some changes on this one. So I'm going to try a background color. And I'm going to go with the orange. And text color. Uh, nah. I'll make the text color. Let's see. No, that orange is not dark enough. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to put the text on black for a minute. Go back to background, and I'm going to choose that reddish color. That kind of looks more like the background of the slide. And then I'm going to go to text and change it to white. And then I'm going to keep on the right side, I'm going to keep scrolling down. So under field styles, that was colors. Now we're at label styles and we have colorations here too. So the label, I'm going to make that reddish color as well. And let's see. So a sub label would be something like first and last. 
I'm going to make that red as well. And you could choose other colors, obviously, if you'd like to. And so we have our slideshow, we have our form, and underneath the form, we're going to click the plus sign. And we want to add our mail and social media icons reusable block. And so that's that page. Now, something else I can do is I can go and modify these individual slides and add some photos to them or some other images to them, similar to some of the images that we had for the business website. But this would be a pretty good example of a one page website. I mean, if I just wanted to have one page, this could very well be a minimalistic version of my site. So I'm going to go ahead and update this page. And then I'm going to view the page. And of course, if we're going to make this one page, we're going to have to go and modify the menu, right? And I don't mind keeping these social menu down there at the bottom, multiple places for them to access that. So I still have like my header and all of that kind of stuff. So let's go up to customize. So you'll get the full feel of this. And we're going to go to menus. And I'm going to click on view all locations. And then for primary, I am going to edit the menu. I was looking to see if there's anything else we need to change. And I think the only other thing would be home page settings. So we need to set our home page to all about us. So the home page is the landing page when visitors visit your site. And then we can go ahead and publish those customization changes. Close the customizer. And now if you go and going to go up to the top and visit my site. And so I have the one page. This is showing the number of slides in the slideshow, but it wouldn't show that if it was live. This is just us viewing it. So that's what my one page site could look like. A lot of the same information that was on the multi-page business site, but just condensed on one page. That's why that slideshow block is really cool on a one page site. So I'm going to just go back to my WordPress. So I have my sidebar there. So in this module, we moved from our blog site. We went over some basics of creating a non-blog website, most of which you had already done. You also saw, even though it wasn't on the slide, through those Word talk documents that I gave you that I kind of draft out the text that I want on my site. I usually do it in Word. And then I'm kind of more organized when I start building my pages and things like that. We moved on to discussing static versus dynamic websites. And you learned that nowadays, most websites are known as hybrid websites where they have both static and dynamic pages. And so I gave you the pros and cons of both static and dynamic sites. In the third lesson, we created our business website. We did a backup of our blog site and we also exported all of its contents in case we want to restore it 
or we can use the export XML file, which is in your download folder. So we exported everything and then we exported the media separately. And so I could actually recreate that blog on a whole new WordPress installation by importing that XML file. Then we started creating pages for our business website. We added media to the media library. We added a plugin so that we would be able to add folders in our media library for organization. So we created a folder for the gardening blog. We put all of the media for that in there. Then we uploaded the media for business websites, put all the media in there. And then in the final lesson, I showed you a one page that would represent a one page website. And then we recreated it. So we added a slideshow block with many slides that represented a lot of the pages in our business website. We embedded our contact form onto that one page and we added the reusable mail and social icons block to it before going and doing some further menu customization. And you learned how to add the other pages for the blog site and you learned how to hide the blog site pages by making them private as well as the business website pages, making them private so that once we get rid of our coming soon, if we were to get rid of that and the site is already launched, it would just show that one page, which we also set as the home page. So it's the landing page for visitors. So I'd like to thank everyone for viewing this WordPress course. Again, my name is Trish Connor Cato, and it's been my pleasure to present this video to you. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.